I was around eight when we moved into an old house slash shop combination. The bottom is a commercial building with a big open room, a kitchen, and two medium-sized rooms connected to each other, and one connected to the open room. Upstairs is the living space. The layout of the bottom is fairly important. Also, the kitchen leads to the stairs, but you cannot see the kitchen from the open room. So we moved in, and from the start, I despised the place. I got bad, horrible, dare I say, energy from the place, and I don't tend to get that. In the open room, there was a large painting with a strange representation of what would seem to be a rapture event, a burning cross on top of a large Bible, a church with a crowd surrounding it, and a river on fire. Every time I would walk by this painting, my stomach sank horribly. Imagine watching someone you love die. We got rid of this painting very soon after we left, but the energy from that spot remained. The previous owners were an older couple, but the husband had died about five years before we moved in, leaving the lady as a widow. She was... strange. They had lived there for two decades, and she was so emotionless. Obviously this could be grief, but it was five years ago that he died. She was extremely emotionless, as if she was dead in the body of a living person. She had this look in her eyes, as if she'd seen unimaginable things. Anyways, we moved in nonetheless, and there were already problems. Everywhere you were upstairs, you would be watched by something, but always watched. There was a mirror in the front of the stairs that I swear was cursed. I could not look in that thing without having a panic attack. My room went dark. I literally couldn't go into. My body restricted me. Now the lady that lived there did not clean the place. There were, strangely, piles of flies everywhere. They seemed like they were an offering of some sort the way they were laid out, in a perfect mound. Now into the actual events. There actually weren't many, but the few that did happen were major. For one, soon after we moved in, my aunt came over. My aunt is more like my older sister, long story. Anyways, soon after she left, she told me at a family gathering that when she was there, she saw a four-legged creature that had the face of a human, but long stretched hind legs and long teeth. You might think she was trying to scare me, but she isn't the type, I promise. Then we took a photo, of nothing important but a photo. This photo had a face in it. A humanoid face that was completely pale white, with pitch black eyes and no hair. The structure was an oval, not a human head, like a stretched oval. Anyways, the next day my mom and I went down to the cellar. The cellar door was next to the spot that had a large painting in it. When we went into the cellar, the door locked behind us. The door's lock had two steps that couldn't be done by accident. It was a chain with a little latch you see everywhere. When we closed the door, the chain was down near the floor, nowhere near the latch. This happened when me and my mom were home alone, with no one able to let us out for hours. We were trapped in there for a while. This was the last straw for us, and we decided to move out. I was about seven years old, my brother about ten. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just the three of us at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are window doors we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to a back porch. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed, 
The past few nights, I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendencies toward destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember the time that I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise, because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised as if she just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. One night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window, and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up. Tall white male, wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now. I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years later, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who had spent multiple nights casing our home. I went to the local grocery store tonight around 5 p.m. It's winter and getting dark by 5 p.m. where I live. I was in an aisle taking my time deciding between the options when this late 20s, early 30s looking guy with light features, glasses, and a scruffy beard comes up right next to me and just stands there. I didn't think much of it or even look at him at first because I figured, whatever, he's just looking too. But then after a few seconds, I noticed he wasn't moving or doing anything, just standing there. So I looked at him and he was already staring at me, and for half a second I thought he might say something to me. So I stood there for a second just looking back at him. He didn't say anything, so I just turned and fast walked away. At this point I'm thinking okay that was weird but whatever probably just an awkward guy who doesn't know how to talk to women. Then, not 30 seconds later, I'm in another aisle and I see him out of the corner of my eye coming down the aisle I'm in, again staring right at me. So again, I walked away as fast as I could and just went right to the self-checkout. While I was at self-checkout, I'm looking over my shoulder the whole time, making sure he isn't behind me anymore, and he's not. I start walking out of the store, relieved that once again I was just being paranoid and I wasn't ever in any real danger. As I'm walking out, I decide to look behind me one more time, and there he is, right fucking behind me. I then notice he has nothing in his hands, no groceries, and he's heading towards the door right on my heels. Without even thinking, I just stop dead in my tracks. I look at him again, he's already looking at me, and then he puts his head down looking at his phone and walks past me out the door. He bought nothing. I'm so scared at this point my head is spinning, I didn't know what to do. I can see my car because I park close to the exit, so I call my fiance and sprint as fast as I can to my car. I jump in, lock the doors and start looking for this guy. Then I see him. He's aimlessly walking around the parking lot through the cars. He's pretty far away from me at this point and I have my fiancé on the phone, so I'm feeling somewhat safe again. 
I watched him walk around for another few seconds before I got out of there. I have no idea what this guy was doing or what his motive could have been. Maybe he was just a weird guy who doesn't know how to talk to girls. Or maybe he was a predator with dangerous intentions. Or maybe he thought I looked like easy prey for a robbery. The thing I really can't wrap my head around is the fact that each time I noticed him, he was already staring at me. He was not discreet at all, and I would think a dangerous predator might be a little more inconspicuous. He also didn't buy anything from the grocery store, which I also can't understand. I was in the store about five minutes before I noticed him, so I'm sure he didn't follow me in the store. Am I being paranoid? There's a lot that didn't feel right, so I'm having a really hard time trying to rationalize this experience. It was definitely a creepy encounter. This guy has an affair. One time they met up at a company party and got into a fight. She then said she will tell his wife about them. He got mad and killed her that night. He took her to a quiet place nearby the party and strangled her to death. After that, he got a shovel and buried her there. The next day, some people from the company found an arm sticking out of the ground. He was too drunk to bury her entirely. They caught him and he got nine years in jail. He visited us after getting out. Little me, who was nine years old, had absolutely no clue what was going on though. I just heard a small piece of the story. Anyway, the sister of the killed girl also was there. They tried to talk, but it ended up with her crying and running 20 kilometers to her home in another city. My brother and I worked across the street from a mini storage place, and roughly two years ago, we noticed they had an auction sign out front. We decided to check it out, so we walked over hoping to find something interesting. If you haven't watched Storage Wars, the way these work is the auctioneer opens the unit and you're not allowed to enter or touch anything, and you only have a window of about 15 seconds to look around and decide if you want to bid. This unit was small four by four, and my brother and I noticed a group of five fishing poles amongst other boxes and bags. We've been talking about buying a few poles, and this seemed like a good chance, so we yelled out a low bid and won. Per the auction rules, we had until the end of the day to empty out the unit. Being small, this was a two garbage can job, so we got a can and started sorting. It started out promising with finding a nice microscope and a few tools and whatnot, standard storage stuff. I pulled out a plastic garbage bag and opened it to find another tight shut garbage bag, which I opened to find another tight shut garbage bag. And since nothing terrifying is ever kept in triple tight bags, I opened it to find the dried mummified remains of a very old and very dry cat. My brother and I just stopped and stared at each other, and since neither of us needed a dried out cat at the moment, we weren't sure how to handle this specific piece of storage unit treasure. We did what we always do when faced with something this out of context. We just laughed uncomfortably, until we looked back into the unit and noticed two more tight garbage bags. At the end of the day, we found three bags with parts of or entire cats. We also aren't doctors, but we are pretty sure there were at least some dog parts in there as well. Granted, saying it was a storage unit full of dead cats would be a bit of an exaggeration, but considering that a storage unit generally has no dead cats, I think a small unit with three or four could be considered full. As if multiple bags of dead cats wasn't bad enough, the creepiest part of the whole thing was finding his or her creepy drawings of cats and a used pink cat food and water bowl. I spoke to the manager of the facility and explained my findings and I asked who owned that unit. Obviously they couldn't give the name, but when I asked if they were perhaps a vet, the owner laughed and said, 
definitely not. He also said if that helps explain why the person's other abandoned unit that had gone up for auction prior had been full of empty plastic cat carriers. This story is told from the perspective of a man. This incident happened just a few hours earlier, and I'm typing this story currently at my workplace. I work in the garden area of a home improvement store. I don't work the cash registers, and my manager doesn't even let me water the flowers, so a lot of the time I have nothing to do. This results in me taking extremely long bathroom breaks where I just scroll on my phone. I know it sounds bad, but it's better than standing around trying to look busy. Today was the same as any other, with me wasting time in the bathroom. Nothing of interest happened until my work phone buzzed at the same time as the stall next to mine. This becomes important later. A few seconds later, I see that the guy in the next stall had his hand stretched to the ground with his palm facing up. I at first thought he had run out of toilet paper and was asking for mine. He just stayed silent for a while, so I ignored him after that. Then he started moving that hand uncomfortably close to my leg, so I immediately scooted away and prepared to leave. Once the man noticed that, he hurriedly got out of his stall before I could leave. Another few seconds of silence. I took a peek out from the gap of the stall door to see what the hell he was doing, and just like a scene from a horror movie, our eyes connected. He was barely an inch away from the door, trying to peek inside. My blood ran cold. If you're wondering why I didn't immediately open the door and cuss the guy out, I really hate confrontation. I avoid it whenever possible, and I do my best not to draw attention to myself. I stood sideways by the door so he wouldn't be able to see me. That's when the whispering started. I don't know what the first thing he said was, but it sounded like moaning. The next part was a bit more audible. He said something along the lines of wanting to see more of my unflushed toilet paper. I was thoroughly disgusted. This guy was a complete creep, and I was alone in the bathroom with him. My heart was beating faster by the second. I knew I had to stay there until another person came into the bathroom. There was no way I was going to confront him alone. Probably a minute later, someone finally arrives, and I take this as my chance to wash my hands and get the hell out of there. Thankfully, the presence of the other person made the old man quit his creepy behavior. As I was about to leave, he blocked my path for a quick second before stepping aside. The weird thing was, I don't even think he works at the store because he wasn't wearing any vest. My store is extremely lenient about uniform, but most workers at least have to wear a vest or something connected to the store. He just looked like a regular customer. I'm certain I heard phone dings echo in that bathroom. The phones have a signature ring to them, so it couldn't have been a coincidence. Either way, he only started creeping on me once the phone ring made it clear that I was an employee. The situation really creeped me out, and I've been totally unfocused on my work since then. I've kept prowling the garden area to look out for any old man wearing a similar outfit to the creeper. I have an incredibly hard time distinguishing faces, so I probably wouldn't even recognize him, even if I did see him. So, creepy bathroom peeper, let's not meet again. When I was 18 and newly graduated, I ran into some issues with my attempts to enroll in college and also had a hard time finding a job in my area in the meantime, which led me having to sign on at the job center. They determined that I was too shy to succeed in my interviews and placed me in a group that was supposed to teach me interview skills in order to fix that. The group ended up ultimately being a complete waste of time. I honestly think they put me in the wrong group or just needed an extra member and made an excuse to throw me in to make up the numbers, but that's not really relevant to the story, and the other group members didn't do much to help with my shyness either. 
since they were all men who were at least four decades older than me and obviously didn't share any of my interests. Unfortunately, I ended up gaining the attention of the one member I wanted nothing to do with. I don't actually remember the man's name at this point, but I think it was something generic like John, so that's what I'll call him. John immediately got off on the wrong foot with the rest of the group when he interrupted the instructor during their introduction to the course to complain that him being there was useless since he would be retiring in a few years anyway and no one wanted to hire someone who had spent over 10 years in prison. When that didn't get him the reaction he wanted, I assume the rest of the group thought he was just attention seeking and the instructor had heard similar things before from people who weren't happy about being in the course. He waited until we'd been given paperwork to complete, and then turned to the man next to him and loudly explained his prison sentence was for beating his ex-wife, but that she was a lying bitch and he never put a hand on her. She didn't even have any bruises on her at the trial or any evidence of bruises or other injuries before that either, but because she was a woman, the judge automatically believed her and sent him to jail. This immediately set me on edge. I'm not an expert when it comes to the law, but I do watch true crime channels on YouTube, and I've never heard of a sentence of over 10 years for a single beating that supposedly never even happened or didn't leave visible injuries. Either John was lying and had severely beaten his wife to the point of putting her in hospital, or he'd been arrested on other charges and was covering up what he actually went to prison for. I immediately decided I wanted nothing to do with him, regardless of which one it was, and would avoid interacting with him as much as possible, outside of polite hellos and passing him things if he asked. Like I said before, I didn't really interact much with the other members of the group at all because of their ages. I attended the first half of the meeting in the morning, spent the dinner break in the library while the men all snuck off to the pub and then went home immediately after the second half was over. No one ever asked me how I spent my breaks, and since the pub and library were in opposite directions from each other and couldn't be seen from the front of the building the group met in because of the way the streets were arranged, there should have been no way for them to know where I had been, which made what happened next even more worrying. About halfway through the course, there was a day where I'd bumped into a friend on my dinner break and decided to put off visiting the library until the course was over for the day to catch up with them instead. When I did get around to it, I spent at least a quarter of an hour there before heading to the desk to check out my books and ended up being drawn into a conversation by the librarian who had noticed I was checking out books related to a franchise he also enjoyed and that was getting a new movie the next year. There were only a handful of other people in the library, so I didn't see anything wrong with talking to a friendly man around my age who shared my interests after eight hours of boredom and paperwork. We'd been talking for another quarter of an hour when he suddenly glanced over my shoulder, looking confused and concerned, and was just opening his mouth to say something when someone grabbed me by my shoulders. My friends and family know that I hate having my shoulders touched without warning and would never have done that to me, so I immediately knew that whoever was touching me was a stranger and I knocked their hands away while turning around and backing up into the librarian's desk. It was John. He was standing directly behind me with a huge smile on his face and as soon as I turned around, he made a joke about knowing he would find me there and how I practically lived there, before chattering at me as if we were close friends. I was just completely confused. It was obvious that he hadn't just coincidentally bumped into me from the way he was talking, but John had been kept behind while the group was heading out because he'd filled out his paperwork incorrectly. And as I mentioned before, you can't see the library from the building, so he shouldn't have had any way of seeing where I'd gone. It had also been half an hour since I left the building, so if he'd left not long after me and just saw me go in while we were walking in the same direction, he would have come inside by then. The only way it made sense for him to know to look for me there and joke that I practically lived there would be if he somehow learned I was going to the library during dinner breaks. 
known I hadn't that day, and guessed I would go after the meeting instead. What made that even stranger than it already was is the fact that John had never shown any interest in me during the group sessions, and mostly ignored me the way I ignored him, unless we were forced to interact for whatever reason. So why was he now following me into other buildings to start conversations out of nowhere and acting like we were close? While John was still talking, the librarian leaned in to ask if I knew this man because he'd obviously seen my negative reaction to being touched by John. And when I briefly explained the situation to him, he asked John politely to please leave me alone or leave the building. John refused and tried to tell the man that we were friends completely ignoring the fact that I just said we weren't and how ridiculous it would be to claim an 18-year-old girl and a 50-something or 60-something-year-old man were friends in the first place. When the librarian asked again and outright told him that harassing other customers wasn't acceptable and he would be removed from the building if he refused to leave me alone, John smiled and agreed to leave in a tone that he would use when humoring a child before walking out and very obviously stationing himself right outside the doors, waiting for me to leave, too. The librarian was clearly concerned by this and asked for the full story of what was going on, and I told him, including my suspicions that John had been following me around without my knowledge to know I would be in there in the first place. He suggested I should stay in the library until his break, so he could walk me to my bus stop to make sure John left me alone. But it would be several hours, and if I had waited, I wouldn't have gotten home in time to change and head to another meeting I had later that evening. So he asked me to at least come in the next time I was there to let him know I was safe, and reluctantly watched me leave. John immediately stepped into my personal space when I got outside jokingly asking what the librarian's problem was and still acting like we were friends. I tried to walk around him without answering him and head to the bus station to go home, but he grabbed me by the arm and reminded me that there was a closer stop for our bus. When I told him that we aren't getting the same bus because I'd never seen him on the same one as me, he corrected me that we both needed the number 19 bus and told me where he lived which was, in fact, on the same bus route as me. Although I was still tempted to walk away and go to the station instead and possibly sneakily get on a different bus and just walk the rest of the way home, it was very clear he was going to follow me if I did because he still had a hold of my arm, refusing to let go when I tried to pull away, and there were several dark alleys on the way that I had no intention of going anywhere near while in his company. When I agreed to go to the closer bus stop, he let go of me and started walking at my side, chattering like we were good friends again. John kept walking when we reached the stop, which was odd, but I was hoping that my lack of response to anything he said had made him give up and decide to leave me alone, or that he'd mixed up that stop with one further along and I could run while his back was turned. No luck. As soon as he realized I wasn't following him anymore, John came back, frowning as if he was confused and asking me, I thought we were going for a coffee together. Shocked, I bluntly told him no. He kept pushing, trying to convince me that I'd agreed to go with him, and when that didn't work, he switched tactics and claimed I'd mentioned while leaving the classroom that I wanted some coffee, so we thought we could go together. That was an obvious lie, too, since I don't drink coffee and told him so. John's only answer was to say I didn't have to get a coffee and kept pushing me to go to a cafe with him. I firmly told him no, and apparently he took that as me not wanting to drink in public because he attempted to invite me to his flat. If that wasn't weird enough, he started telling me that if there is a naked girl on the couch when we get there, I'm not to worry because that's his 18-year-old daughter. Because an 18-year-old is definitely going to lounge around naked on her father's furniture in front of him, right? Other people at the stop were staring at us now, and I took the opportunity to point out that I was also 18 and firmly tell John that I don't want to go to his flat with him and to leave me alone. He completely ignored the last part and tried to claim I was lying about my age and was at least 29. 
when most people at the time still mistook me for being in my early teens at first glance. The bus arrived at that moment, and I got on as quickly as possible, thinking I would be safe there and the driver would throw him off if need be. No. When I sat in an aisle seat to stop John sitting next to me, he physically shoved me across the seat, pinning me against the window to the point I could barely move and pressing his knees up against the seat in front of him to make sure I had no room to get past him, unless he allowed it. The only way for me to get out would have involved me straddling his lap since the seats in front of us were occupied. I loudly told him to move and to leave me alone but he ignored me and continued trying to convince me to come to his flat, and although a few people gave me uncomfortable looks, when I tried to make eye contact with some of the men in the hopes they would help, they would look away as if they hadn't noticed or suddenly became very interested in their phones. I spent the ride huddled against the window, trying to touch him as little as possible, and was ignored again when I shouted at him to stop touching me because he kept putting his hand on my thigh as high up as he could get without directly groping me. No one did anything about it, but he stopped touching me after that. He had apparently also given up on convincing me to go to his flat that day, but when we were coming up to the apartment block, he pointed it out to me, physically turning my face when I refused to look, told me his apartment number, and tried to give me a kiss goodbye on the cheek which I dodged before getting off the bus and knocking on the opposite window to try and get my attention so he could wave at me. When the bus set off again, several people started loudly talking about how disgusting he was and that men like him should be reported, while refusing to look in my direction where I was sat shaking and seething in my seat. And other than an awkward, uh, so, are you alright? from the driver just as I was about to step off the bus. No one bothered to check on me. As soon as I got home, I sent an email to the instructor telling her that I wanted to switch groups and never see that man, explaining what he had done. She read it but ignored it for an entire week until I sent a follow-up, threatening to get the police involved if they forced me to interact with the man again, and their solution was to tell me I could leave the course early instead essentially kicking me out as if I was the problem. I bumped into that man not too long afterwards, and he tried to ask me why I hadn't been attending the group anymore, admitting that he had asked the instructor and they had refused to tell him, but I managed to get away and lose him in the crowd. I've seen him a few times in passing in the years since, but fortunately he has never noticed me or approached me again, and I hope it stays that way. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life, so I was bunking off of school. My mom was at work and it was late morning time around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and ask strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called the Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side with a gap that led into the field beyond and houses on the opposite side so I was standing maybe 15 paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy, maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair, he was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. He ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point and decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers, 
and a button-up dark brown, dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on, and he kind of limped a bit as he walked. As he got closer to me, and I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type that would possibly purchase a 12-year-old cigarettes, I noticed he was probably homeless, and possibly in his late 50s to early 60s. But I thought, hey, he probably smokes, I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line. Excuse me, mate, would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said, How old are you? I lied. I'm 15, almost 16. And he said, All right, which ones do you want? And held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get some 10 sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop, and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me 20 sovereign. I miff to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for 10. And I start panicking because I don't have any extra money on me to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, holding my arm firmly to his side, and starts to walk back towards the hedge-lined road. All the while, he's telling me how I can make up for not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through a gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop still briskly walking with my arm locked in his. He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge, and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles. There's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying my mind starts to race. I finally realize something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he's walking, still holding my arm, I suddenly and violently pull back, with my arm straight. My arm slides out of his very quickly, and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor, and I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's laying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg. It's like he's in a lot of pain. Why do you do that for? You really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and puts his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right now in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain but something about this situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why did you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye, and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body, and I turn and run. I don't look back, I just run as fast as I can. When I'd gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow down as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out, and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me catch my breath and don't stop running until I get home. At the very least, I was terrified I'd bump into that man again, and I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material in rural Tennessee. 
My memory is foggy now, but I want to say between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. A tarp was required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, in woods on a second lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a white shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I flat just did a shitty job tarping this load and decided to redo it on the side of the road. I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the ladder and start unrolling the tarps again. And I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on him because I'm in the middle of nowhere and I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place and I'm climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this guy's getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working just in case. The guy gets to me and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's patchy as hell. It was like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process, and said, fuck it, good enough to party. The next thing I notice were his eyes, which I can only describe as off. Like they were clear. I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, and with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have any laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere making it clear there's no right to be had here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way, stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. He comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explain to him that I can't give him a ride, insurance and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around, heading back towards me, now about a hundred yards in front of my truck and coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on his cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his moving mouth. His other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing into my truck as he's about 10 yards away now. As soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors. I set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand. And now I'm nervous, because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it into gear, and just pull out. I didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead-ass look on it, just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. I grew up in Long Beach, California, from the ages of 2 to 11. There was a lot of us living near each other. I had two older sisters, and my next-door neighbors were my cousins, five of them. 
we'll be focusing on the oldest of those cousins. His name was Christian, and he was one of the most sadistic people I'd ever met. He enjoyed wrecking my Lego towers, giving me wedgies until I bled, putting a pillow on my face and sitting on it. He even used my head like a step stool once. I was too young to properly defend myself. I had a stuffed animal, a Dalmatian that I named Dale. Christian took Dale and put him in the oven and duct taped me to a chair with the oven light on in front of me so I could do nothing but watch as Dale, my best friend, burned alive, at least in my child mind. Needless to say, Christian was a fucked up individual, but I knew something was wrong when I saw him with our cat, Precious. He would use Precious's tail as a handle and swing her around, sometimes throwing her at the couch, but sometimes throwing her at the wall. He laughed especially hard when he heard the sharp little thud. She died. My parents told me that she ran away, but I knew they were lying. It didn't occur to me until years later, but eventually I understood the truth. One night, my sisters had all of our cousins over, and they wanted to play with an Ouija board. I was a little frightened, so I stepped out into our backyard, away from the Ouija board. Christian followed me outside and walked up behind me. He pressed a serrated knife into my throat from the kitchen. He was whispering things like, What would you do if I killed you? I'm gonna cut your neck and bleed you out. Why are you crying? By this time, I was hysterical. I was a nine-year-old boy sobbing and pleading for life before my sister came out and asked why I was crying so loud. Christian put the knife down so she couldn't see it. I remember running to her, clenching to her like she was my savior. For all I know, she really was. Christian tried to lie, telling her that I was being a baby about the Ouija board, but I was so terrified and hysterical that I screamed he was lying. I told her he put a knife at my neck. She held me and took me inside, calling my parents. When they came home, everything was away and everyone was gone, except my sister and me. I was still coming down from the terror. Christian was ordered by my uncle Gene to never come near me again. It worked. They moved a few months later, and in that time I only saw Christian at family outings and he would never talk to me. I kept within arm's length of anyone who was safe when he was around. My dad brought me to the bathroom. My mom's left hand was devoted to holding my right. He never got the opportunity to catch me alone. Now that we're all adults, we all have a social media account. Christian tries to add me on Facebook and my other social media outlets, but I block him and a few months later, another of his accounts will try to add me. For what it's worth, I hope to never see him again at another family gathering. Not likely since he was disowned by Uncle Gene a few years later. So this happened today, I'm still so creeped out by it. I was waiting at a bus stop to catch a bus home. I left college earlier than usual. While waiting for the bus to arrive, I thought I'd check my emails. All of a sudden, this man approached me and says, in the most creepily monotone voice ever, Sweetheart, what is the time? Now I know it might sound perfectly normal and even polite to say it that way, but where I live, Nobody would speak in English the first time they say or ask you something. They'd speak in the local dialect and would only switch to a different language if you asked them to. And even then, I highly doubt that some stranger would refer to you as sweetheart. Maybe dear, but that's about it. I was creeped out by the way he spoke those words, but I didn't want to seem rude, so I looked up at him anyway. I was about to say it's 3.15 but I bolted as soon as I saw him. This man, around 40 years old I guess, had a huge open wound on his cheek with dried up blood smudged across his face, and he was standing way too close to me. He was about a foot from me. He wasn't panting as if he'd just been in a fight. He didn't seem to care that his face was all bloody. He didn't seem to be in any pain. 
and he seemed perfectly in control of his body. He didn't seem drunk, but maybe he was, but it didn't seem like it to me. I don't know how to describe it properly, but imagine a man walking up to you with a huge gash across his face and asking you what time it is as if he knows you. I didn't say a word. I just jogged away from that man and he left too, because when I turned to look back at him, he was gone. I got on the very next bus that arrived. I didn't even ask where it went. I just got on because there was no way in hell that I would spend another second at that bus stop. When I was like three or four, my grandmother passed away, and soon after, all of my extended family flew into town to have the funeral. A week after the funeral, some relatives were still in town, including my uncle and his family. My grandmother wanted us to sell the house after she passed, so my family did exactly that. It was hectic because we were trying to pack everything up, meanwhile everyone still had to go to work and school. On one of the days that we had to pack up the house, my parents both had work, my older cousins had school, and my uncles and aunts had jobs and other stuff. However, my uncle was available to watch me for a couple of hours, so he did. According to him, I asked to go up to the bathroom while he was watching TV. The closest bathroom was in my grandparents' old room, so I went there. When I came back, I asked my uncle who the nice lady was on the bed. He kind of played along with it, because he must have thought it was an imaginary friend or something. He asked me questions about her to entertain me. I described her as dark-haired, kind of white, and wearing a blue nightgown. When I said that, my uncle freaked out because my grandmother always wore a light blue nightgown to sleep. After that, my uncle and I left the house and waited outside for my parents to come back home. I lived in a house that seemed to be haunted by doppelgangers. Every event that happened never involved some mysterious figure, but a known person being in a place where they should not have been. Here are a few examples. I was a teenager at the time, and I was instant messaging my girlfriend at the time with my webcam turned on. I had the viewer up so that I could see myself in the webcam. Behind me, there were stairs leading up and the entrance to the living room. My younger sister would typically fall asleep every night on the couch in front of the TV and make her way up to bed in the middle of the night. At one point in my webcam view, I saw my sister leave the living room and go up the stairs. The thing that struck me as odd was that I didn't hear anything. It was an older Victorian house, so the wooden floor and stairs were loud as fuck. Without saying anything to my girlfriend, I got up and looked into the living room, and there was my sister passed out on the couch. I sat back down and asked my girlfriend if she'd seen anything in my camera. She said, yeah, I just saw your sister go upstairs. My family was all getting ready to go somewhere. I was sitting in the car with my mom and we were waiting on my sister who was still in the house. A bit after she comes out and gets in the car and just looks at me like, what the fuck? I ask her what's wrong and she says that just before she walked out of the house, she thought I was still inside, so she yelled up the stairs, Kevin, we're leaving, and apparently I yelled back, okay, I'll be down in a minute. My mom woke up to someone tapping her foot and she said someone was standing at the end of her bed who faded out after a couple of seconds. She said it looked like me. I had an encounter where I woke up and felt someone was under my covers laying up against me. When I said something, my blanket visibly deflated and I no longer felt anything. It lay like my girlfriend would have laid against me. When I was 22, I was in the military and I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. It still took like a year after the diagnosis to separate from the military 
but I went home on leave for the holidays about a month after the diagnosis. Anyone that has insulin-dependent diabetes typically carries around some sort of kit. Mine is a black zip-up pouch, and it has a glucometer, insulin pen, needles, and alcohol pads. Right after I left home to head back from leave, my mom texts me to ask if I'm missing my diabetic kit. I look, and I'm not. She sends me a picture of a diabetic kit and asks if I know it. I've never seen this kit before in my life. Apparently, my sister went into her bedroom and discovered it outside of her window, popped up like someone had set it there. Oh, also, her bedroom is on the second floor. Nobody else we know has diabetes. Myself and some buddies were bored one night and decided to head out and poke around an abandoned mental hospital. The only way in was through an autopsy room. The rest of the place was pretty much sealed off. So we go in. Myself and another guy and two girls. As soon as we get into the autopsy room, one of the girls starts hyperventilating and crying. She said she just couldn't be there anymore. We tried everything we could to convince her everything was going to be fine, to no avail. She wanted to leave, and wanted to leave now. Disappointed, we decided we had to leave. The two girls were walking in front of us, one trying to comfort the other, while the other guy and I walked a bit of way behind. I don't know what brought me to look back. Morbid curiosity, maybe, but I did. Now, I'll admit it was dark, but the moon was out, so it wasn't pitch black. Still, I know what I saw. A window on the second floor. What looked just like a little girl in a white dress, staring back at us. I looked for a good ten seconds, stopped my buddy and had him look without taking my eyes off the thing, and asked him specifically, Do you fucking see that? I thought I may have been seeing things, or maybe it was a trick of the light, but no. We both saw it, and stared for a good twenty seconds after. I might have thought it was some kind of trick, but after twenty seconds or so, it moved. We noped out of there, passing the girls and screaming at them to get in the car. Is it possible it could have been some other people there, who happened to bring a girl who might have looked from a distance to be a lot younger than she was? Yes. There were no other cars around though, so whoever it was would have had to walk a pretty good distance to get there. It could have also been a homeless family that was using the place for warmth. Who knows? All I know is what I saw. It was a little girl in a white dress staring at us from the second story window of an abandoned mental joint at two in the morning. I have experienced shadow figures for a number of years. My partner is a skeptic. Well, was. Within the past two weeks, we have both had a number of terrifying experiences, so I will back this story as best as I can. The first time it appeared was to my partner and my dog. Paul had taken the dog over the field around 1am. As he entered the field, he saw a figure to his right, but he thought it was a local teen smoking so he didn't pay it any attention. As he got along the tree line and bent down to get the dog's mess up, he heard trees rustling and looked up. The same figure was in the bushes. It was black and featureless. A prominent figure, but a black and grayish prominent figure that looked like it could charge through you. He was terrified, and both he and the dog ran. The thing charged through undergrowth, keeping level with Paul. Branches were breaking, and it sounded inhuman. The dog dragged Paul, and they ran until they got home. He was skeptic, but he couldn't explain it. We went down in the day, and there's no clear path through the undergrowth, and no broken trees or branches. A few days after, I was on the same field with the dog. I heard rustling in the bushes. 
and felt really oppressed and negative suddenly. I looked towards the rustling, saw leaves moving, and went to see if it was a mouse or a rat or whatever. There was nothing there, but above me in the trees was a shadow creature. I told it to go home. It was lost. I turned and walked away. We both walked the dog the following night and felt evil energy, and we knew we were being watched. We both knew exactly where we were being watched from, and both felt it at the same time. There was nothing visible there. The last incident happened at 4 a.m. this morning. I was walking down the road I live on. A black figure moving fast caught my attention, but I thought it was the local addict, definitely a person. I came level with the alleyway the figure had entered. A black humanoid mass that radiated evil was staring at me from what should have been its face, but it had no features. It was directly under the lamppost which was working. It felt malevolent. The best description I've heard of it is, it's a bull of a thing. The feeling it gives off is worse than seeing it. I'm not usually faced by shadow people, but this thing, this thing is dark and has me worried. If anyone has any insight, I'd greatly appreciate it. On Tuesday, my best friend Sammy and two of her roommates, Tara and Jenny, were talking about our old high school two days ago. Our school was on top of a burial ground, and several students who have gone to school there have passed away tragically. Well, they decided to break in at 3 a.m. to explore what the school was like now. We're 20, so we graduated only two years ago. Jenny was scared and did not want to go inside, so she stayed in my friend's car in the driver's seat in case they all needed to leave. So Sammy and her other roommate, Tara, decided to jump the gate and explore. They thought the energy seemed kind of scary, but they were curious and kept walking. They reached this one classroom in the back, and that's when my friend looked inside. She said the lights and all the hallways were red. I think it's just a feature they added. When she looked into the classroom, she saw a black silhouette of a person in the classroom close to the door. She said even though she couldn't make out a face, she felt it was watching them. She grabbed Tara and told her calmly that they needed to leave because someone was there. They sprinted back to the car and they all left. They then went to our old middle school to see what it looked like now. They couldn't get in because the gates were locked. So Jenny asks Sammy if she wants to get back into the driver's seat since it's her car. And Sammy declines, so Jenny pulls out and leaves. It's about 3.30 to 3.45 a.m. at this point. As she pulls out and starts driving back to their apartment, they see these two white blinding lights coming towards them. They couldn't tell if it was a car since the lights were so bright. Two seconds later, they realized it was a wrong way driver coming at them at about 80 miles per hour, and Jenny was able to swerve around it at the last second as the car zoomed straight past them without realizing. Luckily, they saw cops pulled over on the side of the road ahead. They told the cops, and they immediately dispatched someone to go follow the car. They were silent for the rest of the night because of how terrifying the experience was. The scary part is that, last week, a girl who had just graduated from our high school was driving up to Maryland for Thanksgiving with her parents to visit her brother, and they swerved into the southbound lane and died in a head-on collision. Sammy was telling her roommates about it right before they left the middle school and almost died. She is 100% sure she saw a person at the school, but isn't sure if it was a real person or something else. Our school doesn't have late security or cleaners, and I'm not sure why, but when she told me the story, I felt a strong gut feeling that it was something else. The night just felt too perfectly lined up. I believe that humans are scarier than anything paranormal. But my gut just tells me she encountered something else. If anyone could give any input at all, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you.
I'll say it in the beginning. I don't really believe in premonitions and such, but I don't have an explanation for what happened. I don't know if I would say the only possibility is paranormal, but it was damn weird. I have had several dreams similar to what I'm posting. I've been a caver in Florida for about 13 years, since I was about 6, and have been to a lot of caves. I've never been afraid before this to go in one. When I was about 7 or 8 years old, I started having this reoccurring dream. I would have it at least twice a year, always the same, even though I would realize I was dreaming after the first few iterations. I would fall asleep and dream of being in a cave and going into this little hole in the bottom. Inside, I would see a 10 to 15 foot long corridor about 2 to 4 feet high, and at the end it would always turn left, and I always saw a bent red stop sign at the end, like someone ripped off the top 2 feet and tossed it in, but I would always follow the corridor. I would turn and walk past the sign despite being scared despite many times knowing what was there, and the corridor would start descending, quickly opening up into a large vertical chamber with a path leading down in a corkscrew. Everything became blurry at this point, but it was always the same. I saw trash scattered on the walls. I saw the pit leading down to a curved floor. I saw things, undefined, animals or people, or something else at the bottom and I saw my family, each with one of the things, being tortured and killed, every time, and I could never do anything. After I saw that, I would be stuck for a few seconds until I felt more, then saw everything turn and look at me, and I would wake up, not like a normal dream where your consciousness would just drift off, or a nightmare where you'd bolt up in fear, but like something pushed me out like I wasn't supposed to be there. So, I have this dream multiple times a year until I turned 15. My father decided to take us to some caves we'd never been before, one of which was Dog Drop. It was likely named so because someone either threw their pet in there or a coyote fell in and the body was later discovered. Dog Drop had a roughly 30-foot rappel straight down to enter. I went down with my brother while my father waited up at the top. There was a hole in the ground. I started to feel uneasy, though I didn't know why. So, I followed my brother into the hole. I felt worse as I moved down, and when I looked up, I saw the same corridor, the same turn, the same wall, the same bottles at the corner, and I was instantly hit with this overwhelming sense of nausea and fear, and being watched and everything was screaming at me to leave. I froze and must have made some noise because my brother turned around and asked what was wrong. I managed to say I wanted to leave now and climbed out as quickly as I could, followed immediately by my brother. We packed up and left. I've never gone back and never will. I haven't told anyone what actually happened. I just said I wasn't feeling well and they forgot pretty quickly. The thing that really makes it creepy for me is I have never had this dream again. Year after year, I would have it consistently, but it just stopped after that. But I still remember it all, and I still feel afraid, almost an external fear when I think of it. My husband went out of town for his first work trip following the birth of our first child, so it was myself, my infant daughter, and a dog at home. And I'm counting it as alone, considering I was the only one awake and verbal in the house at the time. I just put my daughter down for bed and was in the kitchen cleaning up, when I suddenly heard our garage door open, something that should not be possible with my husband literally in another state. I raced to lock the door coming into the house from the garage and crouched next to it for at least three minutes. I had my phone out and dialed 911, trying to listen for any sounds of intrusion before cracking the door open just enough to reach my arm through and close the garage again. I did not sleep well that night, 
and had at least three more mysterious garage openings overnight in the following week. It turns out that when I paired a spare garage door opener the day prior, one of our neighbors was arriving home and just so happened to use their opener at the exact moment I pressed the link button in our garage. It took me an absurd amount of time to make the connection, because they honestly don't go in and out of their house very frequently. In any case, that first instance had me acting out parts of a home intrusion scene in a horror movie. This is a story of someone I knew and had to cut ties with because he was a fucking psycho. The first half will be to add context as to why I cut him off, and the second half is what makes it a let's not meet. It started about four years ago when I was living in a friend's house while attending a nearby university. It was myself, my friend, his sister, and their parents. Roughly about two weeks into staying there, my friend's sister invited her boyfriend to live in the house too and by all accounts he was a pretty cool guy at first, very sociable and full of great stories. We often sat around the table for drinks or talked about life having a smoke in the garden. Within the first month, however, as he started to get comfortable, cracks started to show in this veneer. He would rant about government conspiracy, how he was always a wronged party. He was big into Sigma male bullshit and martial arts, and Christ did he have a temper. He had this big dog he always kept in a cage that was extremely violent when he wasn't around. The dog attacked his girlfriend and had to be put down. That's when the guilt trips toward her began and the ranting became incessant. About two months later, he had the bright idea to live in a shipping container and dragged his girlfriend along for the ride. I'm not talking about one of those chic little restoration jobs. This was a rented container in a storage yard among the outskirts of the town we were living in. He would intimidate and threaten the staff there constantly until they called the police. This, of course, was another conspiracy. He became increasingly abusive to his girlfriend to the point where the family got involved to get her out of there. I stuck close to them, having to pretend to be on his side until we could safely get her out. They broke up, which he blamed me for, claiming I was poisoning her against him to make her mine. She has a new partner now, and they are happy. We all blocked the psycho ex on everything possible, but he continued to harass them until eventually he disappeared. Or so we thought. Fast forward to last year. I started to receive messages over social media from several different accounts, blocking each one in turn when I discovered who it was. Some friendly, and some hostile. One of these profiles, however was pretending to be someone I knew from university. We talked about life and how things were going. Eventually, I was invited to a house party, claiming it was a free house and plenty of people were coming. I booked the time off work, made my travel plans, and kept talking to this friend coming up to the date of the party. I mentioned it to my friend's sister, and she was interested in going herself, until I mentioned the address, and she panicked. The address in question was a property belonging to the crazy ex's father that was scheduled for sale. I waited until the day of the party and called the police to check the property, claiming a suspected break-in. They found five people there, including the ex, and parked out the front was a butcher's van equipped for food storage and a collection of knives, hammers, and rope. I'm glad I didn't go. In 1988, we were renting a refurbished house that was part log cabin from the 1700s. I was on the john in the bathroom when I heard three very loud knocks on the wall beneath the bathroom window. I looked out the window. Nada. Thirty seconds later, it happened again. And again, nothing outside. Later, my wife and I decided to plant some stuff beneath the bathroom window outside, and four inches down we hit a concrete slab. 
It turns out the bathroom used to be an entranceway to the log house. It was spooky as hell. For the record, we lived in that house for three years and never heard these knocks before or after. We actually built a log house that we moved into and have now lived in it for 30 years, so we are well aware of the pops and other sounds logs can make as they expand and contract seasonally. And the knocks I heard that day weren't even close. They sounded exactly like someone knocking on a door. Funny thing is that I'm not a believer in ghosts or the supernatural, nor am I religious. So, to me, this was just a weird, unexplainable thing that happened two feet away from me while sitting on the toilet. My wife reminded me about my fluorescent light spookiness. Here's that story. The log house we built is huge, 5,500 square feet that I designed around a 1933 molar pipe organ that we pulled out of a church in Batavia, Illinois. About 500 pipes and a bunch of wind chests and a huge 16 foot wide walnut cabinet for the pipes. I had my shop in the basement where I did part of the organ restoration which took me two years to complete. I finally had all the wind chests, wiring and cabinet ready to go and was staging all the wood and metal pipes to go into the organ. I would grab a pipe from the garage where they were stored, put it on my workbench for cleaning, then upstairs to go into the organ. I have three double bulb fluorescent fixtures above my workbench and I noticed that each time I brought another pipe in, one of the three fixtures would be dark. A different fixture each time. And I never saw one go from light to dark or dark to light. It would just change while I was getting the next pipe. This never happened again in the 30 years we've been in the house. This organ was dedicated to Christine Benson, a spinster member of the church who paid for the organ in 1933. My wife has always been convinced that Christine was signaling her approval of my restoration efforts. In any case, the organ is the central feature of the house, plays great, and is well loved. So that's my spooky true story. And to clarify, the spooky knocks happened in a renovated log house that we rented for three years until our large log house was built. The organ and pipes were stored in the garage at the rental house until we moved and I began the organ restoration. My wife believes that Christine knocked on the bathroom wall, telling me to get my lazy ass busy with moving and restoration and the spooky fluorescent lights were her thanking me for getting it done. Not likely, but it makes a decent story. This was about seven years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm, and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. I'm a female and at the time of this story I was in my early 20s and Cav is a guy and he was in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and were headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we had to go down a dark but short stretch of road. The intersection is well lit, always busy, 
and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet to the main, well-lit, and ever-busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I ask. You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. It's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into an empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one is getting in this car. Do you understand? But what if they need- No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up to the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, roughly in her early twenties, standing alone, wearing all black. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window halfway and asks her if she's okay. She seems off. I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay. We'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the plaza at the main intersection? We'll wait with you for the police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I do, but it's dead, she replied back. All of this happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, no, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. The girl's acting really weird. I remember, at this point, that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down, into my backpack, and I'm rummaging through my stuff to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar, that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box cutter, and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion, and looks me in the eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, the idiot, and keeps saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way, and hold it in my lap. I turn my back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk, and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket, and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, We've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, and saying weird shit, to just wanting to get out of the car. 
we did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away in a random neighborhood. We drop her off and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cap says laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, idiot. I'm 100% certain, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently. We were lucky nothing happened. But I am positive that there was evil in that car that night. This was over 20 years ago, but still creepy. I was at an amusement park with some of my friends, and as I'm waiting in line for the roller coaster, I see a guy that has a t-shirt on that says, 68 and I owe you one. I giggled as I read it. He looks me in the face, we acknowledge each other, and that's that. I don't even think we exchanged words. The next day, I'm at home with my roommate and my roommate says, Hey, uh, you have a visitor. I go upstairs from my room and see these two guys in my house that I don't even recognize. Yes, they've been invited in. Innocently enough, as I'm sure that my roommate didn't know that the guy was a stalker. I was so puzzled that I had to ask who they were and also where we met. The guy says, Remember yesterday? I saw you at the park. I ask him how he knew where I lived, and he brazenly admits that he followed me home. So, now he and his friend are in my house. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I mustered up the courage to politely tell him and his friend to leave, and to never come back. Luckily my roommate was there, who was a male, so I felt like I had some backup. But then he was the one who let these fools in. They left peacefully, probably embarrassed. Fortunately, I never saw either one of them again. But I was on high alert status for the longest time after that. This has been on my mind since my sister told me today. I live with my sister. She has two small dogs that also live there. I have two cats and sleep with my door open so they can go in and out as they want. My sister sleeps with her dogs in her room with the door shut. When she gets up in the morning, her dogs run out and get in my bed with me because I usually sleep in later. My boyfriend spends the night most nights and leaves our house around 7.45 a.m. to go to work, where he clocks in at 9 a.m. I sleep with no lights and blackout curtains. My boyfriend does not turn any lights on, he just leaves the room to get ready. This morning, my mom was here while I slept because her and my sister were going to go out shopping. My sister's alarm went off and around 10 a.m. she got up to go to the bathroom. She said she noticed my door was shut which is unusual, and she went to the bathroom. When my sister came out of the bathroom, she could see my door was now open and her dog just sitting in my room and staring. This would be the first time in almost three years they haven't just immediately hopped on my bed. She told her dog to lay down or come out with her, but her dog didn't move. She came into my room to grab her dog and was startled to see my boyfriend sitting up in the bed next to me because he's usually gone for work before she gets up. The room was pitch black, except she said there was a light on him, like he had his phone on or something. She left quickly because she was embarrassed to have come in while my boyfriend was still in bed with me. She said I was sleeping in bed on my side. She asked my mom if she'd open my door, but my mom said no. Later, I wake up around 12 in the afternoon and my mom and sister ask me why my boyfriend went to work later than usual. Me, never waking up when he leaves, said I didn't know, but that maybe he overslept. I called my boyfriend and asked what time he left, and he said, in a confused voice, that he left at 7.45am like normal. My sister did not believe that, so I asked him to send a picture of his clock-in slip. It showed he clocked in at 9am. 
he would have been at work before my sister even woke up. There was no light on in my room, I do not have lamps next to my bed, and my phone was under my pillow when I woke up, so even if it was a pillow or something in the dark, neither me or my sister can come up with an explanation for the light, let alone why she saw a person in bed with me when I was alone, or how my door opened itself. Was this a ghost? A time slip? A glitch in the matrix? Does anyone have any ideas on what could explain this? I have a story to tell you that happened to me on Sunday, October 29th, 2022. My father for the story will be Daniel Trukmush and I, Joan Trukmush. I currently live in Cairns, about two hours away from my parents. My parents live in their apartment on the outskirts. After a pleasant weekend with my girlfriend, visiting our families, we return home. After an hour and a half drive, we grab some McDonald's and settle in front of a series. At that moment, I receive a call from an unknown number at 9pm. Generally, I don't answer unknown numbers, especially at this hour due to harassment issues in school that left lasting effects. However, I felt a strange sensation and decided to answer, thinking it might be important. I answer, and after saying hello, someone immediately asks, Are you the son of Daniel Trukmush? I, of course, answer yes. It didn't surprise me at that moment because my father had been a salesman for 35 years in the same company, and my phone number was his 15 years ago, so I sometimes get calls from very old clients of his. We don't have the same voice, so it didn't surprise me to be asked, are you the son? After confirming, the person says directly, your father had a car accident. Panic rises in me. I start trembling. My girlfriend is next to me and immediately senses that something is wrong. I was petrified because the tone used by the stranger clearly meant he is dead. In panic, I ask, where, how, and the crucial question, who are you? They tell me they are a witness to the accident and my father was taken to hospital. I panic and shout, asking where, where did the accident happen, how? The person says the car flipped. Trembling, I explain to my girlfriend, and he says he wants to call his wife. I hang up immediately. At that moment, I conclude that my mother wasn't with him. For your information, my parents sometimes have significant arguments, and my dad occasionally goes for a drive. My mother has been ill for years and goes to bed at 6pm every day, so I knew I wouldn't reach her, but I try. I call my mother, no answer, and I call my sister, who is more sensitive and has a panic attack, screaming on the phone. I tell her to wake up our mother immediately because she's not answering the phone. At the same time, my girlfriend calls her mother to ask her to call hospitals around Grenoble to find out where he is. Meanwhile, I get the number again for more information, repeating, where did it happen, where? The person avoids the question, and after a few seconds, gives me the road number. I shout at him, who knows road numbers? To where? Which city? Which village? And then it clicks. I think, wait, I was with my father at 5pm. I'm home now. It's impossible for him to have traveled four hours. At the same moment, my girlfriend immediately calls my father on his mobile. My father answers disdainfully, yes. She says, Daniel, you didn't have an accident. And he laughs and says, absolutely not. I'm on my couch watching football. I tell the person on the phone that my father is alive. He says, but you are not Mateo Trukmush. I reply that I have no Mateo in my family and that I am Joan. The man apologizes, but in a way that gave me a chilling feeling as if he'd achieved what he wanted, to see me panic. I ask him five times how he got my number, and he never answered. He says, sorry for scaring you. I hang up, inform my sister, and calm her down. 
Later, I exchanged messages with him because I didn't understand how he got my number, which cannot be found anywhere on the internet. He told me that my number was displayed on the first page of Google in a directory. I searched the internet thoroughly with my girlfriend that evening, and it's impossible. And the messages were strange. He mentioned a Laurent, even though he clearly said my dad's name. He apologized for his clumsiness, that he managed to contact his wife, that this person is deceased. After a few days, my sister-in-law, who was a surgeon, told me that it's the firefighters who contact the family, not random people like that, even those involved. Moreover, when there are deaths on the road, there is always a press article or even an obituary that I never found. I tried calling the number a week later for answers, and the number was no longer assigned. Was it a bad joke? Was it someone who wanted to see me panic? How did he get my number? Just writing and remembering this moment gives me chills. In fall 2016, I moved into half of a really old house. It was built in the 1880s, a stone's throw from the original campus of Indiana University, which is now a park filled with homeless people and drug addicts. The owner basically turned it into a weird duplex. My friend had lived in it right before I moved in, and he claimed it was haunted. I didn't really believe him because he was a bit of an odd guy. Anyways, the layout of the house was weird. You walked in the door and were in a living room type space, and then you kept walking and there was a doorway to a bedroom, and past that was the kitchen. No doors. The only doors inside the apartment was to the bathroom, and one that led to the shared basement. So, my first night there was uneventful. I was a little uncomfortable, because I hadn't lived by myself in a long time, and I was just feeling lonely and on edge. I stayed up late and then eventually fell asleep, but I woke up again around 3 in the morning. Cliché, I know. What woke me up was what sounded like a group of drummers were drumming on every flat surface of the living room. It went on for a while, and I was completely terrified. It was just a cacophony of sound. After about 2 or 3 minutes, I finally gathered up the balls to get up and check on it, and as soon as I passed the threshold to the living room, it just stopped. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I didn't get much sleep. A couple of days later, a friend was visiting and he was about to leave. We were standing by the front door next to my bookshelf, and I told him about how I was having trouble sleeping, and the story from the first night. As I was saying this, a book threw itself off the bookshelf and onto the floor three feet away. It flew past the dresser the shelf was perched on and landed between the two of us. My friend just gave me a creeped out look and said he had to go. I don't blame him. Eventually, I asked the guy in the other half what was up, as he'd lived there for eight years. He told me that no one stayed longer than a year and they all reported the same shit. For whatever reason, he said nothing ever happened on his side. It doesn't make sense, but there it is. So a lot of what happened was really small stuff. You would just hear stuff shuffling around in the room you weren't in. The light to the basement would randomly come on at night, even when the neighbor was traveling. Sometimes I would feel something get into my bed, like a cat, and nothing was there. I had a lot, and I mean a lot, of nightmares there. That was the bulk of it, but I have two stories that were more notable, and here they are. So the first one isn't that long, but once again, I was woken up sometime in the middle of the night to a loud crashing sound. So, in the living room, there was an old electric organ with about six inches of clearance from the wall. I stash a folding chair like you would buy at Ikea in between the organ and the wall. The crash sound was the folding chair being unfolded and slammed into the middle of the room. By this point, I actually did have cats and they were just sitting there, staring at it when I came into the room. Second, I will admit, as a conventional explanation, that I actually find much, much scarier than if it were paranormal. So, 
At some point I reconnected with an old friend who had moved home from California when his dad got cancer. He ended up living with me, which was not ideal because as I said earlier, there were no doors, no privacy, but we became close friends being poor. We made it work. So, he ended up dating this girl who lived about three blocks down the road and would often leave and sleep over there. I got him a job where I worked 9 to 5, and we would alternate driving to work in the mornings. Anyways, one night he's over at the girl's house spending the night, and I went to bed. Sometime in the night he came back home and he went to the bathroom, which was in my room. Remember, no doors, so he had to walk past my bed to use the toilet. I wake up, he's in there taking a piss, and I can see the light on under the door. When he's done, he turns the lights off and lays down on the couch to sleep like usual. It was winter, and the cats had been escaping and coming back late at night, and one of them had been outside earlier, so I wondered if he'd come in with my roommate, and if not, if he would have seen him come home and would be waiting at the door. So, I decided to get up and check. I got to the door, open it, no loop. I close the door and he's sitting there right by my feet with his sister. Okay. I look at the couch. My roommate is already fast asleep as usual. All is good. I go back to sleep. I wake up in the morning and my roommate is gone. I go about my routine and step out to smoke a cigarette while my car warms up. As it gets closer to nine, I begin to debate leaving him to drive himself when I see him come sprinting down the sidewalk. We get in the car and start to work. I ask him what time he left in the morning to go back for seconds at his girlfriend's place. He said he was there all night, and I about shit my pants. So, I know for a fact the door was locked, because the door had some ancient lock design that locked automatically every time you used it. I also know for a fact that my cat was outside and in the morning he was back in the house. I don't know what to make of it, but it was really unsettling. And just for fun, a third story. I said earlier my house was not far from a park that drug addicts and the homeless frequented. In summer 2017, it was late, and I heard a bunch of noise on my porch, so I went to investigate. There were two guys huddled right by my steps with a flashlight. I asked them what the fuck they were doing. They replied using English, but not something I would describe as language. Then they started walking towards the park through my yard, and the whole time one of them was just calling back to me. Hey, it's the dark. Sorry. So... My mom and I have lived in this house for eight years. My sister and dad used to live here, but they moved out after my mom and dad broke up. A woman died in our house and my neighbor knew her. She said that she had DID and other things. She also told me that Norma, the woman who died in my house, used to wake the kids up for school who slept in my room that were hers. The only reason I had asked was because beforehand, I had a dream about someone who woke me up for school and called me sweetheart and honey. I knew it wasn't my mom because my mom never uses those names with me. I also couldn't see, but I could see my body but not them, and I couldn't move. That was the first thing that happened. When I'm home alone, I hear people calling my name in a whisper. They also say, hey, but this also happened when I was with my dad in the woods but I knew it wasn't him. My sister said she always heard it in the woods too. When my sister and dad still lived there, I would hear someone walking up the stairs, but my sister wasn't awake and my parents never come upstairs. This still happens, but only when it's late at night. My mom told me she's had sleep paralysis a lot in this house and she's never had it before. She said she saw a man in her room and this also happened to me. I was falling asleep on a chair in the living room. I was listening to the buzz from our heater when it turned into a flat line, and I felt someone standing over me. They were pure white, but had human body parts and looked like a very tall man. 
I couldn't move and was scared to death. After a few minutes, he left, and I woke up, or what felt like it. Our kitchen is connected to our basement. For that whole week, I told myself there was a man in the kitchen, and I refused to go in there until a picture of him showed up in my mind, and I told my mom what he looked like, and she freaked out. The man turned out to be her grandmother's dad, who died when she was my age, so I never met him, and there were no photos of him. Another night, I was sleeping in my bed until I woke up to somebody rubbing my thigh. I wouldn't open my eyes because I didn't want to see anything. He told me how lucky I was to have him as he continued to rub my thigh. I quickly got up and ran to my mom. I was scared and I didn't sleep in my room for a month. My mom had dropped me off at school. Now mind you, I have to be at school at 7am, so it was 6.40 when she dropped me off. And when she came back, our dog Emmy was out. Emmy is a good girl. She's very well trained and she was just sitting in our yard. The front door was locked, so my mom checked our cameras to see how she got out, and she never did. She never got out of the front door when we were leaving. My mom found her still asleep on her bed. I don't know what to think about it, but here it goes. Around eight years ago, I was on vacation with my parents and my cousin. My sister couldn't come as she just started her first job, so she stayed home by herself. When we were children, both my sister and I used to be really close, mainly because we shared a room for my first seven to nine years. We used to have our code with taps for asking things like, are you already asleep? Or are our parents asleep? Stuff like that. She's also always doing something or looking for something to do, always being the first up. So, when she was up and wanted me to wake up, she would place her face as close to mine as possible and stare at me. I don't know how long she would stay like this, but I can clearly remember multiple times waking to her doing this. I, of course, would shout or at least panic until realizing it was her. I guess it was fun for her, and I have to admit it, I also did it a couple of times. So now we're on our trip, it's been at least 10 to 12 years since the last time my sister pulled this prank on me. My sister and I are not as close as we used to be, we have certainly grown a little apart, but we still love each other. It was the last night on our trip before heading back to our city, and we just found this nice hotel close to the pyramids in Palenque which meant no cell phone service. We were sharing a room, my mom and dad in the first bed and my cousin and I in the other one. At some point around 4am, I woke up to the same old sensation that someone is staring at me. So I opened my eyes and I could clearly see a face. My immediate reaction was to shout, waking my mother up. I have to say that this sensation by itself is really scary but years of experience with my sister waking me up like this took the threat away. So despite my shouting, I wasn't scared. It was just too familiar. My mom turned on the light and asked me what happened. I told her that I was pretty sure that my sister had just woken me up. I know it didn't make any sense, but I felt it was her, though I cannot say I saw her face. I just saw a face, and then it disappeared immediately. My mom is really superstitious, so she couldn't sleep after that because she felt something was odd and I couldn't sleep thinking of my sister. Later that day, in the morning, we noticed we all had lots of missed calls. My sister was involved in a really bad car accident. Luckily, she only had minor injuries. To this day, I don't know what to make out of this experience. My brain tells me it was just a coincidence. On the other hand, it's the only way I would have thought of my sister sleeping. It was just so real, so between both of us. As an extra, on our previous visit to Palenque at the ruins, we could hear some drums. My parents said that it was raining and we were playing with the ponds, and at some point the drums started playing. Our curiosity made us follow the sound, 
getting us deeper and deeper into the jungle. I can't remember why we stopped, but when we finally made it to the exit and asked the security guy about the music, he said, So you heard the drums as well. He then proceeded to tell us that a lot of people have heard them at different times, and they didn't know the source of it. I was somewhere between the ages of 10 to 14 when this happened. Growing up, I lived on a very boring street in a middle-class one-story house. My bedroom faced the front veranda, which had a lot of plants. Just around the corner and down the hall from my bedroom was a study that was used as a spare room slash computer room. I used to watch TV in that room, and on this particular night it was very hot, so I opened the door to the veranda. There was a thin fly screen with no lock which we would pull across when that door was open. When I went to bed, it was so hot that I kept my bedroom windows and curtains wide open. I was having trouble sleeping and laid there staring at the ceiling. Then I heard what sounded like someone walking around on the veranda. The ground was cement pebbles and there was a lot of dirt from the potted plants and it made a very distinct sound when you walked on it. At first, I assumed it was one of my parents, but it was very late at night and that wouldn't have made any sense. I craned my neck to look out the window. In the dark, I saw a gaunt, skeletal, hunched over figure, slowly shuffling towards my bedroom window. It made a raspy sound as it shuffled around. I was fairly certain it couldn't see me, but from the way its head was moving, it looked like it was searching for something. Despite this fairly creepy thing happening outside my bedroom window, I still felt somewhat safe in the comfort of my own bed inside my locked house. Then I realized I'd left the study door open. All that stood between whatever the hell this thing was and my house was a thin screen door with no lock. I knew I had to lock that door and fast. This thing was almost at my bedroom window and would soon be at the study door. I slid out of bed and crawled on my stomach out of my room and down the hall to the study. As I reached the door, intending to quickly close it, I realized my mistake. I would have to open the screen door in order to reach the door to close it. From where I was laying, I could see this thing hunched over and peering into my bedroom window. I think it heard or sensed me laying there because it turned and shuffled over and bent down to where I was laying. I held my breath as this thing put its face right against the screen and peered in at me, its raspy breath sounding like death. In the dark, I could make out part of a face. It looked gaunt, sickly, either with a very thin or no skin. I couldn't see any eyes there were simply empty sockets. I didn't move as its face pressed up against the fly screen, seemingly looking right at me. Suddenly, its face distorted in terror, its eye sockets and mouth opening wide and let out a blood-curdling shriek, a shriek that sounded like fear, and it bolted off into the night. I lay there silently, frozen in fear and disbelief over what had just happened and listening to make sure it was gone. As soon as I dared to move, I quickly opened the fly screen and shut and locked that veranda door. I then went back to my room and shut the windows and drew the curtains. I kept peeking through the curtain, expecting it to come back, but it never did. I've thought about this encounter ever since, and I'm not really sure what to make of it. I've never told anyone about it either. I don't know where to begin, and I've never understood why it reacted in fear when it saw me. I'm not exactly sure what to believe since a lot of the paranormal occurrences happened to my dad but I definitely saw and heard some creepy shit while living in a house in my teens. 
We'd very frequently just have a sense of anxiety and foreboding in the house, which on its own isn't paranormal, but certainly made it very uneasy staying there. I read somewhere that radon exposure can cause anxiety, and the house did have a radon problem, so maybe that could have been it. But I also would hear footsteps around the house when I was the only one there, and just constantly felt like someone was watching me. My dad got the worst of it and claimed he could hear sounds coming from the basement at night. His bedroom was right near it, whereas mine was upstairs, so I never heard any of it, but I'm an extremely deep sleeper. Then the traditional slams, bangs, and crashes throughout the house. My dad also claimed he would hear knocking on the cellar door. Sometimes he would hear a woman screaming. Supposedly every family who ever lived there experienced something. There are three distinct things that stand out. The night before we moved out, my dad claims he woke up because he felt a sudden hard tapping on his head. My brother's girlfriend was staying over and my dad and me were gone. We came back to find that his girlfriend's daughter was terrified because she saw a shadow in the corner of the room. I chalked it up to the kid's imagination running wild. One time my dad was practicing with his band in the basement and was expecting me back from a Christmas party. He claims he heard heavy footsteps from upstairs and thought it was me, so he went upstairs to greet me and nobody was home. I got home about a half hour later. It got to the point where my dad had the house, blessed, and the priest claims to have been terrified and refused to go into the house at first. This was around the time I was becoming an atheist, so I didn't really believe in any of that, but I definitely experienced the uneasiness and occasional random noises, but never experienced any of the screaming or knocking my dad claims to have heard. At one point, we had some people from Taps visit us and do a sweep of the house. We got some of the obvious orb pictures, which both me and my brother thought were dumb as hell, but at one point, being a bit of an edgelord thinking I had psychic powers told them to take a picture in one specific spot. The result was an image of what appeared to be a ghostly bust of a person with a demented face. We tried to explain it as a reflection from the washing machine, but it looked too much like a person. We also have an entry on the website, The Shadowlands, that I submitted. Look for the entry, Quobog Ave. P.S. There was one hilarious instance where I came home from school one day and immediately felt the uneasiness and felt like I was definitely being watched. My blood went cold and I was starting to feel a bit panicked. I turned around and my grandmother was there and started laughing her ass off at how she had scared me. She had been there the whole time and I somehow walked right past her without seeing her. I miss you, Graham. My uncle's house out on a very eastern part of New York was said to be haunted due to the family that used to own it in the 1800s, decided not to give it to the stableman and sold it instead. He and the maid were said to have haunted the place. We always used to joke that you would hear people or things moving at night, but since the house is so old, we used to just laugh it off. My uncle's friend had her and her sister stay over the house one night and the friend noticed a maid bringing towels down the stairs when she woke. She saw the maid again, bringing what looked like a percolator down the stairs. She was so impressed by my uncle hiring staff. He's a neurologist in New York City, so we had a habit of spending a little bit extra. She went back to bed and woke up later downstairs to see my uncle and his friend just chatting. She asked where the maid went, and she thought that the maid was cooking breakfast. My uncle had no idea what she was talking about and asked what she looked like. The sister explained and he laughed, walked her to the living room and pointed to an old picture. She said that was the woman. My uncle replied, yeah, she's been dead for about a hundred years. My wife and I went camping for our anniversary one year in Payson near the Rim. 
We went to bed. It was so eerie to hear nothing but the wind in the pines. Finally, we fell asleep. I woke up with paralysis and a red light glowing outside of our tent. The light got brighter and something started unzipping our tent. I was frozen in place, just staring at the flap being unzipped. When the flap was almost opened, I was able to move my head and look at my wife's face. She had this horrible look of fear, mouth agape and everything. When she started to scream, I woke up. With nothing but the wind in the pine and pitch black, nothing opened our tent, and we were still laying there where we fell asleep. Do I think it was a nightmare? Yeah. I'm terrified of aliens and stories about them. Maybe it was my brain messing with me. Or was it a repressed memory? Who knows? It scared the shit out of me. We left the next day. This happened in August of 2013. I was visiting Montreal for their diver site weekend, which was basically like Pride, but took place the long weekend before the official Montreal Pride. My best friend at the time had met a guy at Toronto Pride a month earlier, and he invited both of us to come there, so my friend wouldn't be uncomfortable going to spend the weekend with someone he didn't know well. We arrived on a Thursday, and the trip was going great. We went out the first night walked the streets that were closed off to cars the next day, and our host made us a nice dinner, and then we went out again Friday night. So that Friday night, we went out to a club. It was called Parking, and it was another fun night. The music was great, and the tequila shots were incredibly cheap. I was dancing and moving all around the club, but would circle back and check in with my friends and our host, and I would also run into people that I knew who were also visiting from Toronto and ended up taking some MDMA from one of them. Danced some more until I was completely soaked in sweat, so I went to the bathroom to wipe myself down and pee. When I got to the bathroom, there was someone leaving, but it looked like I was the only one in there. I went and used the stall because I was having a hard time using the urinal. And once I came out, I was quite surprised to see a man in the corner of the washroom smiling at me. He looked in his mid-thirties, on the shorter side and a bit chubby. He was wearing a polo t-shirt and jeans and had glasses, and I remember thinking when I saw him, he reminded me of an accountant. I'm not sure why that thought popped into my head. I was pretty sure I didn't hear the door, but I couldn't be positive, so I just smiled back and said hello as I went to wash my hands. Hello, he responded. Are you having fun tonight? I replied I was and that the music was incredible and was wiping myself down with paper towels and my shirt. Do you want to do some coke with me? He asked. Now this was not the first time I'd been offered coke in a bathroom at a nightclub and had done this in the past and ended up having some good experiences and met some interesting people. I was already high and drunk and not thinking much of it, I said, sure, I would love to, thanks. I just live right near here. It's at my place if you don't mind coming over. We can do some lines and have a drink and walk back to the club, he replied. Now obviously looking back, I realize how very dumb my following actions were, and I can't imagine myself being so stupid and careless now. But without thinking about it, I agreed and I left with him. We chatted on the walk over to his place. He asked me where I was from because I didn't seem like I was from Montreal, and what parties I'd gone to and how old I was and my name. I asked his name, but he instead responded that we'd arrived. The whole walk felt like five minutes, but I honestly hadn't been paying much attention to where we were walking. His apartment was in this building that had three floors, and his unit was on the second floor. You had to climb this long, narrow metal staircase and his door seemed to be in the middle of two other apartments on either side. He unlocked the door and let me in first, flicked on the lights and told me to make myself comfortable. I was walking and noticed he had carpet, so I turned around to ask him if I should take my shoes off when I noticed that he was locking the door from the inside 
with the key above the regular lock, and in that moment I was overwhelmed with a feeling of dread like I'd never felt before. The danger I'd possibly put myself in, and now seeing this person locking their door from the inside with the key. I just thought to myself, I'll pretend I didn't see that. I won't take off my shoes, and I'll politely hang out for a few minutes, then ask to head back. I also thought I could be having an extreme overreaction to what I saw, because I was high, but as I looked around, everything inside me was just screaming, you need to get out of here. I went and sat on the arm of the couch, he said I should take my shoes off and relax. I was getting a better look at him now in the lights of his apartment, he still looked plain and unassuming, but his eyes looked shifty and he pulled down both of the shades on the windows that were on each side of the door. I told him that I was okay, and I was eager to get back to dancing, so he said he would make us drinks and then we could go back. The apartment looked much bigger inside than it did from the street. It was an open layout with the living room beside the kitchen, and then a hallway in the middle, with closed doors painted black, and I could hear music coming from one of the doors. I asked him if someone else was there, as he came from the kitchen with the glass, and he replied no. As he handed me my glass, he looked me up and down. He said with this increasingly creepy smile spreading across his face, you have a very beautiful body, especially your chest. Would you mind if I took some before photos of you before we head back? Every alarm bell is going off in my head now and all I can think about is Jeffrey Dahmer and all of his Polaroids and asking myself what am I going to do because that was such a creepy thing to say and all I can manage is a polite laugh as I take the drink and say, sure, excellent, he says. He then tells me to take off my shoes and he's going to get the coke in his camera and told me to finish my drink. He walked down the hall takes out his keys and unlocks the second door. He opens it enough to slip in and closes it behind him. The second that door was closed, I jumped up, ran over to the sink and dumped my drink. I put my shirt on and ran to the front door. I was able to turn and unlock the regular lock, but the door would not budge. I kept turning and pulling, but nothing. Then I heard from behind me. What are you doing? I turned around and he was standing at the base of the hallway with one of those professional cameras slung around his neck and holding a square mirror with a pile of white powder on it. I thanked him for the drink, gesturing to my empty glass, but that it was getting late and I wanted to get back, but we could exchange numbers and maybe meet up tomorrow. His demeanor slightly changed. He was still smiling but the tone when he next spoke sounded irritated. He asked me if I was nervous about taking the photos, and I should just wait for my drink to relax me. I said no, I wanted to go. This exchange of him telling me to stay and me saying no went back and forth for about a minute, when he suddenly glared at me, put down the mirror, pointed at the couch and said, Sit down, now. Not knowing what to do or how I was going to get out of this, I remembered that there were other units on each side of us, and it had to be around 2.30 in the morning at this point, so I just started screaming at the top of my lungs like a madman, banging on the door, the window, the wall. Shut up, be quiet, he snapped at me as he ran to the door. He quickly unlocked it and told me to get out, and stepped aside. I bolted out of the door and down the stairs, skipping the bottom steps and hopping over the side of the railing. I looked up behind when I landed, and he wasn't there, but I did hear a door slam. I took off running down the street. I hadn't paid attention on the walk there, so I didn't know which way to walk, but I knew it was close. Luckily, I was able to wave down a passing taxi and have it take me back to the bar. When I got back to the bar, I found my friend in the same spot dancing. The whole incident must have been less than an hour. I was too embarrassed about how stupid I'd been, and being back in the club, I started to feel bad how I just freaked out on this nice man. So I didn't say anything, 
but I stayed by my friend's side until we left shortly after I got back. The entire thing felt quite surreal, and I remember the next day when I did tell my friend, kind of laughing it off and joking about getting murdered. I was trying to make light of it because it was so scary, and it wasn't until years later, after joining Reddit and this sub, and reading other stories, that I started to think about that night more and more and I realized how much potential danger I put myself in. For some background before I start, I live in the most northern part of Norway, which is also the most northern part of Europe. My home is well above the Arctic Circle. For those of you unaware, this means that we have very short summers where the sun never sets, and very long winters where the sun never rises. Those long and cold months of darkness in the end and beginning of the year have made us into an understandably superstitious kind. There are many tales meant to safeguard us growing up. You have Stalo, the mountain troll, who steals children who wander too far away from their home. You have the Myling, who you will not see, but you can hear it stalk you, letting out the cries of a baby. And the Nock, who lies in waiting beneath the surface of lakes and rivers, waiting to drown any unsuspecting swimmers. My story begins when I was 16 years old. I had just gotten my hunting license, and my father had even bought me a shotgun for my birthday. This was big for me as I'd always followed my father on hunting trips as a child, but I'd never actually shot a grouse myself. My father is the stereotypical northern Norwegian. He knows everything about the outdoors, and he can endure any hardship or weather with the same unwavering sense of macabre humor. Once his fingers got stuck in a saw at his workplace and peeled the skin off of his middle finger like a banana peel, he promptly bandaged it up by himself and kept going. He did not consider going to the doctors to get it looked at for almost two weeks, and the stench of his bandages made him unbearable to stay in close proximity with. In the end, he needed a skin transplant and several weeks off of work before his hand was remotely usable again. So, the time of the year comes where the sun is out for a few hours in the morning, and me and my dad take the journey to the cabin. This includes an hour of driving and a further hour on a boat. You see, our cabin is in a remote area without any road access, so the only way to get there is by a ferry. This means we somewhat always know who is out there, since most people only stay over the weekend when there are no holidays and the ferry only goes Fridays and Sundays during the weekend. That being said, there are never more than a handful of people out there at the same time spread out on an area that is roughly larger than my hometown. This time, on the other hand, it was only me and my father taking the ferry that Friday, so I knew we were going to be left alone over the weekend. Arriving on that small pier by the cabin, I could finally breathe in the fresh air of untouched nature that has always been soothing for my soul. It's like you leave behind all your troubles at home, because out here they are irrelevant. At the cabin, the only things that matter are the things that keep you safe, warm, and fed. We then dug out our snowmobile that was parked near the pier and drove the short trip over to the cabin. That night, we mostly spent preparing noose traps and lunch for the next day. My father told old stories of when he went hunting back in the day and such, and we shared in a ceremonial hunter shot of single malt whiskey. I slept well that night, as I normally do when the peace and quiet of the cabin comes over me. We got out of the cabin late the following morning due to us just enjoying the calming of a morning with no obligations. This would turn out to be a mistake, however. You see, the key point is to be out early so you can utilize the sunlight as much as possible. We knew this but sometimes you just want to sit down and eat a lazy breakfast and watch morning TV. When we had arrived at the Lavu, imagine a winter version of a teepee, 
that we had set up that summer next to a lake, which was now frozen of course. My father decided that he would take it easy that day and get the lavu warmed up, so that when I returned from the mountain, there would be warm food and drink waiting for me. I had previously spent a lot of time by myself around that area, so walking around the mountain alone never bothered me, and still doesn't to this day. So I started walking up the mountain overlooking the lake. It was difficult due to the heavy snow and me not bringing my skis. Instead, I opted for using an old pair of snowshoes that were hanging in the cabin. This resulted in me using up way more time than needed to get up to where I could find some grouse I might shoot. As I knew from previous experiences that this was an area they would be in. After a lot of effort, I made it up, and the area, despite being full of tracks and feces, was abandoned. It had snowed the night before and part of the morning, so the tracks must have been somewhat fresh, yet I could not hear or see anything. So I stalked the forest on that mountain for an hour without any traces of life. That is probably when I noticed the silence. It's like what people with similar experiences say. There's always this deafening silence that preludes something bad, and like all the animals know to get out of there. I remembered for the first time since childhood that I felt uneasy about being alone up there. But of course, I was not about to go empty-handed back to my father, so I continued. As I was walking around, listening intently to any sound that might give away any form of life, I remembered being amazed at how loudly my footprints were. Even though I walked as slow and controlled as humanly possible, the uneasy feeling creeping closer and closer to the point where I decided to take a quick snack break and regain my previous calm state of mind. As I walked back to the clearing overlooking the lake, my footsteps seemed to almost lighten and I felt more relaxed and at ease again. I sat down on a rock and ate a bar of chocolate I brought and enjoyed the sun on my face, ridiculing myself for being spooked of what essentially was nothing. That's when I heard the footsteps coming from the direction I'd just been in. Loud and heavy footsteps of a grown man. I know this because as anyone can tell you, the sound of a bipedal walking on two feet is quite distinct from four-legged creatures such as moose or bear, especially in the heavy snow. I tried calling out because I immediately thought it was my father who had a change of heart, yet there was no reply. I sat there on the rock, watching the direction of the footsteps as they grew louder and louder. Several times I called out, and yet I received no reply. Feeling uneasy again, I decided to take out my phone and try to call my father. There, on my phone, I had an unread message from my father delivered three minutes ago. Coffee and lunch is ready. Simultaneously, the footsteps were somehow getting louder and louder, and I knew whatever was at the other end was not my father. This, and knowing that we were supposed to be the only two people in a radius of many, many kilometers, made me instantly jump up. I grabbed my shotgun and noped out of there as soon as I had tightened my snowshoes. As I was making my way, I could hear whatever was stalking me pick up the pace, and I realized that the sound of my own footsteps and whatever it was that was after me were almost synchronized to the point that there was only a slight difference in when our feet hit the ground. I've realized since then that whatever it was had followed me since I'd entered the forest on the mountain, and it was the cause of why I felt like my footsteps were abnormally loud. I remember trying my best to run in hip-deep snow, not caring that the thick layers of branches hit my cold face, leaving red marks all over. It came to the point where I could hear the extra pair of footsteps no more than maybe five meters behind me, yet when I turned around, there was nothing. I pushed with all I had, and when I finally managed to reach the frozen lake on the other side from the lavu, 
the extra pair of footsteps just stopped. Exhausted by the kilometer plus run in waist deep snow, I made my way to the lavu. My father seemed almost amused by how tired I seemed. He handed me a hot cup of coffee and asked if I saw anything. I didn't know what to say and was honestly embarrassed by what had occurred, so I said only that I'd spotted many tracks, yet no birds. However, in the later years I've asked him about this and other strange occurrences around the area, and the answers have always been roughly the same. Don't worry about it and don't ask about it. Some things are better ignored. Last night, I was doing some Christmas shopping alone at a local TJ Maxx. I rarely ever go shopping alone, especially in the evening. Usually I have my kids or my husband with me. I am browsing around aimlessly, kind of just all over the store. I'm not really sure what I'm going to get. I see this young guy, probably early 20s, skinny with glasses. I don't think anything of it. I went to a different spot. I see him again. He is in the same aisle, picking stuff up to look at, and then putting them back. He didn't have a cart or anything. My red flags were not raised yet. I then see him a third time in a different area, doing the same thing, but now stopping and texting someone. My senses start to perk up a bit, like, okay, this is weird, but I'm not nervous yet, per se, but I am more aware. And it happens again, and this time I know something is weird. He's following me all over the store and has nothing to buy, so I start kind of zigzagging through the store. I find a coat I want to try on. At this point, I was very wary, but at the same time also thinking I'm being ridiculous and paranoid, but I just had this strong sense that this was not normal. I went into a dressing room for about 15 minutes, hoping I would lose him. I came out, and I did not see him for another 20 minutes. I was relieved, thinking I was definitely being paranoid, and he probably left. I go to the checkout after almost an hour and a half of shopping with a cart full of stuff. I was the only one in line. I get called to cash out, and I turn around and this man is immediately behind me in the checkout. He came out of nowhere. He had one item, a cheap little decoration. At this point, I was full on panicking. The cashier could tell I was being weird and very distracted. At the risk of sounding crazy, I almost didn't say anything, but I told her that I think this man is following me. She was extremely empathetic and didn't seem very surprised. She said, I'm so sorry. I will have someone walk you to your car. I was so thankful for her kindness. The man checked out with this one item and left the store with an older man who I didn't see before. The older man had nothing that he had bought. The parking lot at the store is a huge dark plaza. I did not want to go outside alone. I just knew it was a very bad idea. The cashier asked another employee to walk me out. She was younger than me, but so sweet. I apologized profusely because it was sleeting and cold rain, and she had no coat on. She said, I don't care if it's downpouring. I would still walk you to your car. It was so sweet, really. She walked me all the way and even waited until I pulled out and drove away. The whole time I was shaking like a leaf. I've heard this happen to so many women, but I kind of thought they might be paranoid or exaggerating. This was extremely scary though. The more I think about it, the creepier it gets. He followed me around the entire store, and everywhere I turned, there he was. I have no idea what his deal was, but this was so unsettling. My husband freaked out and does not want me to shop alone anymore. I don't really want to shop alone anymore. 
if I had not been paying attention or dismissed my bad feelings, something bad may have happened. As a woman, being aware of our surroundings is so important. For some information before I start, I'm from Texas, so I don't have many shoes with treading on them. The ones I had had gotten too worn and eventually tore, and I needed to buy some new ones. Also, I'm a chubby 5 foot 4 inch girl, and this was 8 o'clock at night. This also happened on a very popular and busy street. I live in Chicago for school, and I needed to get some things before the polar vortex. The school I go to is near State Street, and I decided to go to Walgreens that was near the Chicago Theater. I had to stop by Target, and then at Walgreens. As I purchased everything, and made sure I packed it all in, I headed out to the doors. As I walked toward the exit, I noticed a tall man was headed in the same direction at the same time, so I decided to let him go first, but he just stood there, staring at me. He didn't make any gestures, but I still thought, oh, maybe he wants to be nice and be a gentleman, so I went ahead first and he followed. I noticed that it had started slushing and knew I was going to start sliding everywhere because the boots I had on had very thin tread on it, so I had to slow down on my walking or I'd fall on my ass. I start walking, and it's at this point that I notice him walking the same pace as me. I thought I was in his way, but I also thought that the sidewalk is extremely big and he could easily walk around me. I stepped to the side and to see if he would go around or something, but his shadow followed right behind me. I tried walking a little faster, but I could already feel myself slipping and losing balance. He ended up walking a little faster to catch up to me, and soon he was right next to me, matching my walking pace. I asked if he needed anything, but he didn't reply. When I was in front of the theater, he ended up going in front of me and just stopped me in my tracks. I tried to go to the left of him, but he steps in front to cut me off my path. I tried to go to the right, and he did the same thing. I paced a little faster, and he ended up just circling around me. He ends up blocking my path again and gets a cigarette out and just gets right up in my face and tried to light it, but he couldn't because of the slush and wind. I took that chance to slide away from him, but he keeps trying to cut in front of me while lighting the cigarette. I made it to the CTA stop to go downstairs, but because he was really tall, he used his massive body to block the stairs in front of me. He was staring me down, and I wasn't sure what to do at that point. To my luck though, an older woman was coming through and he let her through. I dashed through the small opening he'd made for her and asked if I could stick with her because of my situation. She was really understanding and said of course. I wanted to tell CTA personnel, but of course there was no one in the booth. We took out our cards at the same time and we went through the turnstiles at the same time. He saw that I partnered up with her and tried to dash to us but he ran out of money or something because he didn't go through till a few minutes later. My new friend and I started making small talk to calm me down a bit and asked what train I was going to get on and what my stop was. To our surprise, we were headed the same direction with the exact same stop. He followed us down and was still smoking his cigarette, but that's when the CTA noticed and was walking towards him. He turned around so that he could smoke his cigarette fast, which meant that he was looking away from us. At that point, our train arrived and we both got on. He saw us and tried to get on, but he missed it by a few seconds. We both thought that was a close call. We continued to talk, even after we got off at our stop, and to our surprise, she basically dropped me off at home because she lived a block further up ahead of me. So, to the smoker CTA creep, let's not meet again.
When I was in my second year of university, I lived alone. It was a downstairs flat with my bedroom facing towards the street. I had some heavy green curtains, so I didn't mind too much. My friends lived about a 15 minute walk away, and I would go over every day until sometimes like 3 or 4 a.m. or sleep over. I had a long distance boyfriend at the time, and would sometimes be up late Skype sexing. Halloween rolls around, and I'm out with my friends. I decide to go back to mine and be a sexy Skype supergirl for my boyfriend. We get into it. We're having a great time. Curtains closed, lights off, just to be safe. I'd had a drunk man try to get in one time I fell asleep early and left the curtains open. It was really creepy. I woke up to the sounds of someone trying to push open the front door. When I looked up, there was a man, staring, stood so close his nose almost touched the window. I freaked out and spent the night in the living room. So the lights were off, curtains shut. I noticed a kind of flickering in my peripheral and looked around. While meeting at the bottom, the curtains parted very slightly near the top. Through the gap, there appears to be a trail of steam rising. I cover myself and get up to investigate. I have to get up and stand on my tiptoes to see through. The source of the steam was a man's mouth, hunched over and panting, exposed at the waist, doing what you think he'd be doing. I try to quickly rearrange the curtains, grabbing my laptop and hiding in the living room. A few days later, there's a pink envelope waiting for me when I walk through the door. As I pick it up, various small change falls out written on the lip of the envelope in jagged capital letters. I mean you no harm. With three X's. A horrible cold feeling spread throughout my body. Dread overlapped by shock. I'd never felt anything like it. I turn the card over to read the address side. There, in the same handwriting, to the girl in the front room. Opening it. I see it's a quite traditional sort of card, cream with a delicate watercolor of a bouquet on the front, thinking of you, in gold curvature next to it. The inside was completely covered by a message in capitals, some letters backwards and words misspelled. I gave the card to the police so I can't recite the whole passage verbatim, but the essence was, I'm an old man who has lived on the street for a long time. You've made me the happiest I've ever been in my life on Halloween. I'm sorry I scared you. You were very beautiful. I love to watch you whether you're working on your computer or touching yourself. Please leave your curtains open just a little bit for me. For each time you do this, I will post a couple of pounds through the letterbox. Signed, Ken. I called my friends, then got the police to come around. Basically, they couldn't really do anything. They took the card as evidence, gave me a case number, and said that they would get the patrol car to drive past my house for the near future. I stayed at my friend's for a week, and had one of them stay over at mine after that. That wasn't quite the last of Ken. Sometimes there would be knocking at my window, but I kept my curtains 100% closed. Three or four months of no incidents later, we got snow. I was leaving my house, now in the habit of checking my curtains every time I left or got back to the house. I see a set of footprints tracing the entire front window, back and forth, back and forth, like someone had been pacing. After I moved, my friend had a job where she could check the local electoral register. We did find that a Kay Mordu lived on my previous street. We did no further investigations, because it was a studenty area. I would walk past that house on my way home for the next two years. A while after I'd moved out, I saw that the window had been completely covered in newspaper, stuck from the inside. It seemed like someone was having trouble with Ken still coming around. So Ken, let's not meet again.
but I'm a 22-year-old female. At the time of this incident, I was about 16 or 17 years old. Because of what happened, I now never walk anywhere by myself after dark. I decided to sneak out to meet up with a friend, but neither of us had a car, so we were going to walk and meet up halfway between our houses. The halfway point was about a 40-minute walk. We ended up meeting at around midnight, and the walk there went fine no issues. We hung out for a while and ended up losing track of time and it was around 3am. I had to get home before my parents woke up for work or risk getting caught. We said our goodbyes and I started on my long walk back home. Since it was 3 in the morning, it was basically a ghost town, not a single person in sight. I hadn't seen even a single car drive past so I figured I would have a nice walk home. I was wrong. About ten minutes into my walk, I heard a car coming up behind me. Nothing too alarming about that. As the car passed me, they slammed on their brakes then cut off all their lights. Immediately a red flag. I saw the car turn down the next street ahead. I knew I would have to pass them to get home. Instead, I ran into a nearby parking lot and hid in the bushes and pulled out my phone to call my sister, to at the very least let someone know where I was at and what was happening, and to call 911 if needed. I unlocked my phone, and of course, 1%. Fuck. Then my phone died. As soon as this happened, I started to panic. I waited there for what seemed like forever, and decided to start towards home again. I started walking again and past the street they turned on and didn't see any cars. I started to relax, until I walked a little bit further and saw the very same car parked in the Burger King parking lot. As soon as they saw me, they started to back out of the parking lot and head towards me. I bolted across to the other side of the street. Instead of staying on the same road, I ducked into a neighborhood that would let me go back to the main road, but closer to my house. I got back onto the main road and thought I was in the clear. Then sure enough, the creep was driving towards me, and as soon as he passed me, he made a U-turn so that way he can follow me again, driving slow enough to be directly behind me. Luckily, another car was coming up behind him, so he was forced to speed up. I saw him up ahead going to turn around again. I took this opportunity to lay down in the grass between someone's fence and the sidewalk, just out of sight, so any passing cars could not see me. After he passed again, I got up and started sprinting towards a neighborhood that would lead me out to another main road that my house is off of. I made it to the main road and was so close to my house, but again, I see that car. He passed me and started turning around. I ran across the street and through this field and hopped my neighbor's fence, cut across my court and ran inside. I'd never been so happy to be home. This guy followed me for my entire walk home. I'm not sure what would have happened if I had just kept walking and ignored all the warning signs, but I know his intentions were not good. It was by far the scariest thing to ever happen to me. So, creep that followed me for 40 minutes. Let's never meet. In 2019, I moved to a post-Soviet country for work. There's this American diner I always go to on Saturdays for lunch. It's a one-of-a-kind place in the city, owned by this half-Cuban guy who loves the USA. Not surprisingly, the place attracts lots of American expats who want to feel home. It takes me around 25 minutes to get there walking from my apartment, but as it gets extremely cold during winter months, I always take a taxi that drops me off next to a big mall on the opposite side of the narrow street where the diner is. It's hard to describe it, but the best way to reach the restaurant's entrance is by crossing the fenced garden of an old wooden church. 
It's an orthodox church from the 19th century turned into a museum. It's now surrounded by massive office buildings. The garden is small. You can cross it in three minutes, and the exit gate faces the restaurant. During winter, snow covers it completely. It was a Saturday morning, January if I recall, and the snow was fresh on the floor. I was walking to the diner when I noticed unusual footprints in the snow, as if someone was walking in circles, back and forth and for a long period, but there was nobody around and all of the office buildings seemed to be closed. I keep walking. All of a sudden, a man that was hiding behind the church reveals himself. He doesn't look hostile, but there's something extremely odd about him. He's wearing baggy jeans, a dirty hoodie, and a blue cap. He approaches me, smiling. He starts walking on my side. Hey there, he says in English. Hey, I respond. Where are you from? Don't be afraid. I like foreigners. His English is surprisingly good. I keep walking in silence. You don't need to be afraid, my friend. I'm part of the couch surfing community. I'm a nice guy. Look. He tries to show me something on his phone. Maybe his couch surfing profile page. Would you stay at my place? He asks. No, dude, thank you. I say. And then he says, Okay, would you give me some money to buy us both coffee? You don't have to come with me. At that moment, I was already in front of the restaurant and casually opened the door to enter. He didn't follow me. Two weeks later, same Saturday routine, lunch at the diner and then back home. On my way, I decided to grab a coffee at a nearby place. As I'm walking to the shop, I feel someone following me. It's him again and wearing the same clothes. We make eye contact and he starts laughing. Then he proceeds to do an extremely creepy thing. He hides behind a bus stop that has glass panels on the sides and keeps staring at me. I mean, I could see him. He was being a complete creep on purpose. I enter the coffee shop and tell the barista, Hey, there's a guy following me. The girl looks at me worried and says something to the security guard. The guy enters the shop. The moment the door closes behind him, the barista looks at the guard, who immediately removes him from the place. They were so fast, it almost seemed as if they knew him. Thankfully, I never saw him again. Back in my college days, several friends and I went to Lake Havasu, Arizona for spring break. Those of you who have been probably hung around London Bridge Resort at some point. Next to the hotel area, there's a walking path that follows a canal which leads under the old London Bridge and then to Lake Havasu itself. This canal allows people to park their boats within walking distance to the resort. One night, three of my friends and I went for a stroll along this path. During our walk, we heard some shouting which went along the lines of, Be cool, be cool. We're leaving, man, just be cool. My group hung back for a bit. After a second, a group of guys came up. We asked them what was going on, and they said there were two guys in a boat. They were flashing people in the face with a spotlight, talking shit and pissing them off, then pulling out a pistol when they were about to get their asses kicked. We will refer to the guys in the boat as douchebags from here on out. So my group decided that we weren't going to stand for this and came up with a plan. We continued down the pathway to Douchebag's boat and played dumb. We asked them what those guys were so scared of. Being the smug, self-satisfied little douches they were, said, Those guys wanted to pick a fight with us, so I pulled my gad on them. It was actually an old 38 revolver. At that point, I knew this was going to be easy. You see, one of the members of our group was a girl. A pretty girl. A pretty girl wearing a bikini and cut off jean shorts. She laid on the dumb bimbo card and in no time had them eating out of her hand. She said, I've never seen a gun before. Is it heavy? 
do you have any more? Those dipshits handed her the gun to hold and said, No, that's the only one. She then handed it to our buddy Jay, who's a six foot four, 280 pound wall of meat. Jay threw that gun close to 250 feet away into the canal, which made a very satisfying thunk when it hit the water. Both douchebags were completely speechless. It took them close to 20 seconds just to process what had happened. Finally, one of them spoke and was all, What the fuck? Why did you do that? You better go get it. We just laughed and said, No, we won't. Think about that next time you're flashing people with that spotlight. After a few moments of incoherent shouting, one of them tried to get into Jay's face for some stupid reason. He didn't even make it out of his boat, and Jay shoved him back into his seat hard enough that it broke. Neither one of the douchebags were very big. Our female friend could have taken them. Our other buddy Jace told them to go park somewhere else for the night, because if we saw them again, we would kick their asses for real. So they pulled off, and when they were out and away from us, they started talking shit again. But we just kept laughing at them. After they were gone, we finished our walk and went back to the hotel and started partying again. It was a great night. So, if any of you make it out that way again, get your snorkel out. There's an old, rusted piece of shit pistol at the bottom of the canal by London Bridge Resort. I am a 31-year-old woman. This happened a few years back. I was walking from a friend's house to meet my son's father, who's now my ex, at a bar we frequented in those days. It was winter, icy and snowing, with giant piles of snow all around. I was walking from a friend's house around 9pm down an alley that served as a driveway area for many houses. Not a great neighborhood, but not particularly bad either. I was wearing my apocalypse boots. Waterproof, knee-high, winterproof. I usually have headphones on blaring music while I walk, but that night, for some reason, I decided not to. In hindsight, that is what saved me. I'm about the equivalent of two to three blocks away from the bar. There's a younger guy, early twenties, walking about fifty feet behind me. Hey, you. I turn around. It seems he's talking to someone else. Hey. I look back, then continue walking. Yeah, you. No. Don't turn around, sweetheart. I start to walk faster as I realize he's getting closer. Ahead of me, I see an SUV running, backed out of a parking spot but blocking my path. I turn around. There's another guy. The door to the SUV opens and there's a couple of guys in it looking at me. One gets out and stands by the open door. I turn to look at the guy behind me. Out of fucking nowhere, about five more guys come out, surrounding me from a distance, slowly closing in. The realization that they were hiding behind piles of plowed snow hits me. I realize they're just standing and watching me. A couple of them had their phones out and were recording something that was about to go down. Nobody was smiling, but they were closing in on me, trying to get me to walk to the SUV. Fight or flight kicked in, and I decided I didn't want to know what was about to happen. I wanted to catch them off guard, so instead of running forward, I bolted to the left. I ended up cutting through a few yards and made it to the bar. So guys trying to get me into your SUV while filming, let's not meet. When I was young, from the ages of 2 to 10, I lived on a 7 acre ranch. It was a small house in the front of the property where we lived, a huge grass yard and cabinet shop behind it and an orchard in the very back full of walnut trees. 
My father was a carpenter that always worked in the shop, and my mother was a school teacher that was almost always busy. Because of their jobs, and the fact that they were new to parenting, as I got older, they didn't really pay as much attention as they should have to where I would wander off. I would spend my days roaming around the yard, playing in the dirt, and running through the walnut trees. I obviously didn't question my lack of supervision, as it was fun to explore this huge plot of land, and I just thought I was being a normal kid. When I was about seven years old, my father surprised me with a brand new, child-sized ATV. It wasn't one of the electric ones that you're probably picturing either. It was damn fast, gas-powered, four-wheeler. Now, at this point, a good amount of you are probably questioning why someone would give a gas-powered ATV to a seven-year-old child. But like I said, my parents were a bit reckless and they, well, my dad, just wanted me to have fun. Pretty much right after I got the thing, I learned how to ride it by myself and started going farther into and past the property than I ever had before. I now had a free ride to basically as far as my young self would let me go before turning back. I started riding through the orchards behind my house almost every day, and I loved it more than I had loved anything before. I would leave my house and be gone for hours. After a while, I gradually started roaming farther and farther away from my house as I became more brazen and a little older. I would ride down this dirt path that leads past what I assumed was our neighbor's land and onto a ditch that held water. At the time, I just liked looking through the water as it flowed, and I felt like I was a little explorer. I honestly never contemplated that what I was doing could be the least bit dangerous, and I really don't think my parents knew how far I was riding. When I think back on it now, just the idea of riding a pretty dangerous piece of equipment far away from my house, without my parents knowing where I was, and before cell phones existed, is pretty scary in itself, as I could have crashed or hit my head, and no one would have been able to find me. However, luckily this never happened, and is not what this story is about. So, one day, like every other, I was riding far away from home, and I passed by a man wearing a dirty white shirt, denim jeans, and a wicker farmer's hat. I remember it vividly, as it was the first person I'd seen in all the time I'd been out there. I remember the surprised look in his eyes as he stared at me while I rode past him. I had no reason to stop, and my parents had always taught me about stranger danger, so I kept going and forgot about it. On my way back home, a couple hours later, I was coming up to the same spot, and it dawned on me that this is where I'd seen the man. I looked ahead, not expecting him to be there. As I said, it had been hours. Yet, as the trees parted, there he was. I really didn't think it was too weird, because I figured that he was either a farmer or a homebody. So I kept driving, coming closer to where he was. He seemed friendly, to be honest. He had a big smile on his face, like he was happy to see me. To my ten-year-old self, I just thought he was a friendly guy, so I waved at him as I passed by, and he waved back. I continued on my way and drove home, not thinking much about it. I don't really remember how much time it passed between then and the next time I went riding, but it couldn't have been more than a couple days. Like usual, I took the same dirt road, past the same few orchards to the same ditch full of water. I didn't think much about my previous encounter, so I hadn't been thinking about the stranger with the big smile. I was sitting on the edge of the ditch when I heard footsteps in the dirt coming up from behind me. Again, I remember this vividly because it was not a common occurrence to see anyone on this trail. I remember being more curious than scared and turned around to see the same stranger with a smile. This time, his smile seemed to be more of a toothy grin. He called out to me as he walked up, asking what my name was in a heavy southern drawl. I told him with confidence that I wasn't really allowed to talk to strangers, to which he said, That's a good idea. Although you really shouldn't be out here, all by yourself. It can be dangerous for a kid your age. I remember this striking me in the gut with a little bit of butterfly feeling. I wasn't afraid, but I felt uneasy. 
This piqued my curiosity, however, as I wondered what he meant. So I asked him. He continued to walk closer to me slowly and answered, I heard they found a little boy out here, just around your age. I think it was that ditch right there where he drowned. I would like to point out here that although my parents were reckless, they were not stupid. If there had been a drowning near our house that was reported, or there had been a story in the paper, they definitely wouldn't have let me out anymore. Anyways, he continued, Why don't you come with me, and I'll take you back to your parents? It's not safe out here for a kid your age. Uh, it's okay, I have my quad right here. I'll just ride back. I pointed over to the side of him where my quad was, but he didn't look. His eyes remained fixed on me. They were deep brown, almost black, and piercing into me. At this point I was scared, and I knew that this could be a bad situation. I was hoping that he was just a concerned old man, but there was no way I was going with him anywhere. I got to my feet to start walking to my quad, to which the man said, Should a kid your age be riding something that dangerous? Let's just put it in my truck, and I'll give you a ride back. I don't see a truck, I said, looking around, hoping to talk my way out of the situation. Oh, it's right over there on my property. You can't see it from here, he said, his smile widening. It's really okay, I'll just go now, I said, starting again to walk to my quad. But as I passed him, he reached and grabbed my arm. You really shouldn't be out here, he said, staring me deep in the eyes. It's not safe for little kids. Let me go, you're hurting me, I shouted, starting to panic, but this only made him grip tighter. Maybe you don't deserve to go back home. What kind of parents would let their kid out here all alone? Maybe you should come home with me and I'll take care of you. At this point, I was about to piss my pants. I was freaking out and started to scream. I don't know if I was saying anything. I just know I was screaming as loud as I ever had before. This only seemed to anger him. As his once toothy grin turned to a face of anger, he put his hand over my face and I took this opportunity to bite his finger as hard as I could. I still remember the taste of blood, so I know I hurt him pretty bad. Thankfully, this caught him off guard as he finally let me go. I knew this was my one chance to get away from this weirdo, so I booked it to my quad as he winced in pain. You little shit, get the fuck over here, he cried in anger. I knew I didn't have much time, so I jumped on my quad and turned the key as fast as I could. It started up. And just as I pulled the gas handle, I felt a hand start to grab my neck. Luckily, he didn't have a grip yet, as I was already starting to drive away. I punched it and noped the hell out of there. At this point, all I could hear was the sound of my quad, so I wasn't sure if he was running after me. But I wasn't going to look, as I could possibly crash and be shit out of luck. I drove down that dirt path as fast as the quad would go probably the fastest I've ever driven it. When I got home, I peeled out into the dirt and ran into the house, hoping to God my mom was home. I burst into her room, bawling, and there she was. She asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't talk yet as I was so afraid. I just kept bawling. I think I cried for a good 30 minutes before I could summon up the strength to stop and tell her what happened. I remember the fear in her eyes as I described what happened. She pulled me close to her and hugged me as hard as she ever had. The next day, I talked to a police officer and recounted the story of what transpired. I honestly don't remember much after this, as I think I started to block it out. It's not really something a ten-year-old wants to think about. Needless to say, they never let me off the property again. My dad started drinking and we lost the house soon after this anyway, so I didn't have to live there much longer. Recently, I was thinking about that day after I started trying to remember various parts of my childhood. 
My parents had never told me what happened after the cops were called, and I had never really asked, because I tried not to think about it. So yesterday, I went to my mother's house and asked her if they ever found the guy, considering he had to live pretty close to our property. She was kind of startled by the question, because we hadn't talked about this in 15 years. She paused for a minute, as if pondering whether to tell me, and said, We didn't have any neighbors out that way. It was all corporate-owned land, and the description you gave didn't match any of the neighbors in the other direction. We called the cops, and they went to search where you told us you were, but the guy was long gone by the time they got there. They looked around the property and found an abandoned house that hadn't been used in years since the land was purchased. When they looked inside, they could tell that he'd been staying there. Apparently, he had left his stuff behind. We never told you this because you were way too young, but one of the things they found was a black grocery bag. It had a roll of duct tape and a hunting knife inside. Thanks, Mom, but did I really need to know that? Okay, so... The offense happened when I was in 5th grade, about 4 years ago, and my revenge happened in 8th grade, just about 1 year ago. So, I was in 5th grade, almost at the end of the year. I was pumped, because I just finished all my subjects with 100%, no points lost at all, which also meant I was at the top of my grade. Also, I had gotten 242 at my mathematics map testing. For those who don't know, map is measurement of academic progress. It really doesn't do anything. Teachers just use it to know how much one knows. And in the program we used for our map testing, 242 was a really high score in elementary. What is expected of a fifth grade genius is in the 230s range. This is important for later. So, I was just minding my own business, going back to class after break, when this fifth grade teacher intercepted me. Now, you need to understand that we had four classes, like most schools with an ABCD system. I was lucky and got 5B, which has the coolest teacher. He genuinely loved teaching. 5A, however, was unfortunate. He treated his students like trophies, taking credit for their high grades. But, as I've heard from my friends over there, he barely taught. He would come to school strolling in really late, shout at the students for no apparent reason, just sit there at his desk while the good kids who actually cared worked, and the others just sat there. If anyone made a peep, detention, and a disciplinary referral, those things, if the offense was serious enough, could ban you from entering any college. He even threatened some poor kid who did nothing wrong with putting in a disciplinary referral in for drug possession. What the fuck? He wanted to accuse a 10-year-old with drug possession. But that's not our story. Anyways, that asshole never really liked me. I think it was because I had such high marks and he couldn't credit himself for them. So anyways, back to the story, where I bumped into him. Sorry, sir, I mumbled, and then just scooted past him. After that, for some obscure reason, he became pissed off. Come back, he shouted. Me, being dumb and scared, stupidly came back. He told me to enter his class, which was full with his students. He then started to shout at me about being disrespectful, and he was so mad that I was shaking in my size 3 shoes. What he said after was what really stuck to me. You know what? In South Africa, I am in my legal right to hurt you with my knife. He then proceeded to get a knife out of the top drawer and put it against my skin, breaking it a little. We weren't in South Africa, we were in Saudi Arabia, but he was from South Africa. Then he pointed at another kid and shouted, Look at this kid, he's got 236 at his map testing, that means he's a genius. Try to get higher than him, smartass. You think you're so smart, huh? You're just a spoiled little brat. 5A took the test before 5B so I didn't set the record for 242 yet. After that, I took the map test, and he proctored us. 
He kept smirking at me, kicking my seat and other stuff, until I finished the test and got 242. Then I looked at him in the eye and said, Looks like I'm a genius too. But that wasn't the revenge. You see, I thought it was some hazing ritual to see if I was tough enough for middle school. I know, stupid. But remember, I was nine years old at the time. Fast forward three years to eighth grade. I did not speak of this to anybody, and the kids who were there were too scared to speak up. Anyways, I chose to tell my best friend. He was horrified and told me to report him immediately. I realized what he did traumatized me. I was constantly afraid that any adult had a knife up their sleeve and was about to start shouting at me. So, I set myself for revenge. I was not just going to report him, which would get him fired. I went to everybody at that class, documenting all the horrible things he did, with over 30 kids saying the same thing, with a model student vouching for them. The principal had no choice but to comply, and he knew of the constant trust issues I was having. So he fired him and assured me that he was banned from any teaching position in the country. I live in the deep mountains. I'm talking a 45 minute drive to the nearest small town. We are nearly completely isolated and surrounded on all sides by thousands of acres of national forest. It is the real deal to live there and not uncommon for large predators to roam through our property. Grizzlies, lions, wolves, and all that. To help combat this, my wife and I have several large shepherd dogs that roam the property. They do an excellent job rerouting wildlife around the property, marking, and just being good survival companions. If something goes bump in the night, either the dogs freak out or they don't. After a while, you learn to interpret their barking and growling, from batshit panic when a bear's outside to annoyed, I'm trying to sleep yapping when a raccoon gets in the trash. Still, you never get fully used to them barking in the night. There's always a what if in the back of your head. Well, I let them inside to eat at night or when it's too cold to be outside. One December evening, my wife and I had them in and we were watching Planet Earth. No big deal. We're all a big happy family gathered around the TV. My shepherds love to watch the television, see all the cool animals. We had watched several episodes and they never made a peep when they saw sharks, elephants, komodos, hyenas, whatever came up. Then came the mountain episode, and they were on high alert, but still calm, until they cut to a night vision scene of a mountain lion stalking in the dark. They all lost it, nearly knocked over the TV trying to attack it. Our youngest pup, who's still 80 pounds, jumped on our laps and was visibly shaking and full tilt barking and growling. It was unnerving to say the least. We get lions around here, but to see how keen the dogs were on just a clip of one really demonstrated not only the fact that they were intimately familiar with the threat, but that they instinctively knew what one looked like prowling in the night. It was an inherent threat, and they not only knew it, but were scared to death of it. We'd watched hundreds of hours of shows with them and never once got that reaction before. Alright, thanks for sticking with me this far. Here's the shit your pants scary part of the story. I really don't even like writing it, because the whole thing still freaks us out to this day. We are again all inside on a cold winter night. My wife and I sit down to watch some TV, and the dogs gather around intently. I decide to throw on a stupid alien documentary my friend recommended. The dogs watch closely, but seem normal. Then the documentary shows some supposed pictures of graylings lurking in the night. The dogs fucking lose it. Worse than the mountain lions. Holy shit. We have to turn off the TV to stop the dogs from destroying the house. And even then they're really freaked out, tucked tails, whimpering, the works. Again, we watch TV with them all the time. And nothing has ever got them riled up, let alone full panic. Except for these two instances. After we calm the dogs down, 
my wife and I sat in silence for a long while as the horror slowly washed over us. That, what if, when you hear the dogs freaking out in the middle of the night, apparently could be aliens. Not fucking cool. So I recently had a few encounters with the delivery guy. First was he asked me, Are you Amy Beck from 12 Willow Street? You moved, huh? While smiling creepily. I thought he was just a delivery guy that was trying to do small talk, so I brushed him off. I live alone, so I thought I was just overthinking by being creeped out. Then I realized after I thought about it that he was my neighbor in my previous address. He struck up a lot of conversation with me, saying he knows one of my friends. I don't like talking to strangers, so I didn't talk with him long, but it stayed with me because I felt uncomfortable with him, almost like he was dangerous. After that, I was going out and I saw him again delivering to my neighbor, and I ignored him trying to walk by. He saw me and recognized me, even though I was wearing a mask, and asked the same question again. After that... Due to me not going out much, I didn't see him as often. There was this one time he was standing in front of my neighbor's house, but I just walked by. Then I saw him in my Facebook friend requests, and I just ignored him again, but I was obviously creeped out. So I told my friend that he said he knew. At first, my friend said she didn't know anyone with that name, but his last name made her recognize him as a son of a family friend. They never talked. His family didn't know he was working as a delivery guy, and he was laid off because he became obsessed with his boss, who was much older than his mom. I also lost my keys, so I asked my landlord for a replacement. I didn't think much of it, until I got home to my door open. Obviously I was cautious, but there was no one at my apartment, so I sighed in relief, thinking maybe I had left it open. I work night shift, so sometimes my mind is all over the place. Now that I'm thinking about it, I overlooked a lot of things and I'm thinking of installing CCTV in front of my apartment. I'm still scared though because he knows my address. For an update, my friend told me to report him to the police, but I'm too scared because they might just let him go and he'll take revenge on me. She also told me that he might be doing drugs, as told by his family, since he was acting really suspicious. And for the last update, so far, I haven't encountered him anymore, though I don't really go out much. I said my delivery name to my boyfriends, maybe because his family knew and talked to him. I haven't caught anything strange around my house either. I think I'm in a safe zone now. I'm going to move to a different city in a few months after this, probably with my dog. My boyfriend is another problem since he can't move in because his parents won't let him. If only he was worried about me as you guys. Maybe I'll just go get another boyfriend. I live on a main road in kind of a sketchy area. Not completely unsafe, but an area I've posted about on here because of some of the creepy stuff that has happened to me. But this one is the creepiest. I'd gone out at around 6 for food. It recently snowed, and my city sucks at sidewalk plowing, so it's an arctic exhibition for a few days, walking through deep snow and ice. As I trudged through, I passed a man who lives in my neighborhood, and he can act strange. He walks oddly and can be pretty creepy at times. He passes me one way, I pass him the other, and we go separate ways. After I got my food, walking back, I thought I saw him coming my way. I quietly, out loud said, Oh man, not him, but then slowly faded away. This person walked off the path towards the church on the street. This church has a big LED sign which you can hide behind. As I got closer, I realized it was a younger man about my age, with a grey hoodie and beige cargo pants. He was acting strange. He walked like a Disney cartoon character, 
and his face had a big smile with eyes shifting at a million miles per hour. Then I saw, as he looked at me approach, quickly pulled his hood over his head and stepped beside the sign, obstructing my view of him. I don't know if he saw me see him, but I realized what might be going down. I just stopped on the path. From the snow, it would have been too much to turn around and head back. My boots were getting sucked into the slushy, snowy path. I waited for a few moments, and he must have realized then that I knew, because he came back out from the sign and went up to the church windows. The church is also a community center, and there's a room facing the street that looks kinda like a dance room with a large mirror. He took off his hood and started fake dancing around in front of the window. He kept looking back as if his little distraction would have been enough to end my interest in a what the fuck is happening situation, but it didn't. It disturbed me even more. When he realized this, we made a sort of shuffle around each other. His smile disappeared and he kept trying to inch his way towards me, but he got bogged down in the same slush that I stopped in. After I got farther away, I just watched as he put his hood up again and walked away normally now towards the restaurant and mall I had just come from. This area gets stranger and stranger every day. My wife passed away after many years battling an awful degenerative disease. We were married 13 years, and after several months of not being able to find my footing, I made a decision to move out of state and start a new chapter to force myself into beginning a new life. I was immediately validated by getting my first job in over eight years. Things slowly begin to start moving forward, and after prodding from my friends, I signed up for a mobile dating app. I met a couple of people that I didn't really have a lot of chemistry with, the first date I went on was cordial, but not of any consequence. She wound up asking me to fix a laptop she had. The second person I met called me and we decided to meet for Chinese food. Since I didn't have a car, I walked the five or six blocks, but not before it started to rain. She'd already sat at a table and was waiting for me to arrive. We exchanged pleasantries, and soon it's all about her divorce and why she lost her kids and all of the legal proceedings of her current cases. Okay. And then she would pause, clasp my hands on the table, turn her head, lean in a bit and say, but that's nothing compared to what you went through. Tell me about your dead wife. Like clockwork, she would ramble on about the craziest stuff, about how they're all trying to get her, then stop her crazy babbling and ask about my details and how bad it felt and my poor wife's decline in condition. I had only put in my profile that I was a widower, nothing else. It was at this point that I got seriously weirded out, deep in my gut fully weirded out. What I couldn't figure out, was she trying to mimic what she thought a sensitive person would be like, or was there a possibility that she wanted to know those painful graphic details? for other perverted reasons. I made short work of the entree and paid the entire check. She called my phone a few times and I made several excuses why I was unable to meet again. I got a couple of calls from blocked numbers that didn't say anything, but they stopped after a month or two. I'm blessed and remarried, but I'm so grateful I noped the fuck right out of there and never messed with this lady again. I'm a thin, athletic white guy, five foot nine. Not the most intimidating presence, but I happen to have a nice bulky coat on that probably added some uncertainty. Also, my savior, because as mentioned, not a bear, would be my situational awareness. Anyway, story time. It's 2.30 a.m. or so, and it's my favorite time to do laundry. There's a 24-7 auto-electronic laundromat right by my apartment. While there's employees there during business hours, there's roughly an eight hour stretch where I'm the only one who will be in the building. 
I'll occasionally see an old timer around 4.30 to 5 a.m., but usually only on Sundays, which I avoid. It's literally a half mile from my place. I sit down there. It's a cold night, well below freezing. I toss in my clothes, soap, and swipe the laundry card. I'm on my way to grab gas, milk, deposit at the bank, and back to my apartment to bring some things inside from my car. I do some dishes and decide to head back down. I'm usually playing a video game while running my laundry or just procrastinate. My stuff will sit for up to an hour sometimes. There's no one there, so hey. Not this time. It's now just shy of 3 a.m., and I get the notification that my laundry is done on my phone as I'm seconds from the laundromat parking lot. I pull in and scan the parking lot. No one here. I proceed to walk in through the front door and immediately notice someone come into the building from the far side door. A guy, maybe six foot, with two hoodies on, both hoods up, most of his face concealed. It's unlocked and often used when the place is busy, but there were no cars there. There is a bathroom in the place. As I walk to my machines, which is about dead center in the building, I thought this person had quickly bolted back outside. Then I noticed him again. I think he had ducked, still just by the door. Mind you, we had two islands of laundry machines between us. He starts up near the wall, which is on my left. I'm watching him at this point. I was hoping he'd need to use the bathroom, but he hurried past it. Not a run, but a very quick walk. Now he's on the opposite side, near the corner of the laundry machine strip, maybe 15 feet away and just out of my line of sight for a moment. I didn't want to trigger the guy or appear scared, so I continued shoveling my wet clothes into the laundry cart. The adrenaline begins trickling, hair on the back of my neck goes up. Before rounding the corner and crossing back into my vision, he had hesitated. I eventually turned my head to rotate back, and he kind of popped into the picture. He glanced over and we made eye contact as I reached into my coat pocket to fist my keys. He continues up the aisle and makes a left back out the side door. I have a little blade on my keys, so I popped that open and proceeded to toss my shit in the dryer while scanning my surroundings the entire time. Eventually the time comes to go outside. The front doors are automatic, so I had both hands free. I literally walked out of the place wielding a knife shaking with adrenaline. But it was a ghost town. I proceeded to my car and went home. I drove my wife into work and I waited until about six to go grab my clothes. My conclusion is that I'm nearly positive that this person scoped out the laundromat. My machine has a digital timer for the current wash. This guy entered the building within a minute of it going off and me pulling into the lot. At 3 a.m., a night when it was 20 degrees Fahrenheit out. Coincidence, maybe, but I was scared either way. Thanks for listening. I would love to hear your thoughts. This happened in July, I believe. It was around 1 a.m. and it was still about 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And where I live, AC isn't very common. So I was sitting in the living room with all the windows and doors open. I head out to smoke and since everything was open and I didn't want the house to smell like smoke, I walked down the driveway and sat on the curb. There was a man standing on the same side of the street but a block down just staring at me. And I got really uncomfortable so I got up and crossed the road. The way my triplex is set up is there is a three car driveway, then a few stairs up that lead into the yard, and then my door to the right, my neighbors straight ahead, and some more stairs to my other neighbors upstairs. I live somewhere with a lot of homeless people, and they'll come up the driveway to look in our trash for cans or whatever, and that's fine. They never go up past the steps. So I'm standing on the other side of the road, and I watch the man stand and stare at me, and then he proceeds to walk all the way into my yard, and I start to panic as I didn't lock the doors and all the windows were open. So I start to walk down the street, 
and I see a man who looks normal, and I stop him and ask if he could just pretend to know me. In retrospect, this wasn't my brightest decision, but whatever. So me and this man are standing there just talking, and I'm explaining the situation, and we're both just smoking a cigarette, and we're looking at my house. I'm currently stood a few houses down. The man keeps peeking around the tree lines next to my place. He peeks around the corner a few more times, and eventually walks up to me. I'm scared shitless and I'm shaking, and he asks me for a cigarette. I go to hand him one, and he says, Why are you shaking? Are you scared? And I said, No, have a great night. He walks away, and the other guy stands there for a little longer with me, and the scary man starts peeking around another corner, just staring at me again. The guy I'm with walks me to my house, and I shut all the windows and doors, and I just dealt with the heat. I'm grateful to that random guy, and I don't know what I would have done if he wasn't there. Coming down a mountain trail at dusk, I realized I may have lingered at the summit a bit too long. By my estimation, I have perhaps a bit less than an hour to the trailhead. I'm alone, but know the trail well and have a headlamp on me. Just as dusk fades into a moonless, pitch-black night, I'm rounding a corner and freeze instinctively. Eye shine is reflecting back at me from the darkness, about thirty yards away. The vague outline of a large, solitary black bear emerges from the forest and steps onto the trail, facing me. It stares at me, and I stare back. Black bears live in this area. I've known this and seen them twice during the day on previous trips. Nothing like being face to face with one at night though. I raise my hands above my head, making myself as big as possible. I scream long and loud, as guttural and fierce a man scream I can muster. The bear pauses and chuffs at me, briefly looking behind it at the forest it came from. It then slowly and casually turns away from me walking back into the forest from where it came. The crunching sound of leaves underfoot of the bear grows quieter until the only thing I can hear is my pounding heartbeat. I realize I now have to go in the same direction as the bear went. Maybe a minute or so goes by and I sprint. As I pass the point where the bear stood, I glance at the woods while not stopping and seeing nothing. Shortly after, while running, I look back behind me, back up the trail to make sure I'm not followed. I continue to periodically glance behind me while running down the mountain. I endure maybe thirty long minutes of running in pitch darkness down this mountain, with my heart at 130 beats per minute. Thankfully I didn't trip or fall and injure myself. I made it back to the trailhead safely. A few years back, I was driving home after taking my dad to the airport for a late flight. It was already dark when I left the airport, and I still had a three-hour drive home. A few hours into the drive, I get recalculated to some windy back road highway. There were no cars or street lights, and so it was a pretty dark and creepy road. As I turned a curve, I noticed a black car come out of nowhere and start to ride my bumper. Then, the blue lights. The road was so dark, I had to try for a minute to find a spot with at least a few small lights where I could pull over. The officer came up to my window and asked me if I knew that my tags were expired. I thought it was kind of odd because I was driving my mom's car and she's usually pretty on top of things like that, but it was more so the way he talked that made me uneasy. He was speaking pretty fast, like he was in a hurry or something. As he's standing at my window, before he even gets my license or registration, his radio beeps and tells me that he's got to go on another call. He practically runs back to the car and speeds off. I head back home, half weirded out, half thanking God that I didn't get a ticket. I kind of brush it off until I go outside to my car the next day. 
and find that my tax were not due to expire for two more months. It could have been a simple mistake, but I couldn't help recalling how weird the whole incident was. He could have misread the number, but looking back, I wonder what could have happened if he was someone with bad intentions. From then on, I pull over only in well-populated areas, and if a safe option is unavailable, I call 911 to make them aware. So my grandma and I decided to drive from Illinois to Oklahoma City to visit my dad. We made it there, and I got to see a lot of my family I'd not seen in years. I lived in Oklahoma for six years. On the way home, my grandma asked me to pull over at the next rest stop, and I obliged. It was in the middle of a bright spring day. We both got out and headed to the ladies' room. I noticed this guy standing behind a tree, just staring. It gave me the creeps, but I didn't give it another thought. My grandma gave me a shout, telling me she was going back to the car. I finished up and headed outside. The creepy guy was still standing behind the tree. I walked a little faster, and he started pacing me. I was about to scream when a family came around the corner to use the bathroom. It was enough to make him leave me alone. We got back on the road, and about a mile down there was a roadblock. They were stopping everyone because they were looking for a seriously deranged psychopath. I told them to check the rest stop in hopes that they would catch him. It gives me the chills to think about it today. I was only 21 at the time, but I wasn't naive. I thank that family, even though they don't know what happened. I was living in a flat share on the outskirts of a city, which is known for generally being very safe. A key is needed to enter the main building, but often the door isn't shut properly and so doesn't lock. Not really a cause for concern for anyone in the building, as it's a very trusting neighborhood. It's around 2am, and I'm laying in bed, naked, completely sprawled out. Someone opens my door and enters. I figure it's one of my flatmates going to the balcony. You have to walk through my room to access it, so it's completely normal that someone might come in at this time. I've just smoked a joint, and it's 2am, so I opt to ignore him and pretend to be asleep. I can feel him standing there for about two minutes. I think, maybe he's waiting for his girlfriend to join him, and maybe he stood there checking his phone. No big deal. He goes on to the balcony. Takes about two or three minutes, so I figure it's definitely him. He's smoking a cigarette. He comes back in and goes back to standing in total silence, but I'm half asleep and don't really think anything of it. The next morning, my flatmate tells me that someone broke in, came into my room, went into the room of my flatmate, and rummaged through his things, went into the kitchen, and upon seeing my flatmate wake up, and come to see what was going on, quickly exited the building. The only thing he stole was my pair of Marshall headphones. We were all very confused as to why they only stole my headphones as opposed to money left on the table, or my flatmate's multiple cameras, for example. We spoke to our neighbors, of which there were around 15 in the building, and not one of them had noticed anything out of the ordinary. They hadn't gone into any of the other apartments. We know that most of the neighbors also don't lock their doors at night, so it sounds as if they walked up three flights of stairs, they ignored the other apartments with the sole intention of coming to ours. And given the stealth, it's unlikely that they were intoxicated and it was just a mistake. Nothing else came of it. The police said they'd keep an eye out and I had to buy a new pair of headphones but it left me thinking about what would have happened had I opened my eyes and alerted this person standing over me. Would they have hurt me? Would it be a total stranger or someone whom I've already met?
When I was younger, maybe around 13 to 14, I was walking to town with my mother. I live in a smallish town in England. It was a quick walk, but about five minutes after leaving my home, I had one of the most unsettling encounters ever. Whilst walking, there was a man approaching us. Nothing weird at this point. I thought he'd walk past us like everyone else. However, this random man leaned in towards me as he was walking past and whispered something to me. I remember it being creepy and along the lines of him knowing where I lived. It was subtle and happened quickly. I was shocked, especially since my mother was right next to me. Bold move from a creepy guy. I recall the man being possibly in his late twenties, kind of scruffy looking, a bit chubby with longish brown hair and a beard, but I knew I'd never seen him before this point. I waited a few seconds for us to distance ourselves from the stranger, then turned to my mom completely freaked out and quietly asked if she heard what the guy had said. She said she didn't. I thought maybe I misinterpreted the situation or misheard him then. We kind of brushed it off and continued with our day. I felt uneasy, but tried not to think about it. The rest of the day was fairly normal. Until the morning after, when my dad was talking to our neighbor. Our neighbor told my dad that during the early hours of the morning, there was a man lurking right outside our houses for some time, hovering around my dad's and neighbor's cars. Now, this is really weird because we live in a kind of closed off area. The only people we see outside our homes are neighbors, but even they wouldn't come right up to our doors, especially not at like 2 or 3 a.m. Even delivery drivers can't find our house most of the time because we're hidden away. This has never happened before and never happened again after this, at least to our knowledge. Of course you can imagine how absolutely terrified I was to hear this. I explained to my dad what had happened the day before and reminded my mom, kind of an I told you so moment. I felt so scared to be in my own home. I remember calling my friend and talking about the situation. We researched about what we could do, but there wasn't really any action we could take. We just had to be observant and cautious, I guess. I can't remember much about what happened after that, but I never saw the man again. The whole situation creeps me out, and it doesn't make any sense. The man outside my house wasn't confirmed to be the same man that walked past me earlier, as it was too dark to make out any discernible features, but it sure is an amazing coincidence, if so. This story happened three years ago, around the time that the pandemic started, so it was a while back, but still worthy of a post. It was early 2020, and I'd just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She'd bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it, and their commute to work was so long, they moved out and the house was uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my workplace, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. I just paid for the water and electricity and looked after the house. I was living there for a solid two or three months and had already gotten used to it. One night, after coming back from work and parking my car, as I walked towards my door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down and picked it up, thinking that it might have been mine since I'm a smoker, but after looking at the brand name, I realized that it wasn't mine and threw it away. I didn't think much of it and just shrugged it off as some asshole throwing it at my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was pissed off and thought that someone sat on my porch and smoked, but since I didn't know who it was, there was nothing I could do about it. I noticed that they were put out pretty recently, so whoever it was probably walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop and it was pretty late, about 1am, so I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. 
It's a suburban neighborhood, and it was the pandemic, so people rarely ventured out at night. But I didn't think much of it. Around half an hour later, I was surprised when I heard chattering nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about, as their voice seemed almost muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off my sofa and walked to the front door to make sure that it was locked. As I was approaching the front door, I froze mid-step as I heard the two approaching my porch and reducing their talking to a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was wanted to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door or the doorknob to be shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they'd walked away or changed their mind. My windows have bars from the inside out that you have to unlock so that you could move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback. Leaning up against my window was a man. He was as startled as I was, because he basically stuttered over his own steps as he jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face, so all I could really see was his big blue eyes looking at me. His friend realized what was going on, and right away started to kick the door in. He kicked it a solid four or five times, but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I was staring at them, frozen in fear, and trying to comprehend the situation... I snapped out of it and slammed the bars over my window, locking them, and running upstairs to the storage room where I pushed a table to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two to come inside at any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the windows being shaken aggressively. When they realized that they couldn't get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up half the neighborhood. By the time the cops came, they were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't keen on staying there, so shortly after, I moved out. My sister sold the house a few months later, and as far as I know, nothing similar ever happened since. I honestly don't know what they wanted or why they were so determined to get in. But whoever it was, let's not meet again. In June of this year, I moved out of my parents' apartment as I finally got a steady job and longed for some sort of freedom. I looked for apartments that were affordable in my city and found one that's a two or three minute walk from my parents' apartment. To me, it was perfect. I'd get to live alone and my parents would still be nearby so I could visit them whenever I wanted or pop in to have breakfast with them. The apartment itself is great. It's not really much to look at, but for a single male, it's more than enough. My apartment has a long corridor connecting each room together from the sides with my apartment door being at the start of the corridor. My bedroom is the second room on the left, but since the walls are pretty thin, you can literally hear people in the apartment complex walking and talking and whatever else they do from my bedroom. Last week, I came home from the pub after meeting up with a few friends. It wasn't really late, around 10.15 or 10.30ish, and I had the day off, so I took a shower and hopped into bed to watch Netflix. It was probably around midnight when I heard a faint knock coming from the front door. I stopped the show that I was watching and listened for a minute or so and just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me. I continued watching Netflix when once again I heard a two-motion knock on my door. I sat up from bed, went to the door and looked through the peephole and sure enough it was pitch black. I once again shrugged it off and went back to my room but before I could even sit down properly, I heard a slightly louder knock. At this point, I thought it was my friends playing a prank on me, so I called my friend and asked if he was knocking on my door, and if he was, it wasn't amusing. He paused for a second and said, Dude, I'm at home, 
I have to be up at like 7.30. I believed him and hung up the phone. I was talking pretty loudly, so whoever was knocking probably heard me, and as soon as I hung up, I heard another knock. At this point, I was pretty pissed off, so I walked to the door, looked through the peephole again, and saw nothing. I then unlocked the door and took a peek, and then I closed the door and locked it. Me, being angry and a bit intoxicated, I decided to wait and catch whoever was knocking. So I spent a solid ten minutes silently looking through the peephole before being a bit startled as someone put their hand over it and knocked again. I immediately started unlocking the door and ran out to the apartment hall. I heard someone booking it down the steps and heard them lean against the wall as his jacket shrugged the wall. So I ran a few steps down before realizing that whoever this is was waiting behind the corner to get the jump on me. I hurried back inside and called the cops. They were there within a few minutes and scanned the building and the street, but couldn't find anyone. They told me that it could just be some kids pulling a prank and to never run after someone. They kept the patrol car around the entire night and the knocking stopped. It could have been some kids being dumb but the part that gave me the fucking creeps was the fact that whoever it was ran down the stairs and stopped behind the corner. They didn't keep running. If it were some pranksters, I find it more likely that they would have just booked it outside. As I said, it's been a week and the knocking stopped. It kept me on edge for a few days because I just expected to be jumped by someone when walking into my apartment. But so far, nothing has come of it. I've let it go, and just hope that it won't happen again. A few years ago, I was on a train home. It was a warm summer afternoon and I remember being in a particularly good mood as I stood by the train doors looking out of the window. The sun was shining, I felt good, and I didn't want to spend the rest of the evening stuck indoors, so I thought why not get off the train a stop early and walk the rest of the way home, so that's what I did. I got off the train at Lewisham Station, which is around a 30 minute walk from my then home, which was situated not far from Hither Green Station my original destination, and started slowly walking home. I could have taken a shortcut and followed a busy road towards Hither Green, but instead decided to walk the longer route through the nearby shopping center and up the busy Lewisham High Street in search of some smiles and excitement. The High Street was unusually quiet that day. I'm not sure if there was a big sporting event happening or something, but I remember there weren't as many cars or people around as usual. I had a pleasant slow walk along the high street, enjoying every last photon I could absorb, and came to a junction where I had to turn left onto Court Hill Road, which leads up to a hill to Hither Green Lane. As soon as I turned left onto Court Hill Road, my attention was immediately drawn to, on the opposite side of the road, a lady pushing a pushchair up the hill. She had a baby in the buggy that I couldn't see at the time, and a small toddler walking and skipping alongside her holding onto the left handle of the buggy. I smiled to myself, thinking how heartwarming they looked together. Remembering back when I was that age, happily skipping along, holding onto my mother's hand. They were probably 75 meters ahead of me when I turned onto the road, and we were walking at pretty much the same pace. For no reason whatsoever, I decided to speed up a bit. A minute or two later, I'd gotten maybe a third of the way along the road and had closed the gap between us a bit, but they were still maybe 50 meters ahead of me. For no reason whatsoever, I suddenly felt like jogging, so I very lazily started jogging, more like bouncing up the hill, and all I could think about was this family on the opposite side of the road. I was fixated on them. Then, again, for no reason whatsoever, I suddenly wanted to cross the road, despite the fact that I lived on the left side and crossing was the opposite of what I'd normally do. It made no sense for me to cross over, but I wanted to. 
so I step out into the road, which was totally silent, with not a car in sight, and start bouncing diagonally across the road. I physically couldn't have jogged any slower. I was in this relaxed, zen-like state. I was in no hurry to get home, but had this urge to get closer to this family walking ahead of me. They were like a magnet, drawing me closer. I was jogging straight towards them. I got to around 30 meters behind them, in the middle of the road now, still not a car in sight, and decided I'd speed up a bit. Not much. I was still bouncing, but with just a little pinch more effort. They were almost at the top of the hill at this point, and I was maybe two-thirds of the way up. Suddenly, for no reason whatsoever, the toddler, a little girl, decides to dance straight into the middle of the road. Her mother, in an obvious panic, screamed at the girl to get out of the road, which instead caused the girl to panic herself, freeze to the spot, and start crying. The mother, still holding the buggy, had also frozen in panic and stood screaming. That's when I heard the engine. At the top of Court Hill Road is a right turn that leads to Hither Green Lane. Both sides of the road have trees and brick walls lining them, so it's impossible to see around the corner, no matter which direction you're heading. Vehicles often drive far too quickly when coming down the hill, and usually exit the corner at the top end of second gear around 30 miles per hour. I could hear a vehicle coming, a diesel engine by the sounds of it. It was revving hard, and the girl wasn't moving. I didn't speed up. I just kept bouncing straight up the middle of the road towards the girl at the same pace, totally zen, totally relaxed, almost too relaxed. My mind was clear. She was facing uphill and had no idea I was coming. The mother also had no idea I was there. I got to around 10 meters behind them when the white van came flying around the corner. In five seconds time, the van would be where I was currently standing, 10 meters behind this girl, and it wasn't slowing down. The girl was frozen in panic. The mother was frozen in panic. It was time to be a hero. I got to the girl and slipped one hand under each of her armpits. I look up and see the van is two seconds away, if that. I lifted her a foot off the ground, turned right, and took a step towards the pavement. I was still in the road. I knew the van was going to hit me as there was no time, and I thought that if it did, and I was still holding the girl, that she'd end up being dragged backwards along the road with me. So instead of putting her on the ground, I stood, arms out straight, holding her a foot above the pavement, thinking that after the impact had taken me out, gravity would be the stronger of the two forces and would gently pull her down towards the pavement. The van flew past, and luckily I was only clipped on the left shoulder by the wing mirror. It barely touched me. I put the girl down on the pavement, who was now standing silent and totally confused as to how she'd somehow floated the ten feet from the middle of the road to her mother's side, span around to face me, got down on one knee, and said sternly, Hey, look at me. Never go in the road again, do you hear me? At which point she realized what had happened and started crying again. Or maybe I'm just that ugly and my face scared her. The mother, who was still frozen in fear up until this point, now stood staring at me, jaw open, wondering where the hell I'd come from. She snapped out of it and started thanking me. Oh my god, thank you, oh my god. I just smiled, nodded, and walked on. I turned and looked back, and saw the mother rubbing the girl up and down, checking for injuries and hugging her. I laughed. Over the years, I've replayed this event a thousand times in my head. Two seconds, that's all she had left. From the moment I scooped her up, to the moment the van flew past us, was two seconds. If I hadn't got off the train a stop early, she was dead. If I hadn't sped up at the bottom of the hill, she was dead. If I hadn't decided to start jogging for no reason, she was dead. If I hadn't decided to cross the road and head straight towards them, she was dead. If I'd done anything differently that day, 
the world would have lost this beautiful little girl. I often wonder how her life turned out. She's probably a sassy teenager now. I cannot accept that everything that happened leading up to it was a random coincidence. It felt like I was being sucked towards them. Why did I start jogging uphill? Why did I cross over? Why was I so fixated on them? Why did I speed up when I was having such an enjoyable slow walk? Why was I so relaxed that, even when I saw the van meters away from my face, I didn't break out of the slow jog? It's like I just knew I'd get there in time and everything would be okay. The world is weird and I have many questions. Thanks for listening. Merry Christmas. I live in a small city college town where homelessness is a big issue. Down the road from my house at the time, there's a neighborhood Walmart that I always went to. Whenever I would go to this Walmart, I was always looking over my shoulder because of how many homeless people tend to hang out at this particular store and have on occasion followed me in and out of the store. As a woman in general, I'm always on guard, but surrounding the circumstances surrounding this store, I tend to get very paranoid when I'm there. Anyways, in the middle of the day on a weekday, I decided to stop by said Walmart to grab something small. When I pull into this Walmart, I always try to park as close to the front as possible with my driver's side facing the store so people can see me better. This day, I couldn't find a close parking spot. I instead found the closest thing I could find and as soon as I pulled into the parking spot, I had a sinking feeling in my gut. I looked to my left to see two men in a black SUV and the driver staring at me. I looked away for a second, and when I looked back, I saw the guy in the passenger seat staring at me as if the driver had told him to look over. There's no way to perfectly describe this, but the look felt almost like a nod of approval to his friend that made me feel very uneasy. Against my better judgment, I decided to turn my car off and head inside. I figured I was only getting something small, so I'd be in and out, no biggie. I grabbed what I wanted, and when I headed to the self-checkout, there was an issue that would cause me to have to move to a cashier to check me out, and the whole process ended up taking a lot longer than anticipated. While I was waiting on the cashier, I noticed the man that was in the passenger seat was pacing outside the front doors of the Walmart looking in. I immediately felt that my gut was correct from earlier, and that he was waiting for me to head back to my car. I turned my back to him to check out, and when I looked back, I noticed that he walked inside the store. At this point, I thought I was crazy, and that the guy is probably coming inside to get some stuff, and that I'm just paranoid from past experiences at this store. Anyways, as I'm leaving, I remembered a TikTok I saw where someone said they'd interviewed a man who attacked women, and the man gave a few different reasons as to why he wouldn't attack particular women, one of them being that some women were on FaceTime. As I'm leaving the store and headed to my car, I decided to FaceTime my best friend, who I knew would answer the phone. As soon as I'm walking up to my car, she answers, and I look up to see the driver on the passenger side of his vehicle, blocking my way with his back passenger door wide open. My heart immediately dropped, and I asked the man to move out of the way. He looked down at my phone, and then closed the door and moved out of the way. I'm assuming he looked at my phone to see if I was actually on FaceTime with someone. I quickly got into my car and started to drive away. As I was leaving, I saw the man who was in the passenger seat coming around the corner quickly with a grin on his face and nothing in his hands from the store. I know I can be a very paranoid person, especially when it comes to this kind of thing. However, the whole encounter felt odd and didn't add up in a way that I felt could be written off that easily. Does anyone have any thoughts? This happened only a few weeks ago. 
I live close to the Angeles National Forest. There are some trails within walking distance from my home that take you up into those mountains. It was a very foggy evening, and having just received some bad news over the phone, I wanted to clear my mind with a night hike. I set off at around 8 p.m., sad boy music in my earbuds and a camelback with water and supplies. I didn't plan to be out too long, but I was definitely going to be out a while. The hike started off great, and the fog was almost sort of a novelty. Very eerie and calm in a neat sort of way. The only sounds came from water dripping off the plants along the mountainside. Nobody was around, and it felt like I had the mountains to myself. I was hiking without using my flashlight, as it was like driving. High beams of light cut my visibility from about 20 feet to 10 feet. Shining the light would be like facing a wall of whiteness, and it would kill my night vision. After about an hour, things started getting weird. I was maybe two and a half miles up the trail, and the only light came from the glow of the city behind me. It was getting darker the farther I got up and into the mountains. I started smelling. Smells. Synthetic. First, it was perfume for a few seconds. Just a whiff. I couldn't see more than 15 feet or so in front of me at that point, so I was kind of like, huh, kind of odd. The second smell was that of a campfire, which was also odd, as there weren't any campgrounds nearby. I shrugged it off and kept going. I then got a whiff of a plant that brought me back to my childhood, as it reminded me of smelling it during summers when I would play outside with my friends. I wasn't too off-put, but it was indeed a bit strange. A little while later, I noticed a dull flash out of the corner of my eye. It was light coming from a flashlight, but it was above me on the ridge, maybe 50 to 100 foot up. It looked like a glow in the clouds, sort of like how a plane looks flying through a cloud. It would get brighter or dimmer based on direction. To my knowledge, though, there weren't any trails up there. It's really weird. I took my earbuds out and listened. Still silence, except for the light. The light would turn on, sweet turn off, then turn on and shine in a different direction, like someone looking for something. I assume they were having the same visibility problems I was. I had stopped completely and watched as the light would continue to turn on and off and move slowly along the ridge. I kept my earbuds out now, and I was just telling myself it was another hiker. I waited for it to pass above me and kept on. After maybe ten minutes, I heard whistling, sort of like someone calling a dog, but from a distance. I looked back, and while I was unable to orient myself due to the fog, the whistling was coming from the light that I could now see was across the canyon I'd been walking along. In terms of distance, it was probably about a sixth of a mile, just a faint glow through the fog. I watched it for a minute, then kept moving. After maybe another hour and a half, I stopped for some water. The trail had turned from dirt to this sandy, crunchy soil. It had only gotten darker, and I was around 3,200 feet in elevation, so the city lights were not as bright anymore. I noted that my footsteps were the loudest thing out there, which was a bit unsettling. The trail twists and turns along the mountainsides, and there would be these scenic viewpoints at the turns that would give you maybe 50 feet or so to go off the trail and look over the edge into the valley. I was about 4.5 miles out at this time, so I went out to the edge of the closest view to assess if I wanted to keep going or not. I felt great, and although my cell service had been spotty, I was trying to look at sat maps to see what was ahead of me and maybe pick a turnaround point. I was also getting texts now that hadn't been able to deliver since my service was in and out so I wanted to check those too. I'm at the edge of the view, and someone had made a little rock sculpture thing with a weird stick. I took a picture of it. I was just chilling out there for maybe two minutes or so and looking at the sculpture. I can't see the trail because of the fog and darkness, but I know where it is based on direction. Here's where it gets absolutely terrifying. I pull out my phone to check my texts one last time before setting off. And as soon as I look down at my phone, I hear five very fast footsteps from the direction of the trail. 
This was the sound that my feet made because of the soil, and I recognized it immediately. I instantly look in that direction, and they stopped, completely, silence. I scramble to get my flashlight and knife out of my bag versus using my phone light and fists and shined in that direction. A wall of fog and silence. The footsteps were not a gallop or the skittering of an animal. It was the footsteps of something running at me on two legs that stopped on a dime. I could feel the terror rising in my chest as I stood there frozen. I was alone, in the dark up in the mountains, and something was up here with me. I'm getting goosebumps just typing this. I stood there for maybe two minutes with the light facing that direction. The biggest problem was that they came from the direction of the trail that I needed to go to, to get back. I thought, screw this, I'm heading back. I slowly approached the trail and walked through where the sound came from and began to head back down. For maybe the next 20 minutes, every two minutes or so, I would quickly stop and shine the light behind me. I could have sworn maybe two or three times, I heard an extra step in the distance behind me, like something was matching my footfall to remain undetected. I was fast walking now, as the visibility was still too poor to run, and I was worried I'd twist an ankle. I kept my light on the whole time, and had my knife out in my other hand. After maybe 30 minutes or so, I heard something crash through the brush on my right, which was the steep side of the canyon. Again, I cannot see anything because of the fog. I moved to the other side of the trail and kept going. Let me tell you, that was the most determined I've been to make it down a trail. I heard other weird sounds along the way, but I ignored them and kept moving. I will never forget that night. I night hiked one more time on that same trail, but it was clear. I had a headlamp on the whole time, and a much bigger knife on my side. I also ran back down when I reached my turnaround point. This happened in October three years ago while I was solo climbing Huron Peak in Colorado, and every word is true. Before I left on this trip, I got an email telling me that I had a bunch of REI reward points that were about to expire. My kit didn't really need anything, so I cashed them out on a really badass Tonto-style survival knife that I never would have bought full price. I'd been living with my parents all summer to help out with my mom's illness, so I was desperate for a bit of solitude. But I knew the trailhead sites would be crowded even late in the season, because Huron is a popular-ish 14er. My car had terrible ground clearance, so no way in hell I was getting it up the 4x4 road to the trailhead anyway. I found a spot to park my car off to the side before the road gets too rough, and hiked about three-fourths of a mile down what I initially thought was a deer trail. Surprisingly, the trail ended at a prepared campsite next to a beaver pond, leveled dirt, rock fire pit, a few old beer cans. It's almost too perfect. I look around to make sure I'm not in a rancher's backyard or something, but there are no signs of structures visible, and grass was growing in the fire pit. Probably months since someone overnighted here, I figured. Since it was October, it was already sundown and by the time I got my hammock strung up and cooked dinner, it was pitch dark. The whole time I'd been using my new knife for everything, cutting lengths of paracord for the hammock tarp, opening my food. Hell, I was making up excuses to use this thing. I wanted to hit the trail early, so I started getting ready for bed right after dinner. I trek off into the woods a bit to hang my bear bag at a safe distance, but when I get back, my knife is gone. I was positive I'd left it at the edge of the fire pit, but I tear the whole side apart looking for it anyway. About halfway through, I start getting that prickly feeling that I'm not alone and I'm being watched. Finally, exhausted and paranoid, I give up. I announce loud enough for anyone at the perimeter of my lights to hear 
but quiet enough that it's plausible I'm talking to myself. Well, at least I still have the gun. I'm sure it sounded pretty lame and it was a pure bluff. I had no firearms with me whatsoever. I pretended to lie down in my hammock and, after about 20 minutes or so, I hear what sounds like faint footsteps going away from me, down the trail, back to the road. I spent the entire night wide awake, clutching my shitty pocket knife. At first light, I break camp and shove everything in the car. Then I drive the poor thing as far up the 4x4 road as I can. I did not want to have to come back here. It was a beautiful day. I summited ahead of schedule, shared lunch with some friendly fellow hikers, and almost forgot about the whole ordeal. As I walked back to the car, now parked about four to five miles from where I camped, I noticed there was something stuck under the driver's side wiper, like a parking ticket. It was my knife. I often like to go out running in the summer, or whenever the weather is nice. This happened a week before I was supposed to start high school. I thought about going running that day, but I got that idea in the morning, and I run in the evening while the sun is still up, but it isn't as hot as it is in the day, and there isn't a chance for it to get hotter if I don't manage to get back in time like in the morning. Well, of course I forgot my promise to myself, and only remember it around 9pm. Now it's the end of summer, so the sun is already setting sooner than I'm used to. But I go, eh, I'll get back in like an hour or so. It'll be fine. I already have been putting off running, so I don't want to put it off again. I should probably mention that I'm a female, and even though a lot of girls I know change the side of the road they walk on when they see even distinctly drunk-looking guys walking, I was the one calling them scared and was ready to take on the first rogue who tried to get me. I also live in a less populated area out of town, where almost everyone knows everyone, so I was feeling extra sure of my safety. What a naive fool, I know. So, I go out. I start my run and it's fine. It's getting a bit dark, but I can still see the running track, so it's all good. I start to feel a bit off when I see a pair walking in front of me. When I get closer, they turn out to be just teen guys, and I run past them with no problem. When I finally reach the usual point in my run where I turn around, at a cemetery, it has gotten pretty dark out. I drink some water from my bottle, and just stand there under a tree next to the gate in the territory of the cemetery. But I don't sit down where I usually do, because the bench is next to a fence, and the darkness has finally made me a little weary about being alone and having someone jumping me. It's pretty funny that that's what scared me the most at the time. When I catch my breath, I stay for a few more minutes just listening to the wind. I see a bike drive past the cemetery, taking the route I will take while running back. I leave my resting place and it's gotten really dark, dark enough that I could barely see two meters in front of me. I start slowly running back. After about 15 meters or so, I start hearing voices. A couple more meters, and I can clearly hear someone talking. My thoughts immediately jump to a conclusion that there are at least two people in front of me if I'm hearing a conversation. Now I slow down even more until I get close enough to actually hear what's being said. Keep in mind it's completely dark and this rogue doesn't have street lights so I can't see anything. I get close enough to finally make out the words, and my heart sinks at what I hear. I can't recall the exact words that were said, but I did hear. I see this girl. I could just pull her into the bushes. There were tall bushes lining one side of the running track. As I said, at first, my heart stops but immediately after I go into fight or flight mode, I can hear my heart beating in my ears and I'm full of adrenaline, the bad kind. I know I can't just stop or he will know I heard what he said, so I continue to walk, 
but thank God that the running track is separated from the road by a small grass field, so I go to the side of the road, making some distance between us. I keep looking at him. Keep in mind, I still don't even know how many people are there, but I see a square of light, presumably a phone, and then I hear him jump on his bicycle and drive off. It turned out he was talking on the phone, but just because he wasn't alone didn't mean I was less scared of him. I walk on the side of the road for a good few minutes until I'm sure he would be far away from me, and once I get back on the running track, I sprint home like crazy. All the way back, I was shaking with fear and looking at the bushes and the cars that passed me with delirium, squishing my water bottle in my hand, ready to smack anyone who came close to me. When I finally reached the first road lights, I felt like I escaped death. At the time I was 21, I lived in a larger small city in the Midwest. At the time I had no car, a bicycle, and hardly enough money for the public buses. I worked at a retail battery, lighting, and repair store. I worked full time and only lived a little over a mile from my job. Since I was a female in a male dominated field, I was often used to targeted abuse from men that thought they knew better. Many times I stood my ground and flaunted my knowledge in subjects that these men couldn't grasp. Because of my willingness to learn and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, mostly by myself. This time I wasn't the person closing and had a co-worker, Joey, who came in for a part-time shift after he wrapped up classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other and stood in when we were flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. Joey received a phone call for a possible repair on a smartphone, and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair. He asked the young female caller to stop by for a consult. She had quickly agreed and said that she would stop by at around 5.30pm. This was a night that I was supposed to get done at 6pm and catch the bus at 612 it was a windy, drizzly early fall night. I remember this because I had my bike with me and it became my anchor that night. A little before 6pm, this frantic, terrified, bawling, 19 to 20 something year old woman came into our tiny shop. I was at the counter switching out aging price tags and general store maintenance. I looked up at her confused and willing to help. She looked me deep in the eyes, asking if Joey was there. At the time, he was in our tiny bathroom in the back, so I had to step in and help out any customers. I told her that he was currently busy and that I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed, cheap phone very timidly. My customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend had gotten angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the backing off of the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair. No results found. I tried to hand her back the destroyed phone and she pushed it back in my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking commenced. There was this light drizzle outside so our front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over. I couldn't see who was honking out there. I told her again that I couldn't help and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks, and I was freaked out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her, and the honking would not stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point. I myself was in a domestic abuse situation at the time, and I knew what this girl was experiencing. I broke my locked stare at her and tried to look in our system a second time for a replacement screen nothing again. I looked up from our computer and saw a shadowy figure of a young man pacing in front of the store. I was just happy that the honking stopped, but I was increasingly shooken up. My whole body vibrated with fear, and I whispered across the counter if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter and said that I couldn't do that, 
She begged me not to. At this point, Joey came out from the back. He asked what all the honking was from. We had a lot of elderly, farmers, lazy, and disabled customers that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars. He thought it was one of those situations, but with the looks on our faces, he knew something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. Joey took the girl's phone from my hands and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee only doors. I did what I was told and grabbed my bag, my bike, and my jacket. I looked at the clock in the back and it read 6.14. I spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle non-conforming, short but stocky Asian guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond either of two ways, like a doormat or ready to stand my ground. I knew that I couldn't fight a customer, and neither could Joey, not because of physical reasons. We'd lose our jobs and had no idea what to do. The young guy threw the door open, and the wind kept it that way. He had this manic, hateful look about him. He was a total predator. He was slim but muscular, early to mid-twenties, and was soaked by the rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and took the girl in tow. He hurled insults at us, and I gave the girl a pitied look. He slammed the door shut, and both Joey and I stood in absolute silence. Joey snapped out of it and ran to the front door and locked it. I told Joey to call our manager from our store landline, and I stood around while he did. I noticed that the guy had moved his truck to directly in front of our door. He was watching us from his truck, watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave to get home. The last possible bus came at 6.42, and I couldn't pedal my way home in the weather and because of all the circumstances that had just occurred. The time was around 6.18, and I just needed to cross the busy highway and down the sidewalk by an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy, and I played the waiting game. It was 6.23 when the dickhead finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 6.25 so I could arrive at the stop safely. Joey opened the front door and I threw myself on top of my bike and pedaled harder than I could ever imagine. Now, mind you, our store was in an industrial shopping area at the very edge of town. We worked next to a sub shop and worked across from a strip mall with a bullseye store and a local chain grocery store with other retail stores and a bank all in that large lot. It started to downpour, and as I tried to pull out of our parking lot, straddling my bicycle, I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop. The highway had dual lanes each way, and I had to play real-life Frogger if I wanted to make it to my destination in one piece. There were a few cars that slowed down for me as I hauled ass to the other side of the road. I jumped off my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off. My front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip and my right foot had slipped off of the pedal. My shin had struck the pedal and I had to act quickly. I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck pulled into the bank parking lot of which I just passed. The truck pulled around and went out through the entrance across from the sub shop and took the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping center. There were three ways to get into that parking lot, one to the left, one in the center, and the other far to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalks since it felt safer and was in front of people. The truck patrolled the parking lot, the hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and cornered, just like an injured animal. There were a couple of cars that pulled into the left entrance of the parking lot, causing the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the shitty small bus stop, and I felt my phone buzz. I saw that it read Joey, so I rested my bike on my person to answer the call. 
Joey told me that he was watching, and even though he had an elderly couple in the store that he was helping, that he wouldn't allow the guy to hurt me. I started to cry. All of this had just gotten to me. The red truck looped around once again, and again. I saw the bus pull up early at 6.39, and I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver since I used the buses to get around town, errand, shopping, and to get to and from work. I had my stupid fucking bike to worry about. I hung up the phone with Joey, putting my phone in my jacket pocket, and strapped down my bike in the rack that was in front of the bus. I struggled since I was shaking and my bike was slick from the rain. I got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors. I saw that the truck took a left at the center entrance of the lot. I could finally let my guard down. I sat at the front of the bus and my hands shook as I was trying to get the dollar fifty for the fare. The driver said that it was okay and that I could take my time with the change. I kept my backpack on and pulled my damp phone from my pocket, dialing Joey's number, letting him know that I was fine. In under 15 minutes, I made it to my apartment safe, but deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. All of this planted the idea in me to leave my own domestic abuse situation. A few months later, when the pandemic took the world by storm. To this day, I wonder about that girl. I hope that somebody more daring and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser, that she had the strength to leave that violent man, for her to write her own story and to recover from all of it. I'm currently doing significantly better in life and finally have my own car, and I live a couple of states away safely from my past life. So, even though it's been three years now, to that violent, abusive man, let's not meet again. So I've been a huge fan of this and other similar Reddit pages for years now, and finally have a fitting story of my own. For a quick bit of backstory, myself, my brother, and disabled mother all lived together in a trailer about 30 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee. I was wary of moving there at first for the stereotypes you may hear about trailer parks, but luckily we've had zero issues in the 10 years we've been here. Very nice neighbors, well-kept yards, and everything else. Okay, story time. So about a week ago, we were finally putting up our Christmas tree, drinking probably too much beer, listening to Christmas music, Christmas spirit in full swing. During our random banter, my brother says, Oh yeah, I can't believe I forgot to tell you. Earlier today at work, the owner had to kick out some guy who was acting really creepy. My brother works as the stalker at a family-owned little market about a mile from our home. He went on to tell me this younger looking guy was pacing the aisles, sometimes standing still for minutes at a time, and not responding when the owner would ask if he needed help finding something. After about 20 minutes of this, the owner asked him to please leave because he was scaring the customers, and without a word, he left. We continue with our good time, hanging ornaments, drinking, getting our mom involved, and all is good. We wrap up around 10.30pm, help our mom to bed, and decide we might as well finish off the ton of beer we have left and admire our decked out tree. Around 11.30, we decide to go out on the front porch to share a cigarette, as we usually do when we've tied on a good buzz. My brother opens the door and almost immediately closes it. I ask what's up, and he says, Holy shit, the guy I was telling you about just like Michael Myers, walked down the street past our house. I thought that was pretty strange, but wasn't really concerned. We waited for a few minutes, then went and smoked as usual, and went back inside. My brother and I aren't troublemakers at all, but I am pretty confident in our ability to defend ourselves if we had to. At this point, these are just thoughts in the back of my mind, though after all, I hadn't even seen this guy. Yet. Fast forward to about 2am, we are more than drunk enough to go ahead and call it a night after one more cigarette. My brother opens the door and within seconds I hear him say, whoa, 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 hey man, 
You good? Hey, buddy. What's up? You good? I'm in the kitchen at the time, but quickly decide this doesn't sound right and rush over to the door. What I see when I get to the open door is a younger man standing on our deck about three feet from our front door. He's pretty tall, about six foot four, and another thing I notice is that he looks a lot like Adam Driver, which was a detail my brother jokingly mentioned earlier during tree time. So I'm realizing for the first time, this must be the guy he's been talking about. One thing my brother must not got close enough to notice at work though, was this guy's eyes. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've never seen anything like it. His body language wasn't super menacing, but his eyes were the strangest combination of wide-eyed bewilderment and fury. Like us opening our front door confused him and also made him very, very angry. I joined my brother in explaining to him that it's late and he should head home. After what I'd say was about 30 seconds of staring, he just walked off without a word. I peeked out of our blinds to make sure he really left and saw nothing. We both tried to laugh it off and were saying things like, well, that was pretty weird, huh? But it took a while for my adrenaline to taper off. The thing I kept thinking to myself that bothered me was those 30 seconds to me felt like he was the one deciding what the next move would be. But what that could have been I have no idea. I also didn't love that my brother said when he opened the door, he was already standing there. So, for how long? We calmed down by watching YouTube videos, and after another 30 minutes or so, I say to my brother, Okay man, let's just go to bed. I'll take one more look outside to be safe, but felt like it wasn't really necessary. I open the door, and he's back. The street lights are spaced very far apart in our trailer park, but at the edge of our driveway, there I see his silhouette, probably 50 feet away, just staring at our front door. I feel I should mention he's not there texting or on the phone with someone, he's just there. I feel bad in hindsight because I'm sure this poor guy definitely has mental health issues, but between being drunk and exhausted and the look he gave us earlier, I was over it. I finally put some bass in my voice and said, Hey man, you can't just stand in our driveway. You're being creepy, dude. Just please leave. I really don't want to call the cops on you, so don't make me. This seemed to work. His demeanor didn't change at all, but the word cops seemed to do the trick. He turned around and walked away. I hope we handed it well. I understand and empathize with people with mental health problems and have friends and family who unfortunately suffer from those things. However, I still can't shake the feeling that something bad could have happened that night. He didn't finally leave our porch earlier that night until I showed up to the door, essentially making him outnumbered. And even then, he still came back. I hope he's okay out there. We haven't seen him since. I also hope not calling the police wasn't a bad choice and that he isn't out there with bad intentions on somebody else's front deck at 2am who lives alone or is elderly. I wish I could have figured out what that was all about, but during every interaction my brother and I had with him that day and night, he never spoke a word. That's pretty fucking creepy. My unit in the US Army was deployed to Iraq in April of 2006. We were in Ramadi. It was 123 kilometers out of Baghdad. I was in a Humvee headed to Baghdad for emergency leave due to a death in my family. It was close to midnight. The Humvee I was in had three others and a turret gunner. There were two other Humvees too, with a total of five people in as well. One in front and one in the back. I was without a weapon due to my leave. Suddenly, the Humvee in front stopped hard. We all figured it was a possible IED or VB IED. The team leader in our Humvee radioed to the lead Humvee. The conversation went along these lines. What's up? Why did you stop? 
Something flew in front of the Humvee. What? Flew in front of the Humvee. Yes. We didn't see anything. And the third Humvee piped in. Does anyone hear that helicopter? Yes. Yes, but I don't see it. Did the other two vehicles? Just then, in the desert off the highway, was a black figure that looked like a huge bird. It looked like smoke was emitting from it. A blackish-greenish smoke with a bit of blue tinge. We all focused our eyes. The two troops with better night vision could see something, but they couldn't make out what it was. The smoke was distorting the view. Within a second or two, a rock was thrown at one of the Humvees. A big rock, like the size of a head. We all froze. Due to rules of engagement, we couldn't just light it up. We used a spotlight, and in that light, something just flew straight up, and it was loud. And then we heard a loud screeching noise. Within a minute, it was over. We all sat there in a state of shock, curiosity, and panic. What the fuck was that? When we got to Baghdad, the translator that they were picking up to bring to the marines that was with us said, Sounds like you encountered an Ifrit. A team leader said, A what? An Ifrit. A winged djinn. He responded. We were all a bit speechless. We chose not to disclose this winged thing to our command. Instead, we reported it as battle fatigue, now known as PTSD. If we had told them, we knew it would have been a career killer. It's been 13 years since this happened. I met my now husband in 2015, and he had also been deployed to Ramadi with my sister unit at the time, and he had gone through this particular stretch of highway on his mid-deployment leave. He recounted a similar story to me. It was enough to stop me in my tracks. Considering the time we were there was very deadly, including an aid station manned by soldiers that was ambushed and blown to bits. I was a medic, so death was my norm. I still can't wrap my mind around it. And now apparently, the last two places I've lived in, something has followed us. A few days ago, I came home from work and spent some time playing with my kids in the front yard. I live in a typical suburb with very little crime. At about 8.45pm, it was pretty dark and it was time for them to go to bed. So we started collecting frisbees, balls, and toys. At some point, my daughter entered the garage and I went after her. My son, who was 11 years old, remained outside on the driveway by the sidewalk. It must have been 10 to 15 seconds that he was out of my sight when a dark car appeared out of nowhere and stopped right by my mailbox, just feet away from my son. I was distracted in the garage and had not seen this. I came out of the garage and when the driver saw me, he accelerated and took off at a high speed. It was all very quick. Why would he stop when he saw my son alone? and then escape when he saw me. Was he just lost, or was he trying to snatch a kid? I don't want to be paranoid, but TV is full of true crime shows with people saying, this has never happened before in our town. My now husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive, apartment complex in a sort of nice part of town. We're on the third floor with a large balcony that looks out onto the courtyard in which other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, you can see the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants and the open stairwells. A year went by without a hitch. My husband works at a bar so he comes home late while I usually make it home at around 5 p.m. It's easy to get to any apartment doorway, as the complex is large and open with no security doors except the door to the apartment. It started in August 2016. I would be home after work, chilling and watching TV almost always around 9.30. I could hear someone come up the stairs. Things would be quiet, and all of a sudden, 
loud sharp knocks on my door. I didn't move because it was startling, but eventually I went to go look at the peephole. There stood three people, all with black hoodies on, all seemingly staring at the peephole like they could see me. I did not answer the door, and after a while, they left. Cue a few weeks later. It's the same time, but this incident, footsteps and then loud hard bangs on the door that sent my cat flying to hide. I sat, frozen, but said to myself, maybe it's the police. I made it to the people once again, this time staring out at one person, a dark hoodie, male, white, and very, very gaunt, with huge black eyes. Again, I did not answer the door and grabbed a kitchen knife that I kept by my side until my husband came home. This continued for weeks, and once when my husband was home, he proceeded to look through the peephole, saw the same man, and screamed for him to leave, and he did. We called maintenance and the police, who both stated that they would do regular patrols, but there was nothing else they could do, and suggested cameras. Everything stopped for a while, maybe six months, during the winter, which helped me be at ease, because when all of this was happening, I was having a very hard time sleeping, and stopped going out at night. However, I assume the same man started up again, except this time, the same large bangs on the door would happen, but when I would look out of the peephole, no one was there. I then became horrified as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door, like someone was standing and waiting. Again, I reported it. Security stepped up in the area, but I still did not feel safe. I was hoping it would just stop as I felt tortured in my own home, but as I realized two weeks ago, things could be much worse. At night to go to bed, I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant glass sliding door that led out to our balcony. It was late at night, the lights were off in the apartment. As I walk by, I glance over and across the courtyard. I see the same man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way from the second to third floor, staring right at my balcony just standing there, unmoved, facing in the direction of me. The same man who was at my door. I went numb, heart racing, chilled to the bone. I knew he couldn't have seen me because the lights were off and the stairway had lights of its own, but I was still scared shitless. I called my husband who rushed over, but the man had left. More reports to the front office more promised security patrols. This same creepy dead-eyed man in the black hoodie continued to stand at the stairway landing, staring at my apartment. It has now been two weeks, and he does this every Friday. I am horrified and have been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and strangling me in my sleep. So, creepy black-eyed man, please, let's not ever meet. Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga, had a beautiful girlfriend, the works. He seemed very balanced and healthy. His name was Andrew. We had another longtime co-worker who was sort of Mr. Popular with managers, but honestly, really annoying. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, his name was Brad. Now, before I explain, I should include that this workplace sucks. It barely holds a single star on Indeed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly a year into Andrew's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friendly to one another, 
We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things, but something was really out of place when he mentioned his new beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him, who was really rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's trolling. Fast forward a few weeks. Andrew has seemingly took a lot of interest in co-worker Brad and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in a more endearing way, kind of copying his silly dances and laughing. It seemed harmless, but as months go past, he continued to dance more and more, to the point he had to be asked to stop by supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings, using all the same mannerisms and phrases as Brad. This really started to creep out Brad, to the point he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but Andrew was very vocal against all substance use, including alcohol and weed and such. He was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when Brad ends up getting with a new hire at work. She ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together and such. This is when Andrew shows up to work using Brad's name, even signing himself in on the logbook as him, referring to himself as Brad all morning. Then, later that day, Andrew stands up on a work table, screaming that he's in love with Brad's girlfriend, his arms spread out in a cross Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place was silent, and after, he ended up standing in a corner with a broom sweeping nothing for the next several hours. He would not turn around from the corner, not even when tapped on the shoulder or called by name. The only time I saw him away from that corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last in the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him. He was looking directly at me, head tilted down, making a pseudo snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided Andrew needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him in an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guards who I was friends with told me Andrew kept showing up in the middle of the night trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 to 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, Andrew comes back and seems somewhat normal, almost like he has no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be, but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wacky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with Andrew, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me, go for a hike and throw axes at trees and stuff like that. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I'd get back to him on that, as I was secretly a bit on edge. He asked me later in the day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations and he said, well I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then and I laughed, not knowing how to react at all. I told the manager about that, and he kind of just scratched his head uncomfortably and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, Andrew ends up finding Brad's address due to a work get-together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to Andrew. They eventually find rocks and sticks and weird formations on their doorstep, like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was Andrew. Things got really weird when they actually found Andrew looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out Brad's name, repeatedly whispering, Brad, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire Andrew. Four years later, Andrew still stalks Brad's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends a message to each one of us as well, saying, Hey, it's Brad from work. 
So I guess my question is what would this behavior be called? And how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would your diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he doesn't seem to, but he sure remembers Brad's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one and the only one. I'm the bigger one, she's the smaller one, is a quote. He said that he was put on this earth to essentially save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from family or anything and is working a new job, living alone unattended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. Anyway, I'm interested in some of your feedback in what he might be dealing with. Hello, I'm Evie. I wanted to tell my story because it was absolutely terrifying at the time. It all started the morning of February 14th, 2018. I was in middle school and the campus was buzzing with life. Guys were running around with gifts for their girlfriends. Girlfriends gave gifts to their boyfriends. Friends exchanged candies. All in all, everything seemed normal. I wasn't popular per se, but I knew everyone and everyone knew me. But I preferred to hang around with a small group of close friends because being around too many people made me anxious. During lunch, I was hanging around my usual group of friends, which consisted of two girls, Alex and Mia, and three guys, Nico, Adrian, and Elijah. Valentine's Day of all days made me even more anxious because a lot of people would join our group because of my friend Adrian. He attracted a lot of girls, and my friend Mia was such a sweetheart, and a lot of guys wanted to date her. I began to feel overwhelmed so I slipped out of my group and headed to a secret hiding place, which was just a bench that was way out in the field, sort of hidden by some trees. No one really went there, so it was a good place to catch my breath. As I was reading my book, I hear someone getting closer. I look up and see this guy, Emmanuel. When I saw Emmanuel, I instantly started to freak out because he always seemed to have this sort of infatuation with me. Every day, he would force himself on me, randomly hugging me, trying to kiss me, telling me he liked me. And believe it or not, I would often see him around my neighborhood. I decided to play it cool and continued reading, when he suddenly just grabs my book out of my hands. Hey, what the hell, man? I yelled, and he simply responded with, Sorry. I just wanted your attention. I was still angry, but I tried to calm myself down. What do you want? I said. I really like you, and I want you to be my girlfriend. I swear, I'll treat you like a queen. After he said that, he handed me a box of chocolates and a cute stuffed bear. I thought it was a nice gesture, but I really felt uncomfortable whenever he was around. So I told him that even though it was sweet of him, I was already in a relationship, which obviously wasn't true. When the words left my mouth, he turned from being nice and calm to angry. He yelled at me, saying how dare I date someone that wasn't him. I tried to get up to leave, but he tightly grabbed my arm and forcefully kissed me. I tried pushing him off, but he was stronger than me. So I yelled for help at the top of my lungs and he quickly covered my mouth. So I bit his hand and kicked him in the balls. While he was shocked, I broke free and ran to my friend group. He yelled behind me, saying how he would assault me and then kill me. Obviously the duty guards heard this and immediately took action. But I just wanted to get to the safety of my group. So I kept running until I bumped into Adrian. I hugged him and cried my eyes out. He comforted me until I was ready to talk. I told him everything, and then I was suddenly called into the principal's office. They wanted to know everything that had happened, and the police were called. 
It was a long day, and I just wanted to go home. After I told them what happened, I was allowed to leave for home early. I later found out that in his house, there was a shrine built for me, with pictures of me doing various things, walking with my dog, eating in my living room with my family, even of me changing. It was horrible and traumatizing. This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy gated community in Orange County, California. It's called Kodo de Katza. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it typically is domestic violence within a household. I'm now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. I always questioned this policy, asking, what's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key, and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. Anyways, one night, one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m. after having fallen asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door, thinking it's my sister or me needing help. He opens the door without looking through the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is his house and not the kid's. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with a very frustrated and angry kid to no avail, and it's escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this house isn't his, and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now, let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work and such. He's actually still much stronger than me, as evident whenever we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, the kid, in a fit of rage, decides to barge his way into the house, and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid, and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and are terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he's pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decide to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid is able to break in. My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next. She described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard banging on one of the back doors and they have to taste the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts, he got confused on what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but 
but my parents said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows, in a gated community, was quite upsetting to them. The psychological aftereffects of this ordeal are pretty apparent as they're coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive, high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but they just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting. Hey everyone. This took place in the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down this story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So, every summer in my city, my friends and I like to make small campfires in chill, secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fees to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hang to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about though are bears because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m. I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get there. The spot I get to has a two minute paved walkway I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway are two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge slash the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit and whatever else. I get to the spot, and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during hot summers. So I set up the chair, and I get to digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two hand sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water and I don't see anything. I kind of brush it off thinking I'm just hearing things but as I keep shoveling a bit more I hear another loud splash. At this point, I'm thinking something is falling from above because logically something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above where some trees are above the river and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out, Hello? no response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately, but there was no bear or signs of anything for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies before, and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So I shine my flashlight over to the area again. And as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly, of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. 
From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-forties, shaved, not bald, and mediumish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my stuff and get the hell out of there, because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me and briskly walk up to the small ramp, and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest, and I'm frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in my crocs, mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd not regret being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point, and a sense of relief starts setting in, knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours, as if he was a primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet and positions his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man starts running towards me. I book it. I run as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it. But I didn't care because a whole naked ass man was chasing me at 11 at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest, and I run to my car, which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get into my car, and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my car. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead, but I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock the doors, and throw my things into my back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, it most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I'm fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was still coming. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me. I zoom out of the area as fast as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends, calling me to ask me if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because, again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story the way I just told it now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that, and I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with it hanging out. But as we're just talking out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful. There's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds, saying, Oh, damn, really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. All I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said they would make note of it anyways, in case it happens again. Some of my friends say it's a skinwalker, others say more realistically it's either a homeless, mentally ill, or a drunk slash high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on my past version because honestly, 
If time travel is real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So that is the only crazy let's not meet story I have. But damn, is it a story I will never forget. This is the story of a co-worker I had a long time ago, so I can look back on it and laugh now, but at the time, it was really distressing for me. To give some context, every summer I would do some temp work for the company where my dad worked. It was an education company, so they always needed temp workers around July and August time for all of the exam remarks that they had come in. It was data entry work, but it suited me fine and it meant I could earn a little extra cash while I was at university. I did this every summer from when I was about 19 right through to when I was 23, and then I got another job at the same company for a bit after I graduated, but we'll get onto that later. For now, all you need to know is that I was a reasonably familiar face there, and everyone knew I was my dad's daughter. The main downside of working there was that I'd clock off work at 5 p.m., but I'd have to wait for my dad to finish work since he was the head of an entire department, so he'd end up staying there a bit later. Every day, I'd bring a book with me and sit in this little foyer area between his department and the department where I worked since it had the most comfortable chairs. I must have been 22 years old when this happened because it was the penultimate summer that I worked there. I had just had my hair cut short for the first time in my life, and I dyed it red as well. I was sitting on these couches, reading, when all of a sudden, this guy approaches me. He tells me that he works in my dad's department, and he thought he'd come introduce himself. His name is Leon. This was a pretty common occurrence for me, and I was aware of this guy. He was young and decent looking, so a few of the women in my department had a crush on him. I was dating someone at the time, though and I'd never actually seen him in person, but I could see what they saw in him. We got to chatting, and he mentioned that I'd changed my hair, so I told him about cutting it short, and he cut me off mid-sentence. This is where it started to get weird. He said, No, first it was brown, and you didn't have a fringe. Then you went through a phase of curling it. Then you put the fringe in and dyed it red. After that, you dyed it purple. Now you've had it cut short and dyed it back to red. This guy I had just met was describing over two years worth of hairstyle changes that I'd had. I felt creeped out, but he seemed like a nice enough guy, and I guess I'd worked there at the company throughout the entire time, so it was reasonable to assume that he'd noticed me before. That should have been the first red flag. He asked me if I had Facebook, and I told him that I did so he said he would add me. That seemed pretty normal, but then, after he sent me the friend request, he asked me to get my phone out so he could watch me accept the friend request. I'm British, and it's therefore impossible for me to be impolite, so I got out my phone and showed him that I had accepted it. I thought that might calm him down, but bear in mind, he wasn't a bad-looking guy, so I felt a bit flattered at this point that he was so keen on me. That sense of flattery dissolved real fast. After the Facebook thing, he kept asking me if I had MSN, and I told him that I didn't. I swear, throughout this conversation, he asked me if I had MSN about four times. Then, the final time he asked, he was like, Please can you get MSN so we can chat after work? It was like he had something really urgent he wanted to tell me. But I had only just met this person. I kind of laughed and said about how I hadn't used MSN since I was a teenager, without necessarily rejecting him. Then he said something like, Well, if you don't have MSN, then do you have Skype? This seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring up my boyfriend, who was a foreign student and went back to his home country during the summer. He was the only person I spoke to on Skype. I said to Leon about how I didn't have my own Skype account, but I used my dad's Skype account to talk to my boyfriend. I really thought this might ward him off. I was wrong. Without missing a beat, he said, Can you please just get your own Skype account so we can video chat after work? He said it like I was somehow inconveniencing him. 
like this was something we'd agreed to months ago or something. I had no idea how to react, so I just sort of smiled and laughed. Thank the heavens someone from my dad's department walked past at that moment and was like, Leon, aren't you meant to be at your desk? He scurried off pretty quickly after that, but not before reminding me to get my own Skype account and send him the details. I told my dad about the whole exchange in the car ride home, but all he said was that Leon was very friendly and that a lot of women in his department liked him, so maybe I had just misunderstood the situation. I thought he was probably right, so I tried not to let it bother me. Later that evening, however, I was on my computer doing university work when a message popped up on my Facebook. It was Leon. All the message said was, we like the same movies. I don't know what it was, but something about this message freaked me out so much. I decided not to respond and logged off of Facebook, hoping that he wouldn't notice I'd been online. The next day after work, I was sat in my usual spot when Leon comes over to me. His face was like thunder. At first, I thought he was just having a bad day and was walking through the hallway, but my heart dropped when I realized he was walking directly towards me. Why didn't you respond to my Facebook message? I was stunned. How was I supposed to respond to that? Who says stuff like that in real life? Lucky for me, I didn't have an opportunity to respond because he started off on this tirade. I'm not even kidding. He started listing all of the movies we had in common that he'd seen on my Facebook profile. Batman The Dark Knight, Watchmen, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, Fight Club. I just sat there watching him reel off all these film titles. Once he was finished, all he said was, It's okay, I forgive you, and then walked off back to his department. Over the next couple of weeks, he came and found me in my spot every day and talked at me from the moment I sat down to the moment my dad came to get me. I don't remember many of the other exchanges, but I do remember distinctly one day pretending to pick my nose when I saw him coming to see if it would put him off. It didn't. It got to the point where I'd get so stressed out after work that I'd go and hide in the toilets for as long as I could. But the women I worked with started to notice and think that I was weird. Eventually, I broached the subject with my dad and he gave me his car keys after my shift so that I could go hide out in his car rather than in the building. So I'm camped out in his car and I'm still feeling quite tense, but... After about 20 minutes, I start to feel at ease. Surely he won't come looking for me out here. Wrong. I look over at the main entrance, and my heart drops. He's coming out of the door, and he's scrutinizing all of the cars. I sank down as far as possible into my seat, but I wasn't fast enough, and he saw me. He comes rushing towards me and starts tapping on the glass so I open the door and ask him what's up. I didn't see you in your usual spot, but luckily the doorman Chris told me he saw you come out here. Why are you in your dad's car? Again, what are you supposed to say to that? I told him I had a headache, so I'd come out to the car to take some paracetamol and see if I could get some sleep. At least he respected that, because he told me to feel better and then left me alone. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that I was only going to be working there for a few more days before I had to go back to university. I told my dad about the car incident, and he gave Leon a talking to the next day. Leon would still come find me in the foyer, but he'd only talk to me for a few minutes in passing before leaving me alone. It was a big relief. On my last day at work there, I was fully expecting him to do something crazy, but he didn't even come to chat with me that day. I left the office and thought I would never see him again. I found out he was fired not long after I left the company that year because he kept coming into work late and then spent most of his time at work chatting with his co-workers and me, apparently. Fast forward to January of 2014 and I was preparing to move to China for a position teaching English. I had graduated from university 
and I was working at the same company, but this time in a semi-permanent capacity. It was my last day at work, so I received quite a few gifts and some fuss from my co-workers. It was about 10 a.m. when who should I see walk through the door but Leon. He had been hired as a temp to do the job that I'd done for so many years. As soon as he walked through the door, he saw me and this flash of recognition crossed his face. I wanted to slide under my desk and die. He came walking over to me and was all smiles, asking about how I was and what I was still doing at the company. It was at this point that one of my co-workers mentioned about how I was off to China soon. Leon seized on that and started talking about his friend who was also interested in Teffel. His interest seemed genuine so I got to talking about how I got my TEFL qualification, who I got it through, what company I was going to be working for out in China, and other stuff. We chatted for about 20 minutes, and he wrote down some details for his friend, then went off to work. At the end of the day, I was packing all of my stuff to leave, and a few of my co-workers were coming over to say their goodbyes. Don't get me wrong, the Leon incident aside, I had a wonderful time working at that company, and I made a lot of great friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Leon approaching, but I think, what's the harm? He says goodbye and wishes me luck on my new adventure. Then, as I'm literally walking out of the door of the department, I hear him call out, see you in China. For the first two weeks of my teacher training over there, I was like a hawk keeping a constant lookout for this guy. He never did follow me out to China, but it still remains as one of the creepiest encounters of my life. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home whether you're there to let them in or not. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I've never gotten used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background, cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things. Well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. My typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes I used the light for my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So, armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. 
I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. And at this point, the dog was scratching on the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within the basement. At least this time, I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time, I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams, unlike anything I'd ever heard. Sounds that I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks, followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic, freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, Hello? Who's in there? There was no response, just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response. Just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again the next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell lay beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown, but there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd nearly given up on solving the mystery when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Laura. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She'd moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask, but before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, The crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all. She'd actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, 
with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, hi, as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got into her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him. I entered the back door like I had so many months before. This time, something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged-looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make sense, but at this point, my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, Meter Reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged. His head was shaved and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants but no shirt. What I remembered most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He became grimacing, and little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out aloud, Aww, in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent, I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple of friends, including Laura, over at my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter, but as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me something she'd seen a couple of weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I'd like to think he got the help he needed. But maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. 
The nonprofit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms, and drinking was not allowed on site, nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact, that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay during the DNC convention of 08 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning, and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank across the city most of the day. By about 1 a.m., we got back to the hotel. The room was typical with two queen beds. Bed number one was close to a big window looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door slash entryway to our room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4 a.m. My wife was laying at the head of bed number two, flipping through the TV. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number one, staring out the window as we talked. As we talked, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I assumed it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by and I thought I heard movement again, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. No, she replied. I thought I heard a door. I said back to her with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said, breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quick. Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out and I wanted to believe I wasn't seeing it. But there was a man dressed in all black with a black baseball cap pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone and hadn't been for a while and he knew we spotted him. Eventually, Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway, and he said, Hey man, is there something we can help you out with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little into the light and made eye contact with Tim and I. We all just stared at each other, and eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No, man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. He stared at us for a while longer, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in a stairwell, but they directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk, and they told him he was not a guest. He was apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then, a while later, they told my wife he disappeared, and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They told her there wasn't even a room 1709 in the hotel. We got three different stories. We still have no idea what that was all about or how he managed to get a key card to our room. We were sure the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life. Always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. We should have sued, but we were young and dumb.
I still feel sick to my stomach, and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. Anyway, here it goes. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in the relative nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods. That's animals with pouches or marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went. Hell, why not? I got my rescue tub, which contains my essentials, and went on my way. The couple that called in the roo were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs liked to play together, and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trust them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no, and that I got this. My area is very safe, and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve, and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic, he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, Definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilograms, more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities, so I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in the tub. I tie it with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching movements, hissing, growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time so I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago before I got sick, and when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right, and it sure is sure. Every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I'm on the balls of my feet. I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy. I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way too big and there was sudden silence, like whatever had made the noise had stopped or was stalking. I decided to just fuck it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it, and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't give a fuck. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground. That was way too big for any animal in my area let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are screaming to run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that. 
even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night, and the next day she came with me to try and find my rescue tub. This morning, another rescuer came to take the sick root to the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it. The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I'll be going out at night for a long, long while. Hi, my name is Anna and a few days ago, Something happened that makes me sick. We moved to an east coast town about a year ago to be closer to family. So close in fact that my aunt, her wife, and my cousins are only a 10 minute walk from my house. Granted, we are very spaced out and borderline rural, despite living about 15 minutes from the outskirts of a big city. I was walking my two little dachshunds back home from my aunt's house. My mom hates it when I'm alone the majority of the day so I spend time at their house, and I was genuinely enjoying my time. It was cold, but quiet and oddly beautiful. I got home, fed my pups and two birds, and FaceTimed a friend. I was talking with them and doing chores, and was admittedly being loud and giggly when taking out the trash to the side of my house. I get back inside and lay down in bed, still chatting, when my bird starts calling at something. Now, anyone who has ever owned a parrot knows that they have distinct noises for certain movements. She's been in my family for 76 years and with me my whole life, so I knew the sound was alarm or intrigue. I brush it off as her seeing herself in the window reflection and go back to talking to my friend. I get up to get water and my back is to the sliding glass door, which is thankfully locked and my friend has the wind knocked out of him. I'm confused and I think he's hurt. He tells me, Anna, go back to your room now. I scoff, but then I see it in my camera view. There is a man with his face and hands pressed up against the glass door. He's a middle-aged white guy in a gray pullover and dark pants and a grin on his face. My friend, ever the best in panicked situation, tells me, don't look at him, just go to your room. I was shaking so hard. I'm blubbering and decide to lock myself and my dogs in my closet. My parrot is still going crazy. English isn't my first language and it's bad when I'm in a panicked state, so I revert back to my native language, which my friend doesn't know. Luckily my friend knows how to take charge and he tells me he'll be over in 10 minutes and he calls the police. I'm thinking I can run to my mom's room and find a gun, so if the guy does come into the house, I can blow a quarter-sized hole in his chest. I'm debating getting up when I hear tapping on my window. It's slow and intentionally creepy. My dog starts barking. I'm ready to accept my death. I'm a teenage girl, home alone, and I'm about to die. Wait, my aunt should be leaving for work. I shoot her a quick text. The tapping stopped and I think it's over when I realize something that makes my heart drop. I left the front door unlocked when I took out the trash. This keeps getting worse and I beg my friend to hurry. The tapping thankfully returns to my window and I can only close my eyes and hope that someone gets here fast. It feels like an eternity crying to another teen who's breaking multiple traffic laws. Never before have I been grateful to hear another man's voice yelling outside of my house at 1 a.m. It was my godsend neighbor. Apparently, his pregnant wife was having bad nausea and went out on the deck, and where it's situated, you can see my whole backyard. She got a bad feeling after seeing the unfamiliar man approach my door and woke her husband to check it out. I thank God every day for her because I think she saved my life. I let my neighbors into my house and my aunt arrives about four minutes later packing major heat. 
my friend not long after her. I go from home alone to an impromptu house party of concerned people. The police arrive like 10 minutes later, like they didn't just take 30 minutes to arrive to the scene. On a brighter side, my bird wasn't too alerted by this encounter and went back to eating not five minutes later. And my dogs were just happy to see people. My friend has been staying the nights with me since. I'm finding it hard to be home alone, despite the fact that an arrest was made. I'm so thankful that my neighbor had such good instincts and that my aunt and friend were so quick on their feet. Because this could have been a lot worse. I'm a girl living in Northern Europe. I won't go into too much detail where this happened because I don't want people to recognize me from this story. This story takes place in October when I had a part-time job in this research center. This was in a bigger city, not like in the middle of nowhere, but it was a 30 minute bus ride from where I lived at the time. Keep in mind that the workplace was in an industrial estate, so the only people that really spent time in the area were the workers from these companies. I worked all three shifts, mornings, evenings, and nights, but I did mostly night shifts because none of my co-workers really wanted them, and I am a night owl anyway, so that 10pm to 6am shift worked well for me. This happened on one of these night shifts. It was a Thursday night, and I was one of the three workers there that night. We did not work together, we all were in our own departments doing different kinds of work all so far from each other in the building. I worked at a chem lab doing water analysis, so it was not any kind of customer service job. We were basically all alone, and it usually got really quiet and rather peaceful. We had no security guards, but it was quite impossible to enter the building without an identification card. All doors were locked, and everyone that worked there had these cards where you hold it in the sensor on the door and it opens. You also got to use the card when leaving the building. These locked doors were not only on the outside, but also inside the building. So if someone somehow managed to get through the first door without the card, they could not get any further into the building. To the labs, for example. The door locks again immediately after you get in or out. Considering that, we never really had to worry about someone uninvited getting in, even during the night time. This particular night, I took a bus and headed to work. I greeted my co-workers that were leaving as their shifts had just ended and met the other night shifters in the women's dressing room. All normal. I was in a good mood and so were my two co-workers. When our shift started, we parted our ways and went to different labs. I was three hours into my shift at 1am when I decided to take my 20 minute break. My other two co-workers had their breaks earlier than mine, so I was alone. Our break room was this lounge where there were a couple of long tables, chairs, a mini kitchen, and a bathroom. I'm not gonna lie, this big hall with old flickering ceiling lights was not my favorite place to be alone at 1am when the whole building is almost empty and it's pitch black outside. There were big windows in the lounge, but I could not see anything out of them. Just darkness. There was always this same eerie vibe at night time, so I was used to it. Five minutes into my break, I decided to go outside to smoke a cigarette. I put a jacket on, took my shit with me, and opened the door with the card. We had this smoking place in the back of the parking lot, about a minute walk from the door. If I said I wasn't scared to be alone in an empty parking lot at night as a young girl, I would be lying. This was the only thing I really did not like about the night shifts, but I really needed that cigarette. Nothing bad had ever happened, and I live in a generally safe country, so I just hoped for the best. There was this nasty white plastic chair in the smoking place. I sat in it and lit my cigarette. From the smoking place, I could see clearly to the entrance of the building. There were bright lights above the door. Usually I just stared at that door without even noticing it. I mean it was at night in an industrial estate, 
and there were not many interesting things to look at. All of a sudden, I noticed a person walking up to the door. It was a man with a trench coat and a top hat, holding a briefcase. I had never seen this man before, in my work or anywhere near this place. This man stood still in front of the door, not moving at all, facing the door. Even though nothing seemingly bad happened yet, just a weird man standing by the door. I cannot even explain in words how scared I was. I had to somehow get past this man to get back inside. He wasn't aware that I was there. He didn't see me. What if he does something to me when I'm trying to get inside? Is he even trying to get inside? What does he want? And who is he? This was the only door where I could enter the building from the outside, so I had no choice but to try and ignore that man at the door and to attempt to get inside. What on earth is this weirdly dressed man doing in this area at 1am? There is clearly something he wants from us, and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to know what that was. I started walking towards the man and the door while he was still standing there, unaware that I'm behind him in the parking lot. The closer I got, the more scared I became. I had to stop and think again. I knew it was part of my job to confront unwanted people trying to get in and tell them how to contact our customer services, but keep in mind this was at 1am. A weird man who appeared out of thin air and an 18 year old girl alone. I had this gut feeling that I should not go to that door. I decided to call my co-worker that was there that night and ask if she could meet me at the door and let me in, so I didn't need to face this man alone. I hid behind my co-worker's car that was in the parking lot to make the call. In the position I was hiding, I could still see this man through the car windows. I wanted to see if he would leave and where he would go. My co-worker answers the call, and when I start whispering on the phone and explaining the situation, I watch in horror as the man turns around and stares right at the car I was hiding behind. I don't think he saw me, but he for sure heard there was a woman talking behind this car. What happened next is straight from a horror film. When this man found out there was someone behind the car, he slowly and quietly approached, not knowing I could see him through the windows. And here's the thing, he did not walk, he did not run. He was on all fours crawling towards the damn car. I couldn't even scream. I just froze from fear and dropped my phone. When this man was getting closer to the car, I could see both of my co-workers opening the door, waving and screaming at me to run and come in. They didn't need to tell me twice. I ran inside so fast that the man didn't even have time to react. When he got up and started running after me, the door was already closed. The second he heard the door lock itself, he turned around and started speed walking away, eventually disappearing into the darkness. We called the police immediately and they arrived not long after. They didn't find anything or anyone. That man vanished as fast as he had appeared and no one has seen him since. After that shift, my co-workers walked me to the bus and waited with me until it arrived, making sure I got home safely. I am forever thankful to these lovely women for opening the door for me before that man got to me and did God knows what. I haven't done any night shifts after that and definitely never will. Three years ago, I was living with my then boyfriend in a one-bedroom apartment in a little mountain town. It was a half-basement unit, so the bottom of all of our windows were level with the ground outside. It was also an older apartment, and not all the windows could fully lock. One day, my boyfriend comes home from work while I'm laying on the sofa and immediately runs up to the window near me and looks out of it frantically. He then goes to look out every other window in the house 
then walks around the outside looking in the windows. When he comes back from this confusing exploit, I ask him what's going on and why he's doing that. I think I just walked up on a guy looking in the window at you. He took off as soon as I walked up, he tells me. This was naturally very unsettling, but after discussing it and considering the time of day and the number of people out and about around the complex at that time, we came to the conclusion that it was just a curious neighbor or someone passing by that happened to glance in. With that, we forgot about it. If only that was the end. For the next couple of months, odd stuff happened here and there. Someone would knock on the door occasionally, then when I went to answer, no one was there. I'd find things in my apartment that I wasn't familiar with, or things like clothing items would vanish. I didn't really think twice about any of it, until one night. My boyfriend and I were arguing at about 1 or 2 in the morning, and we were being a bit loud. We were standing in the kitchen, face to face. His back was to an open window with the blinds up halfway, and I was facing it. Amidst our arguing, I glanced behind him at the window, thinking I saw the reflection of my face in it. The window was open. It wasn't my face. There was a man with his face pressed almost against the window screen, watching us. Given the fact that we were arguing and it was late, I thought for a moment it might have been a concerned neighbor walking up to the window to speak to us, so I spoke to him. Hello, can I help you? I asked a little aggressively, thinking a neighbor was intruding on our privacy. He responded to this by staring, unwavering and cold, right at me. His face did not change expression, he did not blink or move. He just looked right at me in a way I have never been looked at before or since. In this instant, I also realized that because of the window being level with the ground, the only way this man's face could be where it was was if he was laying on the ground outside the apartment or crouched and contorted to look into the window. My heart sank. I buried my face in my boyfriend's chest and closed my eyes in fear. My boyfriend, up to this point, thought I was messing with him. When I buried my face in his chest, only then did he say, Is there really someone at the window? I whispered, yes, to him. He felt my fear and took a moment before he turned around. By the time he did, the man was gone. It was at this point I started to think about all the odd little occurrences that I'd been experiencing. I assumed the worst. I filed a police report with his description and my brother loaded my apartment up with weapons to protect me, or at least inform this peeping Tom that I was armed. After that night, myself, my boyfriend, and my brother were on high alert. There were a couple of times when my brother came over that he saw a sketchy guy hanging around, and even one time he saw him look at my window. He tried to follow him discreetly but the guy took off running as soon as my brother stepped in his direction. The last night I had an experience with this man, I was sitting home alone on my sofa. My boyfriend was at work at a restaurant about two blocks away. He had picked me up from work an hour earlier. We had sat on the sofa together for a little bit when we got home. Then he kissed me and left for work, locking the door behind him. After he left, I continued to sit on the couch on Reddit for a while, in silence. After about an hour of me sitting there in silence, I hear a door creak open. It's a small apartment, so to see the bedroom and bathroom doors from the couch, all I had to do was lean a little to the left. I assumed it was one of my cats coming out of my bedroom, so you can imagine my shock when I lean over and see the door that's opening is the door to the water heater closet. I look to my right and see both of my cats sleeping soundly at the other end of the couch. I look back to the door, and it's still creaking open very slowly. It opens enough for me to see it, a set of fingers wrapped around the door. Easing the door ever so gently to open it as quietly as possible. That was going to be a no-go from me, dog. 
I ran my ass barefooted out the door, into the snow, and down the street to my boyfriend's work. I called the cops. When everyone was back to check out the apartment, he was of course gone. After that, my boyfriend and I packed our shit, went to stay with my parents, and six months later, moved a thousand miles away from that town. That was the end of it. I initially found this sub around that time, as I was trying to find other stories similar to mine or people to talk to who had experienced something like I did. I had intended to write my story here eventually, and I figured after these events, I had to. I live a thousand miles away from where all of this happened, so a part of me thinks there's no way this person could have found me. But last week, I heard a knock on the front door of my apartment. I was expecting a package, so I figured it was a delivery driver and didn't answer. I'd go get the package later. Then they knocked again. And again. The third one made me feel uneasy. So I waited a good 20 minutes to check the door. When I did, there was no package. No note. No nothing. Someone was just knocking. Although it made me uneasy, I didn't initially think back to my stressful experience in my last town. Then, two days ago, I went out to get groceries. I have a little patio, and I go out there in the mornings to just chill or check on plants a lot, and I've been known to leave it unlocked in the day on accident. I never thought of it as a huge deal. Until I came home from the store two days ago, and the deadbolt to my apartment was locked. The deadbolt that can only be locked from the inside of my apartment, period. I assume someone robbed me because I dumbly left my patio unlocked. I called my sister, and I called my new boyfriend. I waited for people to be with me, and I went into my apartment through the sliding glass patio door. Nothing was out of place. Nothing of value was taken. At this point, my heart sank. Nothing was touched. Nothing stolen. Someone was inside of my apartment just because they wanted to be inside of my apartment. I told my boyfriend about my stalker, and he's not taking this shit lightly like my past boyfriend. I filed a police report. We checked for recording devices and cameras. He put nest cameras up all over the place, and we are on high alert. I really, truly hope this is a coincidence. But if this man really followed me across multiple state lines, there's no one on this earth I'm less interested in meeting. This started about six months ago. I was getting ready for bed in my room. It was maybe 10.30 p.m., my curtains were closed, so I couldn't see out of the window, but I heard three hard knocks on the glass. Of course that scared the living shit out of me, so I didn't even look. I ran and got my dad and made him look. Now, I live with my parents and two brothers in a fairly busy neighborhood, so noises weren't uncommon to hear. But this knock was directly on my window, so someone wanted me to hear it. The thing was, my bedroom isn't facing the front of the house or the road or anything. My room's actually towards the back of the house, so someone would have to have walked to the backyard in order to knock on my window, which seemed very odd. I had my dad check, but when he opened the curtains, no one was outside the window. He even went to the backyard to check, and no one was there. That was the first incident. I closed my curtains and brushed it off as me hearing things or some sort of animal. The following night, at almost the exact same time, I heard another three knocks on my window. I immediately went to get my dad again, only for him just to see nothing once again. But this time, I didn't brush it off, and I slept in my parents' room on the floor. The next few nights, there was nothing, until about a week later... I was home alone, and it was about 8.30 to 9.00 p.m., and I was on FaceTime with my friend when I heard another three knocks on my window. This time I was home alone, so I couldn't get my dad, but I ran into their room and called them. 
They told me to call the neighbors to check because they were out of town, so I did. The neighbors saw nothing. The night after that, it was about 1am I think, and I heard the knocking again. It wasn't three times though, it was more. It woke me up out of a deep sleep. I was tempted to look out of the window to see who it was, but a large part of me didn't want to know. I went to get my parents again, who didn't even bother to check at this point because they didn't see anything the last few times. I kept hearing the knocking for the next few nights after that, to the point where I just ended up sleeping on the couch. My parents decided to just let me move bedrooms, and so they moved my bedroom into what was the office and switched everything around in the hopes that I wouldn't hear any more things. After moving bedrooms, I didn't hear anything for about three nights. Then it started again, the same knocking three hard times. This time I looked out of the window. I saw what I assume was a man or a very big built woman crouching down, wearing a gray hoodie and some dark jeans. I closed the curtains and got my parents and told them all about it. We called the police, but they couldn't really do anything about it because we had no solid proof besides my words. They advised we get a camera facing my bedroom and around that area of the house. So that's what we did. I haven't heard the knocking since, but I do wonder who it was. Nonetheless, it makes a good story to tell. One Saturday morning, I decided to go to my local Goodwill. I'm disabled and suffer from chronic pain. I use a cane on my good days and a wheelchair on bad days. Luckily for me, this was a good day. I parked out front and got out of my car and immediately noticed a man sitting at the far corner in front of the Goodwill. As I was walking into the Goodwill, he shouted, Miss. Do you have any extra time for me today? I'd never seen this man in my life and really did not want to engage with him. So I politely said, No sir, not today, I'm sorry. And I continued walking. He shouted something else at me, but I couldn't make out what he said and I was afraid if I had stopped and asked, then he would try to engage me in a conversation. I ignored him and continued walking. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him begin to stand up. I walked faster and entered Goodwill, thinking I was in the clear. I began walking along the storefront, just looking at the items. My heart dropped when I glanced through the front window and saw him walking briskly towards the entrance. I immediately thought he might be following me. This has happened to me before at Goodwill's. Every time. I've wound up in uncomfortable conversations where I have to continuously decline the advances of men I'm really not interested in. It's gotten to the point where I wear a fake ring when I go out so I can say I'm married because sometimes they accept that answer better than me simply not being interested. In that moment, the disability left my body because I picked up my cane and booked it to the nearby rack of ball gowns and hid behind them. Through the gaps, I observed him storming into the store and start to look through the aisles. I was scared because he looked angry, maybe because I ignored him. I didn't mean to be rude, but I thought I'd made it clear in a polite way that I did not want to speak with him. I don't think it's wrong of me to want to go thrifting without having to engage with random men. A kind woman nearby came up to the ball gowns where I was hiding and pretended to inspect them. She whispered, are you okay? I said, I think the man in the blue is looking for me. She said she thought so as well, and I asked her if any of the nearby dressing rooms were open. She pointed to the one that was, and when I saw that the man had turned his back, I dived underneath the door and locked it behind me. I called my boyfriend from the dressing room in tears and asked him to come to the store. Soon, I heard a knock at the door. The kind woman had gotten the manager. 
She told me that after the man looked through all the aisles, he walked out, grabbed his bag and left the area. They closed the dressing room I was in and let me hide in it until my boyfriend arrived. Then one of the male employees and my boyfriend walked me to my car. That was the end of it. Nothing really dramatic happened and since we were in public, I don't think my life was in danger, but it was an unsettling experience. I hate to think of the possible confrontation we might have had if he'd found me. I'm just so thankful to the goodwill employees and the kind woman who helped me that day. A few months ago, I was staying in my partner's apartment for a few weeks by myself. I don't quite remember why I was out that late, but it was around 1am and I just got off transit. Only one other guy got off with me, and he was rather tall and walked briskly. I was ahead of him at first, but he quickly passed me, because even though I have a quick stride, I'm pretty short for a guy. I don't normally live in that city, so I'm not sure why, but the streets were incredibly empty. I remember thinking that because there wasn't even a single car on the road. We were literally a five minute walk away from a major university, so it was very odd not to see a single person or car. The only lights were the street lights. I've spent nights at my partner's place before, and I never remembered it being this. Dead. Anyway, I'd walked down the street and was coming up to an intersection where I had to turn left. I noticed this guy standing around in front of the bank that was on the corner. The guy ahead of me walked by him with no problem and went straight. I was a bit wary, but I didn't think much of him until I was about maybe a meter away and he had sidestepped to be in front of me and had held his arms wide open, grinning at me. I glanced in the direction of the guy who'd left the train with me, but he was across the street already. My heart was pounding at this point and I think I may have started to disassociate from the stress because I can't remember what he looked like even though I remember looking directly at him. If this sounds like an overreaction, I have a history of multiple cases of CSA by different people and have PTSD among other mental illnesses I struggle with. At the time I was falling back into my disordered eating again and was also underweight in addition to being short so definitely not the person you'd expect to win a fight, and I knew it. I remember being frozen for a moment, and then on instinct I very politely said, No thank you. I took a step to the right towards the street and tried to keep walking forward. He moved in front of me again, still with his arms wide open, expecting me to hug him, still grinning. For some reason, I repeated my polite refusal and sidestepped him again, instead of running the opposite direction. Luckily he let me pass, but I could hear him following me from a short distance. I was wondering what I could do in that moment. I couldn't find him. There was no one around. If I tried to call someone, he was close enough to grab me, and I wasn't able to run very fast. Suddenly, I hear his steps speed up into a sprint, and before I could react, he slowed down again. I walked a bit faster. He repeated the same thing over and over. I wondered if I should go a different path so he doesn't know where I live. It wasn't the best idea since I didn't know the city very well, and he probably knew it better than I did. I decided I knew I could find help in the lobby at least, compared to if I went somewhere else. He sprinted at me again, and I turned around and loudly asked him, Do you need help? I remember not feeling my body and feeling lightheaded from the anxiety. Despite how panicked I felt, my voice came out clearly and I sounded disdainful. I don't think I meant to sound like he was annoying and inconveniencing me, but that's how it came out. Then he spoke for the first time and responded, No, do you need help? I didn't say anything to that and just turned back around and kept a fast pace towards my partner's apartment building. He was still following, but now he was talking. I can't remember much of what he said. I was just focused on getting back without being assaulted. Eventually, I heard him stop walking. 
I know I'm scary. I don't know why he said that. I took the opportunity to put more distance between us and kept up my pace. He didn't keep following though. He just kept saying, I know I'm scary. He got louder and louder the further I got. I got to the door of the apartment building and looked back again. He was no longer in sight. I unlocked the door to the apartment building and then ran up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. When I got into the apartment, I went straight to the window because the unit had a large window facing the street. I wanted to see if I could see him. Nothing. The streets were empty. I texted my partner about my experience, but he was already asleep and wouldn't see it. Luckily I haven't seen that man again, and I hope I never will. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs, just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket, which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his and that he brought it with him and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth. Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a badger type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his and told me he wants to take me abroad as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. 
Despite my friends maybe getting upset, I've locked another friend out. I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself, and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird? is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird, as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check, as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10 minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. I don't know if this will gain any traction, but this has been on my mind ever since it happened. I'm a respiratory therapist that works at a local hospital. I was on my way to work, about less than a mile away from my occupation, 
when the car in front of me quickly emerged into one of the emergency lanes as if something sudden had just happened. Then he just sat there, no hazards going off, nothing to indicate he planned on moving. I still had 20 minutes before I had to be at work. Assuming this individual may be in distress or have car problems, I decided to be a good Samaritan. I parked on the shoulder of the road and turned on my hazards. We exchanged eye contact and I gestured a wave. I rolled down my window and asked, Are you okay? He seemed to have either not heard me or ignored me, but he did seem to realize I wanted to help him. He gets out of his car at this point. Keep in mind, we are on an extremely busy road. I'm in my work scrubs, which tends to help people relax, knowing they're with a healthcare professional. However, this was different. When he got out of his vehicle, I assumed he would have told me that he was in some type of pain or something that caused him to pull over abruptly. He'd been driving fine the entire time I was behind him. So I casually get out of my vehicle and walk over to the back end of his car. This is when I officially start a conversation asking if he's hurt. Is something wrong? All the basics. But the thing is, his eyes were cold. He had this body language to him that almost made him seem a little unhinged or skittish. He had not answered any of my questions, so I tried once more asking, Hey man, we're in the middle of a busy road. Is there something wrong with your car or something going on with you? He simply replied, No. I started to feel the sensation of discomfort, like he wanted to do something to me but was restraining himself, so I continued to play it off. He didn't seem drunk or high, but he had these black beady eyes that I could not stop looking at. It was as if he was just a vessel to something dark. I try to continue the conversation. Why did you stop, man? You don't want to get hit out here. He replies, I don't know. I don't know where to go. I didn't know what he meant by this, so I questioned further by saying, Do you know what city you're in right now? If you're lost, I can tell you where the nearest highway is, which was also less than a mile away. His reply was a little chilling. Anywhere but here. I was now confused. He didn't know where he was, but felt this urge to get out of the area as quick as possible. So I asked, Well, what direction are you wanting to go? 75N will take you to Dayton. You take 75S, you'll head to Cincinnati. He asks, what would you do in my position? Now, I have no idea what he meant by this. I simply said, I don't know what kind of position you're in, man. Can you drive? The hospital I work for is within view, and we don't have to go in. I just want to make sure you don't get hit. He agrees to follow me, but once I turned on my blinker to turn into the hospital, he completely stopped following me, pulled a U-turn, and sped off. I know this isn't the creepiest thing in the world, but you really have to try to understand just how foreign and strange this behavior was. Each time we engaged in conversation, it was as if he was contemplating to tell me something, but ultimately remained silent. From the looks of it, he drove a red Toyota, a RAV4 hybrid maybe, so I mean he didn't have a broken down car or looked like he was a substance abuser. He just seemed incredibly nervous, and his fast motion gestures and twitches and his body language has left me puzzled, and it still gives me shudders when I think about how he moved and talked, the lack of response, declining any help, not explaining a single reason as to why he just decided to park on the side of the road. A simple, oh, I'm just lost, would even be enough for me to feel better about the situation. He just seemed incredibly paranoid and hesitant. On top of it, the entire conversation led nowhere to his situation or why he was acting so strange. I just wanted to make sure he didn't need help or get hit by a car. Anyway, I'll update if I hear anything about a patient coming in later. He also has a face that is burned into my memory. I just got this gut feeling to leave but be as polite as possible. Does anyone have any thoughts on this?
Hello, friends. I've been a lurker of this subreddit for a long time, and I figured it was high time I shared some of my spooky tales. First and foremost, my name's Mickey. I'm in my 20s, and this story happened when I was still a munchkin, below the age of 12. You'll have to excuse how overly sarcastic this story may seem. It's still scary to talk about, and humor is my defense mechanism. Anyway, when I was still knee-high-ish, my grandmother Tilly and I used to go on yearly road trips, either across our own country or the one next to ours. We lived relatively close to the border. Well, on this particular occasion, we decided to travel across our neighboring country. We'll call my home Country A and the neighboring Country B. My grandmother had a friend in the more yeehaw part of Country B that she hadn't seen in a minute and after some planning, they figured out the best time for the two of us to make our trip. I was excited when my grandmother first told me about the trip. I had no idea where we were going, but the idea of going on a road trip with Gram Gram was so damn exciting. I could hardly contain myself. Fast forward a few months, and we finally hop in the car and head off on our merry way. The trip would take approximately a week, my grandmother wanted to see all the neat stuff along the way, and traveling with a child such as myself required a lot of pit stops. I wasn't necessarily a bad traveling companion, I just had a small bladder. Anyway, we were on the last stretch of the trip when my grandmother had to pull into a gas station to fill up. We were practically running on fumes, and I really had to go to the bathroom. We pulled into this middle-of-nowhere gas station, and after my grandmother had filled up the car, we hurried inside so I could empty my bladder. The moment we walked inside, all the alarm bells in my tiny brain went off. I had no idea why I was feeling the way I was, up until I set eyes on the clerk. I'm not usually one to judge a person by how they present themselves, but old boy looked like he was straight out of a serial killer documentary. Currently, we're smack down in the center of Yeehaw territory, in the middle of nowhere, and this man looks like he should be selling you high-end cars, not working at a rundown gas station. Old boy was giving me all kinds of bad vibes. I really don't know how to explain it other than that. Worst still, he was already smiling a little too widely when he spotted my grandmother. She was petite, blonde, and beautiful. However, when he saw me, you could have sworn he was looking at a Sunday dinner. Somehow, his already very white grin only grew. Remembering it, even to this day, gives me the heebie-jeebies. Thankfully, Gram Gram could sense a disturbance in the force and shielded me from his predatory gaze. She paid for the gas and asked for the key to the washroom, which he took his sweet-ass time getting. She walked me to the bathroom, which was disgusting by the way, and I quickly did my business and we returned the key with great reluctance. Here's where things get progressively worse. When we were piling back into the car, old boy closed down the shop and got into his car. It doesn't seem too weird, right? Sure, he was really creepy, but he hasn't done anything too odd yet. Now, technically, we had two days left on the trip. My grandma would drive in increments, four hours on the road, an hour off to explore, fill up, and whatever else. Then we'd find an inn or motel and spend the night. We traveled about eight hours a day before turning in for the night. Well, when we left the gas station, old boy followed us for, I shit you not, the rest of the trip. At first, we just assumed he was heading in our general direction. It was just the one road after all. But after the third turnoff and old boy was still tailing us, my grandmother finally realized we were being followed. This man proceeded to follow us for, and I wish I were joking, 12 hours. My grandmother refused to stop driving unless it was absolutely imperative. For anyone wondering why she just didn't call for help or why she didn't pull into a police station, don't worry, you're not the only one. To be perfectly fair to my grandmother, she didn't have a phone, and despite somewhat knowing where she was, it was still unknown territory. She wanted to get to familiar surroundings so there wasn't the risk of getting lost. 
We finally made it to the city where her friend resided, and that's when we pulled into a police station. The mad lad pulled up next to our car, just as we headed inside the building, and he watched us. I don't know what old boy was taking, but he sat there while my grandma talked with a lovely lady at the desk. Thankfully, the cops handled the creepy man with ease, but I'll never forget the damn smile that never left his face while he was being escorted away. Needless to say, that was the last time we road tripped to Country B, and one of the last times we actually took a road trip in general. I was about 12. My mother and I had gone to a town 45 minutes out to do some shopping with some of her friends. I had a corn snake at the time, so I asked her if I could walk around a pet store one door down from the mini supermarket that she was shopping in so I could compare the prices of frozen mice with our local seller. She said sure, just to come back as soon as I was done. The pet store had been there as long as I can remember. It had a very warehouse feel about it and was poorly lit by dim fluorescent lights too far above the floor. Before checking out the mice, I just wanted to check out the rest of the store, being the curious 12-year-old I was. As I was roaming the aisles, I noticed you. You were in every aisle I strolled down. Bold, middle-aged, a bit tubby, wearing dark blue plumber's overalls over a white shirt. It was summer, and it was hot. I remember wondering why on earth you would come into a non-air-conditioned building in that. You carried a basket, but there was nothing in it. As you slowly stalked me down the aisles, I noticed your basket wasn't getting any more full. I started walking faster, taking random turns down different aisles to see if I was just being paranoid. But you were always 10 to 15 feet behind me. At some point, I finally thought I lost you. I power walked out of the pet store, and as soon as I cleared the doors, I sprinted down the street to the mini supermarket my mom was in. She hadn't even made it down the second aisle completely. I caught up to her, immediately stripped off my bright pink hoodie, and slung it in the cart, as well as ripped the hair tie out of my hair. I was smart for doing that, because when I looked back at the door, you were standing there, still carrying the basket from the pet store and scanning for any sight of a 12-year-old girl in a bright pink hoodie and ponytail. When we left, I saw you in your van as you drove away. A plain white van, like something out of a true crime documentary or horror film. I think about you sometimes, and how if you'd caught me before I got to that supermarket on that quiet Wednesday afternoon, what horrors could have been waiting for me in the back of that van? Guy in the overalls who followed me out of the pet store without even putting down his basket, even after 10 years, let's not ever meet again. When I was 16, I was in a choir at my high school that performed for a lot of different events around town. One of them was to sing at the middle school sporting events. The middle school in my hometown is just about half a mile from my childhood home, so whenever we had events there, I walked. This one night, I think in November, we had to sing at a basketball game, and it was obviously dark when I was able to leave. Normally, I wasn't allowed to walk alone at night but for choir I was given permission unless I felt unsafe. But there wasn't any reason to be creeped out at first, so I started my walk. Just down from the middle school is a stretch of road with almost no street lights. It has always creeped me out when I had to walk through it. I crossed quickly and had a fast pace going, as I'm a naturally paranoid human. About two minutes into the dark zone, I heard rapid footsteps behind me. I at first figured it was a jogger, but they made no attempt to pass me and just stayed a comfortable ten-foot distance. They began whistling a jaunty tune, which at first I thought was fun. 
At this point, I wasn't really scared, perhaps because of the happy whistling tune, but I noticed the footsteps began to speed up. There were no cars on the road, and given the lack of light, when I turned around, all I could see was a silhouette shrouded in darkness. At that realization, I quickened my pace to barely under a run. The whistling continued, getting more breathless as this person began to run after me. I looked back to see a dark figure coming at me full speed, and in terror, I began to run frantically as well. I will never forget those last moments, running through my dark subdivision, hearing his whistling and footsteps getting closer and closer. This person followed me up to my door. I ran inside and locked the front, checked all the other doors and went to my upstairs bedroom. From the window, I could still see a silhouette and could still hear him whistling. I slept with my knife that night. It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment. I share this today as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people. Be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jazz. I met Jez on OkCupid. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well and they seemed to get along, so Jez and I started dating. This guy completely sweeps me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged and validated me. Over and over again, he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe, wanted, and cared for. I'd never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we'd been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad but confident that I'd done the right thing for the both of us. The next week, he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance and reassuring me that he would rather try than not and end up regretting it. Even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake, talking, sharing, laughing, lovemaking and planning. We went places and did things that I'd always wanted to do. Then, in the deepest, most intimate moments, we would just sit there in silence. He would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment, asking, where have I been all this time? Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jez's, and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on, nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time. So, Jez offered to move in. Even though I was hesitant, we'd only been together about four months, and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed. He was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. 
He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy. Nothing like the person I thought I'd met. And the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with my friends became a burden, if not impossible, because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience, as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I'd given him the option whether he wanted to go or not, it was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I'd already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he'd expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month he knew about it, he insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going. And even more stunned when we went, and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming, and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jess and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I'd gone through with my ex-husband. I am so, so happy she has you. She bleeded through, wine happy. You have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back. You don't fucking know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat, brewing on it for a minute, before another light-hearted interaction with Jess prompted me to suddenly snap at him through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-assed apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out the dark window at nothing in particular, in worried silence. I might have messed up, was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, that kind of thing. The man who, not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, he would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at home. I really don't care about your work. It's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jez and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most of all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he would claim. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes. Talking about them, including my now ex-husband, may have well become off-limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, 
and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as an insecurity and threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket. Noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I'd stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of my clothes that I'd once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there leaving me broke almost all of the time. The horrible tragedy happened that following summer, while Jez and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to school with shot himself in the head while tripping on LSD. Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class, and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who is very familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jez, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for fucking around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response, and even more later when Jez started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy asking when the last time it was that I'd ever talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him for the first time after he called me at work, raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away. But once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming, and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why the fuck aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a shitty girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore into him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work that being in my life is a privilege, and if he's gonna wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. I didn't want him there when I got home, and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest of his stuff. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and it offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into, like Theon Greyjoy begging for his life. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42-year-old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them. I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that, he cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of a heartless person I'd been spending my days with. I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jess started blowing up my phone. Apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me, and sent me walls and walls of well-thought-out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back like a dumb, desperate girl, I took him back. 
It wasn't long into the second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life, and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living, so we had a good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I'd already attempted to contact Jess to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long till he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jez barreled in about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and phone number on it, reviewing what he thought was going on with my car. Before Jez butted in, cutting him off, I said she's fine, he snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye slink away at this comment and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jess walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper. You don't have to answer that, but if you need anything. He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it. Seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. I thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything, it was worse, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV turn on. I have a sound bar, so the volume can get pretty loud. Jess proceeded to turn the volume up, and up, and up, far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to, even for parties. The walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jess then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter, manic with anger as though something might be funny on TV, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed, absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing, I'll watch TV if I fucking want to, and turned it up even louder. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh, wow. Poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Crying. This caused the fight to start again, and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black, and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic, and hostile message that that was a warning, and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point, and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All of our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions, but he never hit me or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground, feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panicked state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur 
but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. And at this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over, and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tale that I was moving out and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection, I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. So they persisted, for a while. The same act from before. The love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in. But I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on red. The illusion was destroyed. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, this definitely made me lose trust in myself. I still don't understand what the end game was. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately, what happened to the guy I fell in love with? Chaz looked me dead in the eyes, smirked, and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that fucking asshole of a husband of yours. You are just stupid and fell for it. Jess, let's not meet ever again. So to start, I grew up in southwest Saskatchewan and moved onto my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that's on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in, though, that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent out our pasture space, and so we would have them on our property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes around the farm either. And there were tons. Every so often, when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part, as she was huge. But every so often, she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout, and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go to the bathroom. This is still a huge problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for damn near a half hour, just so she would go. On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point, she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside. 
but I wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated and would repeat, Go potty! every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark, I was cold and annoyed, and to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but I shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off of my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, Go! through the rain to my small, fuzzy, white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture, and suddenly in my left ear I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is, I have a very strong flight response, typically, but this froze me on the spot, as I was mostly confused at what the fuck I just heard. I tried telling myself I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a move from a cow that I'd heard wrong, but again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it another time. Go. It sounded unnatural, as if it came from someone who'd never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep, monotone, go. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio, but of course there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said, and whatever it was, it started repeating it as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then, again from behind me, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds, and at this point, I remember shouting out loud, All right. Don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little furball and made a mad dash for my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. My puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all, and happy mom wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what had just happened to me. She sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out, but soon after, he told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he checked the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning, when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. That explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me other than that, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off of the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good and finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you here have any idea what the hell this would have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors and we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they're capable of mimicking words. Are there any ideas? As I was walking home from work last night, about halfway to my house, a disheveled man, who looked to be either homeless or extremely down on his luck, crossed paths with me from the other side of the sidewalk. He had initially been walking in the opposite direction, but as soon as he saw me, he immediately turned around and started following me. He began rambling incoherently and aggressively, and his words were so slurred that I hardly understood a thing he said. 
all I could make out was something about a care package and look at you. It was obvious this man was under the influence of multiple substances. I quickened my pace and tried to avoid eye contact with the man, and he was getting agitated that I wasn't paying attention to him. When my walking speed got too quick for his inebriated stumbling to keep up with, he stopped talking and instead began just trying to follow me. I kept looking over my shoulder at him, and every time I saw him, he would either stop or try to duck behind a bush. Finally, I started outright sprinting and looking for a spot that I could hide in myself. I came up to my local mosque and tried to sneak around the corner into the parking lot of it, where there was a little tree that I could hide behind. While hiding there, I frantically dialed 911. I told them that a strange man displaying unstable behavior was trying to follow me and described my location, myself, and the man to them. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way to where I was, but while waiting for them, I saw a figure heading up the sidewalk in front of the parking lot I was hiding in. Panic immediately filled me, until the passerby was close enough to where I could see that it was not the same man who had just bothered me, and they turned out to be harmless. Mere moments after this, the cops arrived to where I was. They pulled up next to the tree and motioned for me to come out and talk to them. The officer driving the vehicle asked me the standard questions, a description of the incident, where I was when it happened, the usual. While we were talking, he spotted a man in another parking lot down the street, not far from where I had first encountered the creep. He asked me if this was the man I'd encountered, and it was hard to tell between the darkness and the distance, but I was pretty sure it was. Another police vehicle had pulled into that parking lot, and it appeared that an officer got out to talk to the man. The officer I had been talking to asked me how far I was from my house, and I told him I was pretty close to my street at this point. He assured me that I should be safe to walk the rest of the way home, and that they had other cops patrolling the area. I thanked him and finished walking home, without further incident, thank God. Shortly after I got home, I saw that I had a text from my boyfriend that read, Are you okay? The text had been sent at around the time the incident was occurring, as if he could sense I was in a fearful situation. I replied back, telling him what had happened. He told me that he'd gotten yelled at by a homeless man earlier too. I described the creep I'd encountered to him and asked if he thought it was the same guy. He said he didn't think so. We also had a brief phone call to make sure each other was okay. I let him know that I was home safe, and he told me he was in a vehicle with a group, so he was safe too. I don't know what the cops ended up doing about the man, but I hope he stays as far away from me as possible. I live in a city located in a valley with a lot of smaller towns up the hills and mountains around, so it's part of the local culture for teenagers and young adults to visit these smaller areas during the winter to drink, smoke weed, and hang out with their friends. My uncle bought a house in one of these areas, so eventually I decided to get the keys and spend a weekend there with five of my friends. The house has two big bedrooms with three beds each and a lot of extra mattresses. At night, we decided at some point to go back inside and just chill watching TV, but since the living room had no sofas yet, we brought some mattresses from the bedrooms and just used them. One of my friends, Victor, decided to go out to smoke, and after some minutes, we hear some knocking at the window just behind us. Everyone got scared for a second, but just looked at the window and said things like, Oh shit, it's just Victor but since we were sitting on mattresses close to the ground, it wasn't easy to see clearly who was at the window. And since the person just stood there looking straight at one of the girls, I got up to check. I saw a man who somehow looked a lot like my friend, but a bit more fat and older than him. As I came to the conclusion that it was a stranger, I froze while looking at him 
and him looking back at me, when I said, It's not Victor. Everyone else also froze and looked at me waiting for a reaction, but all I could think was to ask what he wanted. He just stood there for a second and asked, There's a bar nearby, and we need a drummer to play with our band. Are any of your friends a drummer by any chance? Which weirdly enough I am, but I just told him no, and after some extra long seconds looking at us, he left. My friend came back, and we made fun of the situation, making jokes on how it was him messing with us and whatnot. Later, most of the group decided to sleep in one bedroom and leave the second for me and one of the girls since they saw us kissing earlier. We all go to bed, but some hours later, I wake up to the girl shaking me in horror and whispering that she heard something coming from the kitchen. So I get up, tell her to lock the bedroom when I leave, and go check the sound like the moron who always dies first in films. As I pass by the second bedroom, I think about calling someone else to join me, but as soon as I see them all sleeping, I hear something at the kitchen's window. I quickly move there in silence, check around, and as soon as I find and grab a knife, the door opens right in front of me. It was the same guy. I knew it was no joke since I just saw my friend sleeping. It probably took like five to ten seconds of us staring at each other but it felt like an eternity. While still holding the door handle, he made a slow movement with the other hand towards something under his shirt, which was probably a firearm or a knife, but I also lifted my hand, showing him the knife, so he stopped. The kitchen was quite small, so we were standing pretty close to each other, and at this point, we both knew it would end bad for both of us if he tried something, so I shook my head and said as calm as I could, don't. He continued to stare at me for a little bit longer, and then finally closed the door and went away. I went back, told the girl it was nothing, and that we should go back to bed. I didn't sleep that night. We left early in the morning, and I made sure to ask my uncle and cousins if they ever received weird visits there. They said that the only person who ever goes there at night is the old neighbor when his wife doesn't let him arrive drunk at home, so he grabs my uncle's rocking chair to sleep until he gets sober. Now, every year, my friends talk about spending another weekend there, but I always make an excuse so we never go through that again. And they don't know what happened that night. This happened seven and a half years ago, June 23rd, 2016, while I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start clearing out and moving my stuff to the next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself and I had just finished cleaning out the living room other than some basic furniture, and I'd moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up, and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sort of by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a bit different to me. In order to get in, I had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it, and I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. 
The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work, I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside. Then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw a movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone, told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that this random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like a vivid nightmare I needed to wake up from. I still remember this date, seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar. A scar I don't know if I will ever heal from. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, it never gave me a problem. Denoise, denoise, denoise. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return, and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door, and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room 
to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. I'm a 17-year-old female working as a cashier at a popular thrift store. I've been there for approximately 8 months, and I love my job and my co-workers. The common thing I've noticed is that unfortunately, any time a new younger female cashier starts working, she will be hit on by plenty of older guys, and I was no exception to that. I've never had to deal with creepy or weird customers until this job, and I worked in the food industry before, so maybe that's why. We of course get a handful of regulars. And while I've had a few creepy older guys hit on me before, there's a regular that comes in all the time. I want to say he's in his late 40s, and while he's always nice, my manager pointed out his obsession with me. I was called in the office the other day so he could show me how he acts and such with surveillance cameras. Here's a list of what's been pointed out to me that I didn't really notice before. He comes in at roughly the same time I'm working every day and apparently doesn't show up on my days off. I work closing most of the time, so he comes in around 6pm. When he comes in, he will immediately look at the register I almost always work at and will do a double take looking for me. He usually buys one bullshit item, spending about 15 minutes in the store usually. My manager has pointed out that he needs to buy something or else he knows it'll look weird. Every time, without fail, he will go to my register, and even when I was on the floor doing recovery, he'll ask me to check him out because I'm his favorite cashier. If there's a shorter line, it doesn't matter. He will stay at my register, waiting and watching me. He lingers around after buying something just to talk to me, showing me things on his phone, making sure there's no one else in line. My manager said he approaches me when I'm alone so he can talk to me without holding up a line. He's commented on my hickeys that I failed to cover up before on my neck, making weird remarks here and there. He says he usually checks because there's always about one or two. 
He said I would look good as a blonde, which isn't inherently weird, but paired with everything else, I guess it is. When I wasn't wearing any makeup, he would say something like, You seem out of sorts recently. I started wearing makeup again recently, and he's commented saying he likes that I'm back to my old self. I've noticed weird, flirty remarks with him, but I always brush it off, because customers are always kind of weird, and I deal with that often anyway. He'll lean over the register counter to talk to me closer, just his body language in general. He does a double take when he leaves too, keeping his eyes on me. I think it's possible he knows what car I drive. He was at my work this morning, even though I always do closes. I've asked my boyfriend, who works with me, if it's true that he never shows up when I'm off. He said yes, it's true. I don't think he knows my schedule, but he might know my car and see it in the parking lot. He always parks out of the store outdoor camera view, so I still don't know what car he drives. The general manager was made aware by the manager, but the creep didn't interact with me much today because I was never alone at the register or on the floor. I was training a new cashier today. He was there a lot longer than usual, I'm assuming because he was waiting for a time when I was alone and there were no customers. I think he gave up when he realized I would be training for the majority of my shift and seeing how busy it was. Since I worked opening yesterday, he came in before my shift at work, probably assuming I would be opening again. I'm working closing tonight. Apparently, he came in earlier and saw the new cashier, so we actually ended up asking one of them. New cashier? Who quit? Probably thinking I quit. It's only 4.33. He usually comes in around 6 if I'm closing. I'm just waiting to see if he shows up for the second time today. I doubt he will since he might think I don't work today. My manager and I are going to keep a log of what time he comes in and leaves. I'm going to keep his phone number saved in my notes so I can look him up and hopefully find his name and other information. I will possibly keep my phone on the counter to voice record what he says. I wish I could record him in person, but it would be too obvious. If I get shown more security footage, I will video that instead. Last night, my boyfriend and I got in bed. Lights off, TV on in bed naked as usual. A couple of minutes go by of us talking and our cat jumps on the nightstand and is staring outside. He does this all the time, so I assume it's a stray cat out there. He runs across the bed to my nightstand, so I peek outside. My cat's tail is all fluffy, so I think it's just the cat that he doesn't like. I look out the window and see a phone screen. I have no clue what was on it. I didn't think to actually look that hard. It was a red thing in the middle, but that's all I know. I look at my boyfriend, assuming I'm just seeing the reflection of his phone, when I see my boyfriend is not holding his phone. I back myself into the corner of the wall, so whatever's in the window can't see me. I just repeatedly say, there's someone outside, until my boyfriend finally gets up. I grab a sweater and pants from the floor, and we're just walking around the house as he calls 911. We come back to the room, and the guy is still out there, but my cat will not let me get near the window without growling, so I don't get to see his face. The cops get there a few minutes later and search the block. They come from the front yard and the backyard, climb some fences, and they don't find anyone. They just say they'll be on the lookout, and to stay aware pretty much. My boyfriend and I are both reasonably shaken up. I point out the cat was acting similarly last night. Not exactly, but she was fluffed up and on edge. He pointed out that with how often I sleep naked or close to, it's possible the guy has done that multiple times to see. He also points out that with the lights on, you could definitely see into the bedroom from that window 
so he would have been able to see us having sex if he caught us on the right night. There's no proof he's been there more than once, and with our neighborhood, he was probably just some guy on drugs wandering around. He left the gate open, stood there even though we clearly spotted him, and just didn't seem too smooth in his operation. I don't know, I just hope it was a one-time thing. I feel so helpless. I didn't go outside and do anything because I didn't know if he had a weapon, but I wish I could have. My boyfriend wants to buy a gun this weekend, and I hope that can at least give me some sense of security. I was relocating across Texas and, as I normally do, was driving through the night to skip traffic. And because it's more serene that way, I was driving straight through central Texas going northwest. So seeing the hill country change to desert by the light of the full moon was really cool. Anyways, I was driving with my now ex-wife. It was around 2am and we were running low on gas. Luckily, we were pulling into a tiny no-name town, and we could see an old gas station come around the bend. Now, this town only has one road, and this station was right at the edge of town, at the very end of the road. When I describe the gas station as old, I mean very old. The type that has no prepaying option, you simply flip up the handle on the machine, and you hear the pump inside start struggling to get the gas from the reservoir. It had the old style tick readers too, not a thing electrical on it. I, being a young man, had never seen one before, so I walked into the store to buy the gas before I pumped. There was only one light on in the store, at the far back, and I almost thought it was closed since it was barely brighter inside than it was outside in the moonlight. Upon entering, I saw the place was deserted. No customers, no workers, nothing. However, there was an odd tune playing on someone's radio that I couldn't place. An old sounding upbeat piano piece was playing somewhere around the corner, inside, and I heard shuffling once I walked closer to the source. This place made me feel scared, not just a, whoa, this is creepy, scared, but a, all hairs are on end. Something is seriously wrong here, but I can't figure it out scared. As I turned the corner, I saw a young man standing next to a large radio and dancing. His dancing, though, was extremely off-putting and seriously didn't match the tune at all. Though the radio was cranking out what sounded like ragtime, this guy was running his hands up and down his body and pretty much feeling himself with his eyes closed in what looked like bliss. He was going far slower than the music and definitely wasn't on tempo. For some reason, I couldn't speak. I couldn't even move. I was in a trance as every part of me screamed to turn and leave. Eventually though, I said, excuse me, I just need to get some gas. The guy kept dancing. I said it a bit louder and he finally slowed down a bit and opened his eyes and focused them on me. But it was like he was looking at a finely cooked steak. He was looking almost through me and silently walked to the register without saying anything. I said, uh, just twenty dollars please. He, again, didn't say anything and just stood behind the ancient register. So I just figured maybe he didn't speak the language or was embarrassed I caught him dancing, so I laid the money on the counter and went outside, hoping he'd turn on the pump. I filled up, told my wife about the weird-ass scene in there, and, when I was done, turned off the pump to kill the horrible grinding noise from the interior pump fighting against gravity to get the gas up. The weird thing is, when we were leaving, I looked back in the window and the guy was still standing there behind the counter. Not all that unusual in itself, but I could see my money was still on the counter in front of him. It was like a robot who just turned off once I left. 
This is where it gets really weird. A couple of months later, I was driving back to San Antonio to visit family, and we figured we'd stop at that old gas station to see it in the daytime, since it had become somewhat of a running joke between us. We pulled into this tiny town, and the thing was gone. The lot it sat on at the end of the road wasn't even there. It was just grass, no rubble, no old pump, no lighting, nothing. It was like somebody picked it up and moved it. It looked like nothing had been there for years. I still get freaked out thinking about it. This happened to me a few years ago while traveling. I was private tutoring, and my boss sent me to his office to pick up my paycheck at the end of the first month. He gave me the address, so me and my boyfriend at the time drove there, and he waited outside for me. It was a tall building, and I approached what looked like a security guard. I showed him the address I had written down to make sure it was the right place. He studied it, nodded, and told me it was on the fifth floor, and he showed me the direction to the elevator. As I got in the elevator, he stepped in with me. He pressed number five. I assumed it was his job to escort people to the right floors. He was staring me up and down the entire time. I glanced down at the address my boss had written down and realized it said, second floor, not fifth. I turned to the security guard and I started to say, I think we're a little confused as this says second. He made out he didn't understand my language, so I started to repeat the number two in Vietnamese instead. He completely ignored me and instead turned and gave me this creepy smile. It still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. He reached out and started to stroke my hair saying, so beautiful. I froze to the spot and started to shout, no, Adam, over and over. By this point, the doors to the elevator had opened. I stepped out and looked around, and there was absolutely nothing there. It was under construction. There was paint and dirty old sheets everywhere, all over the floor. I ran towards the window and looked outside, to see if I could get my boyfriend's attention, but I was too high up. The creepy guy had gotten out too and was pointing me down an empty corridor. He looked really frustrated now. He was blocking the elevator by this point, so I couldn't get back in. I pretended to walk towards the corridor and he followed me. When I got to the door, I bolted back to the elevator and started to press the button to the ground floor and he followed me. Whenever the doors closed, he would just press the button from the other side and they'd open again. He was shouting at me in Vietnamese and looked angry with me. The adrenaline had kicked in and I was literally thinking about anything I could use or how I could defend myself if he tried anything with me. I started screaming as loud as I possibly could to make him back off. As I pressed the ground floor button and the doors began to close again, he smiled at me once more. This awful, creepy smile that I think about all the time. My heart was in my mouth as I imagined what would be waiting for me when the doors inevitably opened again. To my surprise, the elevator started moving towards the ground floor this time and I managed to get out. I ran out as fast as possible and was crying by the time I got to my boyfriend. He wanted to go back inside, but I stopped him and made him drive me home. Fast. The same day, I called my boss and explained what had happened. It turns out I wasn't even in the right building, never mind the right floor. I blame myself for getting the wrong address, but a different country in that. I don't know why the guy in there pretended I was in the right location, or what his intentions were with me, or even why he decided to just let me go. Maybe he was trying to scare me, 
or maybe he was trying his luck with me. I have no idea, but I think about it from time to time, or tell the story again to someone, and it really creeps me out to think of what could have been. I've never gotten in an elevator with a man again, either. To preface this, I love to drive, like hours-long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind. Just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventual cities, and I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four to five years ago, and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort out personal issues. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a mean of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues that I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend, I couldn't focus on anything else. I decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and not to be gone for too long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life. So I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend, and I was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror, or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now, it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of a sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutted out onto the road, kind of like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do it. The driver's side door was flung open, and as I slowed my vehicle down, and angled it toward the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. The cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, 
which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it, but there was still a part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out, Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I figured out my next course of action then. So, again I shout, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadow of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first and was about to say something in response or possibly even stop my car and get out when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person did not have any blood on them or appeared injured in any way. They were wearing a mask, not like the face mask for the pandemic or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was. I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat out of hell, my heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off, so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow and chase me, or if they'd stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road, watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T who was a police officer to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, and stuff like that, he told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police and sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for the police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through the hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even ten or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, really freaked out for my safety, 
and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement, so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with them until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it. Though, with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here, and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I'd stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. This happened to me three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I just moved into a new apartment one month ago, and I'm still unpacking and settling in. I've been using my parents' address as my mailing address all of my life. Three nights ago, my parents call me at 2am freaked out and proceed to tell me this story. Apparently, at 1am, someone starts banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walks downstairs and opens the door, leaving the front glass door closed and locked. There was a man standing outside, who looked to be in his thirties, with a black hoodie on with a hood pulled up around his face. He didn't have any distinguishing facial features, facial hair, or tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic. Neither my stepdad or my mother recognized the man. The man says, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for Alice Fitzgerald. My stepdad plays dumb and says, Who? The man proceeded to state my full name again and says that my boyfriend is worried because I didn't come home that night. He claims to be a friend of my boyfriend and tells my stepdad that they are both out looking for me, worried because I didn't show up at home. I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself with my three dogs and haven't been in a relationship in the past five to six months. Here's the weird part. My stepdad asked the guy what boyfriend he was talking about, and the man tells him the name of the boyfriend I had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. My boyfriend in 10th grade has a very unique Italian name. I've never met anyone with a full name even close to his. He says my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him and repeats that they are very worried about me and if my stepdad is sure I'm not inside. At this point my stepdad is weirded out and closes and locks the door in his face. The man does not leave. He lingers in front of my parents' house for the next 10 minutes, smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. Finally, my parents call the cops. About five minutes before the cops arrive, the man walks down to the dead end on their block and drives away in a silver car. My stepdad was unable to get the license plate. My parents file a police report and nothing else happens. After I hear this story, I'm going nuts over the weirdest details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago? And what would the motive be of making up a story that included the weird detail about my past? 
I have not had contact with the 10th grade boyfriend in over a decade. Yesterday, I decided to message him on Facebook to see if he has any insight. I tell him the whole story. He's just as confused as I am and claims to have no part in it. I'm at a loss. I'm also really freaked out that some strange man is going through that much trouble at 1am to look for me. Any insights or ideas would be greatly appreciated. No, nothing else weird has happened since then. I also want to add something here. First off, I'm not in any legal trouble and have no reason to think someone would be suing me. I mean, I guess it's in the realm of possibility that I am being sued by someone, but I really don't think that's it. I had an expired registration ticket that I did not show up to court for, but I believe I got a letter in the mail just asking me to pay a really large fee, so I don't think that's related. I did take out a personal loan. I took it out about a year and a half ago. It wasn't for anything too crazy, and I was really good with making payments on it until about six months ago, when I had a medical issue. Currently, I'm really behind on payments. But to my knowledge, I've not defaulted on the loan yet. I called the loan company, and they claim to have nothing to do with it. All of my family and friends also noted that the 1am factor kind of rules that out anyway. Nothing else strange has happened at my parents. I went there for the first time last night and kept a close eye out for anything. I didn't observe anything out of the norm, so this remains a mystery. I'll be sure to update if something else happens. I wanted to see if I could see him. Nothing. The streets were empty. I texted my partner about my experience, but he was already asleep. For context, I typically go shopping at around 7 or 8 p.m. nowadays, since the store is less crowded around then. However, I try not to go unless I have to, because number one, the pandemic, and number two, being shut out after sundown doesn't feel comfortable for my safety. Despite this, the area I live and shop in is what I would consider to be safe. So going for a quick grocery run a little later in the evening has felt okay lately. So about two weeks ago, I was at my usual grocery store at around 7pm. I read somewhere online that you should make your trips to the store 30 minutes or less. And being the Gemini that I am, I knew I would have to make a list on my phone to follow, or I would dawdle. I began my trip in the produce section, essentially only looking up from my phone to step out of people's way or to grab whatever was on my list. There were more people in the store than there usually were in the evenings when I go, so I had to make a few laps to wait for folks to clear certain areas that I needed to get to. I first realized I needed to do this when I was at the carrot section, but since it was too crowded, I figured I'd circle back in a minute or two and grab something on the other side of the section in the meantime. Trying to determine where to go, I looked up from my phone and began walking towards the bananas. On my way to get to them, I just kind of looked forward blankly, not really thinking of anything besides my task at hand. This was short-lived because a man in a grey zip-up hoodie and a baseball hat caught my eye as we walked past one another. Nothing really stood out about him besides the fact that he was looking at me and that he was walking really fast. I didn't think anything of it and kept forth towards the bananas. As I gathered my produce and a few things along the way back to the carrots, I passed the same man again. He made eye contact with me again. Normally, I'm not one to really make eye contact with other patrons. I'm a mind-my-own-business kind of person, but his demeanor just caught my eye. I also noticed that he was the only person in the section not carrying anything. It had to have been at least three minutes since we first passed one another, so to think that he was just kind of perusing around and not getting anything was strange. It's not like he just got there either. As I finally get the carrots, I make my way over to the bakery section, and the man passed me once again. This time, I didn't make eye contact, but I turned around to see where he was going. This sounds silly, but the way he was moving around the store didn't make sense. I was working my way from the front to back, 
and he was walking erratically in all different directions. Might I remind you, he still had nothing with him. As I begin to turn my head to see what this man is doing, another guy runs past me wearing all black. Okay, strange, but he ran so close to me that the hair that was in front of my left shoulder was blown behind my back from the gust of air he blew past me. Since I was already turning my head, I fixate to see where this man is going. He had run over to the man that was passing by me frequently, and they were both looking right at me and talking to one another. They were about 30 feet away from me, so I couldn't make out what they were saying. I also looked for maybe a second because it was at this point that I started to get pretty anxious. I'd like to mention that I have generalized anxiety disorder, so when I'm in suspicious situations that might flare up anxiety, I really try to talk myself down from anything that might be illogical. I mean, who would follow me in a grocery store? I wasn't sure what to make of what I was seeing. In an attempt to soothe my anxious thoughts, I decided to continue shopping and tried not to fixate on the two men. I looked back down at my phone and realized I forgot to grab lemons from the produce section, so I was irritated that I had to go back. I began walking, head down, when a woman taps my shoulder. I'm already feeling a myriad of emotions at this point, and to be touched by a stranger during a pandemic, I was really annoyed. I looked back up behind me to see who could have possibly been clumsy enough to knock into a stranger when my eyes locked with the woman's who bumped me. Now, this is kind of difficult to explain, but stay with me. It's a pretty popular thing among women to communicate solely through eye contact and body language. Now, I know that all people, of all genders, do this, but for women specifically, it's different. I've been out with friends that have told me, save me from this creep, without saying a single word. So despite the masks and distance between us, something in me told me to listen to her. She rolled her eyes downwards towards the floor, as if a ball were rolling past her feet, in the exact direction of the men that were looking at me and lapping me. She didn't look directly at them, but I knew she was indicating she was about to say something about them. She looked back up at me, and in a whisper told me, Heads up. My stomach sank. I knew I wasn't just paranoid. Someone else had noticed that something weird was going on. I walked past her to her right and said, Uh-huh, to indicate that I understood what she meant. It was at this point that I needed to get out of the store without looking panicked or raising suspicions. When I told my boyfriend this story, he questioned why I didn't just leave right then and there. First off, I had a basket full of produce that I needed to pay for. Second, I didn't want to raise suspicions or alert these men as to why someone they're following is suddenly making a run for it. So I swiftly began to navigate the aisles as to gather a few more things on my list. As I moved through the store and looked down the aisles to see what items were where, one of the men were in each aisle, walking towards me. Every aisle I went down, one of them was there. I was fucking terrified. I decided it was time to go. I went to self-checkout and hauled ass. I did my best to appear calm, but I know I looked frantic. Since it was dark outside, I did not feel comfortable walking to the car by myself. Once I was done, I approached three employees chatting amongst one another. I luckily got the attention of a female store manager and thought on my feet. I told her that my ex-boyfriend was in the store following me and I needed to be walked out. In hindsight, I probably should have alerted them to what was actually going on, but I wanted to get out of there, no questions asked. And she didn't ask questions. She said, Oh shit, okay, I'm getting security to walk you out to your car. And as the guard appeared from the back of the line waiting to use the self-checkout, so did the two men. They made eye contact 
and broke left and right. When I tell you I almost pissed myself, my god, my heart was in my throat. Luckily, I didn't see the men outside. The last I saw them was by the self-checkout. The security guard so kindly walked me to my car and made sure I drove away, which I am so grateful for. I called my boyfriend, sobbing since my anxiety was so high at this point, and he advised me to take a different route home and make four right turns if I thought anyone was following me. For precaution, I stayed at a friend's house that night because I was so anxious. I'm so grateful nothing happened to me and that I'm here, but I cannot thank the woman who warned me in the store enough for validating my suspicions. If you witness anything that looks sketchy or weird, please tell or warn someone. I haven't heard about any kidnappings or crimes towards women in my area recently, thank God. It just scares me to think what could have possibly happened and what kind of people are out there. I think it goes without saying that I'm no longer going shopping after sundown, nor at that store. I'm blanking on where I heard this, but I think it really applies to how I felt that night. It's better to be safe than sorry, and to be paranoid than dead. This isn't a ghost story, but something which happened a long time ago when I was at university. My friend, A, was a regular pitcher in the university's baseball team. He was a well-built guy and he was tall as well. We had a test coming up and he was in the library cramming. I was also there and I saw everything unfold. I had the perfect view. The library was nice and quiet and before I knew it, it was already dark out. There was still plenty of time before the library closed, though. You know those nights in late September, where the night draws in quicker and it's rainy out? It was one of those. I saw A down there. He was putting his things in his rucksack and getting ready to leave. It was really raining heavily out there. I knew that it would be raining because I checked the weather forecast. A probably didn't check the weather forecast, as he didn't bring an umbrella. There were a few left by the entrance of the library. I guess he thought he could just take one since no one was using it, or perhaps someone forgot it there. He was that kind of guy, always taking what wasn't his. He would often ask to borrow things, never having the presence of mind to think ahead. He searched through the umbrellas, ignored the cheap-looking vinyl ones, and went for the biggest one he could find. He said later that he noticed something sticky on the handle. He thought it might have been a prank or something. I was stood up because I thought he was about to steal my umbrella, so I was keeping an eye on him. That's how I saw everything. I watched him open the large umbrella he selected, then a huge boom resounded around the library, emanating from the entrance followed by the sound of A screaming. Members of staff came rushing over to him. The whole library stunk of a smell not too dissimilar to fireworks. A was engulfed in smoke, and his right arm was alive with fire. The staff helped to quickly extinguish the flames, and A left in an ambulance. He suffered horrendous burns to his hand. The police and the fire department came to investigate what happened in the library. The umbrella was packed full of a gunpowder-like substance they said was found in fireworks. The outside of the handle was coated in some kind of flammable gel, the sort you might find in a camping store or something. The one-touch button part of the umbrella was equipped with a kind of ignition device, and when that button was pressed as the umbrella opened, it ignited the fire. What made things worse was the fact that A was wearing a coat made from a synthetic material. The heat of the fire melted his coat to his arm. The day that this happened was a particularly busy day in the library, as a lot of students were preparing for various tests. There were so many people coming and going, it was impossible for the police to figure out who the criminal was. There were also no fingerprints on the umbrella, 
and since the crime seemed to be targeted at no one in particular, it meant that identifying any suspect was impossible. Sadly, A didn't end up pursuing a career in baseball. He went in a different direction due to the nature of his injuries. What a shame. It really makes you think about taking things which aren't yours, doesn't it? This happened one night a few years back. I was a student at the time. I was working at a convenience store trying to save some cash for university. I was living with my parents. I walked a couple miles back home from my part-time job at the convenience store. I would usually get picked up, but my parents were out on a date. The fog was thick that night, and there was no one on the streets. It was a perfect autumn night. I was wrong though. I noticed after about 10 minutes that someone was walking behind me. I didn't pay it much mind, but when this person was taking every turn I was taking on my route home, I grew concerned. I looked over my shoulder while crossing the road to see that the owner of the footsteps behind me was a man. I turned onto my street and up to my house, grateful to hear him turn off in a different direction. It was quite foggy that night. The street lights were lit early, and since I worked a long shift, I went over to the mailbox before going inside. I was expecting something. At that point in my life, I hadn't really had any paranormal experiences or been in the line of any inherent danger. That all changed that night though. While I was checking my mailbox, something appeared from the corner of my eye that made me turn to the right to face it. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then I quickly realized that there was a figure at the other end of the street. I was fairly certain it was the man. Not the guy from before, I prayed. It was strange because he was just standing there, completely still, and I guessed that he was staring straight at me. My fight or flight reflex kicked in, and I quickly made my way to my front door. The hairs on my neck were standing on end. I inherently knew that there was something off about this situation, and I needed to get out of it. I unlocked the door, turned to have a last look, and nearly fainted. The figure was now at the end of the driveway. I needed to get inside and get behind a locked door. Once inside, I looked through the window, and he was gone. I was trembling in fear. I couldn't see where this guy was and I couldn't decide whether or not to turn the lights on, but I continued to periodically check the window. I almost jumped out of my skin when the neighbor's dog started barking loudly. I was really frightened. My blood froze in my veins as I heard footsteps, hearing the footsteps approaching my front door. I ran, covering my mouth to prevent myself from screaming, and I looked through the peephole. The outdoor sensor light wasn't on, but I could see the wall well enough due to the street lights, and it was light out due to the fog. Barely breathing, I stared through the peephole and gasped in fear when a dark shadow appeared. I was sure that it was the man with his hood pulled over his head, and he was inches from the door. Instinctively, I flipped the light switch and went back to looking through the peephole. He wasn't there. I raced around the house and turned every light on while trying to find my phone. I was in such a panic, I had no idea where I'd put my handbag. I was shaking in terror as I crept into the kitchen and grabbed a knife from the knife block. The dog had stopped barking, and for a moment, I thought that the man had gone to silence them. I was too frightened to look out of the window. Then, I heard my neighbor's voice yelling, I was saved. I won't repeat the language he used, but he made sure that the creep was off of our property. He came over, and when I was certain that the man was gone, I opened the door. We spoke for a little while, and he calmed me down. I even asked him to check all the rooms in the house. I was a bit embarrassed, but I cannot tell you how shook up I was. It seemed like hours had passed before my parents got home. 
I explained it all to them, and they told me I needed to make a statement to the police in the morning. After one more check on all the windows, I went to bed. Early the next morning, at around 2 a.m., something woke me up, and I sat bolt upright, straining my ears. The silence was so deafening, but my beating heart almost hurt with the slowly building anxiety. I felt for sure that the man was back. I checked the windows. Nothing. I stayed up until dawn. I never saw him again, and I really don't want to either. The whole experience terrified me. I always make sure doors are locked, no matter where I go. Ever since then, I've been afraid of fog too. This is a scary experience I had with my brother. On the night that this took place, my brother and I decided to go watch a movie in the cinema. The only issue was that the movie wasn't screening in our town and we would have to drive kind of far. We didn't really care though as we were young. I think I was about 16 and my brother was 19. So when you're at that age, you feel like you have all the time in the world. It was just over an hour's drive and the only showing was at night. We got there on time and watched our movie and then had some dinner in a fast food place. We hit the road at about 11 p.m. and started making our way home. It had been a great night. My brother was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We were using the satellite navigation system since we were driving along unfamiliar roads. Although it was kind of a long drive and late, we had plenty to talk about. We were talking about the movie and food for some reason. Just for some context, we were driving back to our hometown in Kagawa from Tokushima. This is in Shikoku. The navigation system leads us in a different direction to the way we came. It seemed to be taking us away from the highways. I felt like this was to avoid either an accident on the road or some late night reworks. It wasn't great though because we were on National Route 11 and that ran alongside the sea. It was incredibly well lit and the roads were wide. Now, we were going through winding narrow mountain passes. We ended up getting a little lost. Since my brother and I didn't know these roads, we couldn't really figure out where to go. I mean, the satnav wasn't exactly helping us, but as we were young, we felt as if the satnav knew better, so we made a choice to keep following its directions. And that turned out to be a very bad choice. We headed further into the darkness of the mountain and away from the bright lights of the highway. We would try to reassure one another that we were probably being sent to a shortcut and everything would be fine. We relied on the satnav's directions. The last of the streetlights disappeared. There was nothing but darkness ahead of us and all around. I got worried, so I said to my brother, this is a little odd, huh? The satnav says it's fine, my brother replied. He couldn't hide his look of concern from me. I could see it written on his face. Dark thickets of trees towered either side of the road as our car chugged up higher into the mountains. Because we were now on uneven roads, the car was making some strange noises, which began to panic me. It sounded like the engine was struggling. I swallowed my pride and said to my brother, Hey bro, I gotta be honest, I'm getting scared now. Why don't we make a U-turn and just get back on the highway? My brother didn't respond. He was just fixated on the road ahead. I felt my heart begin to canter now. I asked him the same question again. He didn't say a word. I watched as he tightened his grip on the steering wheel. Hey bro, come on, you're scaring me now. Just as I was about to ask him to make a U-turn for the third time, he drew in a deep breath and finally spoke. Don't look behind. Something strange is going on. I felt my spine turn to ice. I didn't even really understand what he meant. Why was he being so vague? I instinctively wanted to look behind me, but I did as he asked. I sat there in silent contemplation, unable to muster the courage to say another word. 
For a little while, I thought that my brother might be teasing me. We did like to prank one another, but neither of us had ever gone as far as this. This seemed way too serious. I looked over at him to see if he had a sly smirk on his face, but he looked like he was in the zone, incredibly focused and yet incredibly concerned. When I saw that look of determination on his face, I knew there was something behind us. I noticed that we were speeding up as well now. Then my brother floored it. I felt myself slam backwards in the passenger seat. It was terrifying. At any moment, another vehicle coming in the opposite direction could appear behind one of the bends in the mountain road. We were going way too fast. Whatever was behind us had forced my brother to drive incredibly recklessly. I went against my brother's orders, and I looked in the wing mirror to try and see what was behind us, but I couldn't see anything. Had my brother just gone completely mad? I was silent. I wanted to plead with him to slow down, but I didn't want to divert his attention from driving. Despite being on these dark, intricate roads, he drove even faster. I felt for sure that we were going to collide with something at any moment. So I kind of braced myself. I tensed up. Then, suddenly, we were turning. We skidded into a hard left, and at that moment, I shut my eyes and braced for impact. A second or two went by, and I slowly opened my eyes and looked over at my brother. His face had lost all of its color, and his knuckles were white. It was as if he was hanging onto that steering wheel for dear life. I couldn't make a sound. I just prayed that we would get back on some streets with lights and away from whatever had scared my brother into driving like this. I shut my eyes again, thinking back to that night now. Trying to remember how I felt really makes me feel for my brother. I mean, if I was feeling that scared, I bet he was feeling it more since he was the one driving. After a few moments, my brother said, It's okay now. He's not following me anymore. I think we're good now. I opened my eyes to see streetlights in the distance. It was as if my prayers had been answered. We turned onto the National Highway route and I saw the sea. I knew that when I saw that, we were going to be fine. I cannot tell you how relieved I was at that point. Once relief settled in, a new feeling emerged. Curiosity. I needed to know what caused my brother to drive like our lives depended on it. I needed to know what had been following us. Bro, what was behind us? Something really freaked you out, didn't it? I asked him. My brother drew in another deep breath like before and said something like this. Pretty much as soon as we made that turn off onto the mountain roads, I felt as if we were being tailed. I knew because at one point the rear sensor went off. I didn't see anything behind at first because of the dark, and that was when I realized that we were being tailed by a car without its headlights on. I thought that whoever was driving must know these mountain roads well if they were confident enough to drive with no lights. At first he was glad to see that other cars were using these roads because he thought that the sat-nav might be right. He said he felt uncomfortable that the car had its lights off. He wanted to pull over to let it pass as it was speeding up behind him now and then. However, the roads were way too narrow to allow him to pull off to the side to let the car behind pass. It was at that point he glanced in the rearview mirror to try to get a better look at the driver. He said the sight of the driver took his breath away. The driver had the interior light of his car on and my brother could see his face. He was smiling. He said it wasn't a happy smile, but a disgusted grin that came with furrowed brows. That was the moment that my brother said he knew we had to get away from that car and its driver. That was the moment he started driving faster. It made sense to me now why when I looked in the wing mirror, I couldn't see anything. When my brother made that screeching left turn, the car behind apparently carried on going straight. We weren't sure if the driver tried to turn around to follow us, but we don't think that he did because my brother didn't see him again that night. We managed to arrive home safely without further incident. 
That experience really had an effect on my brother. He became a lot more anxious and jumpy after that. He sought out some help though, and thankfully I don't think it has permanently scarred him or anything. My brother and I are fine these days, doing well, no injuries. That was one scary night though. I torture myself every now and then when I think about what that grinning driver's intentions were. I feel as if he was trying to shepherd us someplace since he appeared to know the mountains well enough to drive in the dark. He wasn't scared of showing us his face and that is pretty unnerving. It makes me feel as if something more than a robbery might have been on the cards. Your guess is as good as mine. I once matched with someone on a dating app and it completely put me off ever using apps like that again. At first we got on quite well, well enough for us to have a date, but something about him and me just didn't feel like a great fit, unfortunately. The reason why I didn't think we would ever become an item was because he came across as a pretty weird dude. He was a little bit intense, you know, a bit stalky, full on. Unfortunately, he already had my information, so I would sometimes hear from him and keep in touch with him via an app called Line. I felt that if I blocked him, something bad might happen. He might fly off the handle. This guy had this intensity that was just haunting. I didn't want to provoke him. I know that sounds so dumb, but that is how I felt. Eventually, I stopped opening his messages. I just left them unread. After a while, he got the picture and stopped contacting me. I know it's not nice to give someone the cold shoulder like that, but he kind of left me no other choice. If I ever did reply to him, he would pounce on it and bombard me with messages at all hours of the day and night. He stopped messaging me and I thought that would be the end of things. I assumed that he had given up and moved on. However, one day, during a particularly cold winter in my city, something bad happened. It was freezing as I walked home from work. I didn't think that I could feel any colder, but when someone jumped out in front of me from some darkened alley, my heart felt like it was turning to ice. It was him, the guy I went on a date with months ago. So there I was confronted by the creep I had thought I had successfully avoided. I was really scared. He just stood there in my path and didn't say anything. He was glaring at me. And I was shocked into a silence. I didn't really know what to say at first. But after a couple of awkward seconds, I asked him what he was doing here. And he said something like, What's so bad about two lovers meeting? I mean, it's only natural I come round to see you, if I can't reach you by the phone, right? Shows I care. What he had said made no sense. It had been a good few months since we had spoken, and even longer since we had had our one and only date, it made no sense at all. I thought that he was obviously crazy, and then I thought about getting as far away from him as humanly possible. So fight or flight kicked in and I just ran. All I wanted to do was go home and forget about the weird encounter with that guy, but I realized that if he had met me on my route home, then there was every chance that he might know where I lived. I realized that it would have been totally dumb to go straight home. So I stood there as it snowed, cowering in some disused building's archway, frantically thinking about what to do next. After the adrenaline subsided, the solution was obvious. I needed to go to the police, so I went to my local call man. Hi, Jay here. A call man is a station for police officers built at key areas in the city, such as in front of train stations or in shopping districts. The word call man literally means taking turns to keep watch because police officers are stationed there at all times. And these officers, they take turns, shifts, or kotai in Japanese, to keep watch, which is ban in Japanese, ban, 24 hours a day. They make walking home at night feel pretty safe, 
and I have been grateful of their help a couple of times in Japan. Anyway, back to the story. After I made my report to the officers, they told me that they would patrol my area, just to be on the safe side. I felt reassured, but not exactly safe. And if I'm completely honest, after that night I turned into a bit of a recluse for a while. I developed an acute fear of leaving the house. Three months or so went by, and there was no sign of that one-day wonder I matched with online. So, I slowly but surely regained some confidence. I went outside by myself for the first time in a long while. I was relying on the help of my friends and family up until then. I planned on heading to the supermarket. I knew the route, and I knew it was close. The Corban was nearby, and I felt it was a relatively safe route. In the word of a lie, I got about 20 paces up my street and then I heard a voice call out to me from across the street. I was addressed by my name. It wasn't an oi or a cat call or anything like that. This person knew me. Here is roughly what the guy shouted at me. Hey, can I? I've been waiting for you. He crossed the road with a light jog and stood a couple of paces behind me with a completely straight poker face. Hey, you know you didn't need to call the cops on me, right? Don't you think that was a little mean, sweetheart? I was so scared that I couldn't make a sound. I knew I had to run, and I'm so happy that I chose that route I did to venture out for the first time, as I knew exactly how to get to the Corban. I ran there, and I reported what happened. I have to say, life so far has been pretty incident-free since that second reporting. But that was how it was before. I feel like I have been lulled back into a false sense of security. I feel like it might be the calm before the storm again. Winter is rolling around, and the nights are getting darker. When the snow begins to fall, I'm scared all those memories of being stalked will return to me again. This happened pretty recently, and because of it, I will be quitting my job at the end of the month. My current job is to deliver papers to homes in the mountains, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's tough, because I have to start at midnight in order to get all my deliveries done. It doesn't exactly pay well, but it's good to be working, especially when you're young. It's nice to have your own money, right? Anyway, like I said, I start at midnight and I don't finish until the sun comes up, and sometimes in the darker months, the sun doesn't come up at all. Being out in the mountains alone at night can be pretty spooky, as I'm sure you can imagine. I want to share my recent scary experience with you. It happened this winter. I'd gotten used to the rhythm of deliveries by that point. It was around winter time that the newspaper company I worked for was trying to expand their business. This meant that there would be more work for me, I was excited, at first, to earn a bit more money, but over time, it became more and more time-consuming. Basically, a subscription would come in, and then it would be down to me to deliver it to the customer. So I'm basically riding my bike around with a map, because signal is a no-go in the mountains. I don't mean a push bike, I mean a really low-quality motorbike, low CCs. The people who buy these subscriptions have an amazing ability to be unfindable. It never felt as if it was straightforward. I had one of these subscription jobs on that winter's night. I knew the address, and I knew it wasn't going to be an easy night. There were a few roads through the forest areas, and even worse was the fact that some of the roads were very narrow. I could barely ride my bike along them. I set off and rode my bike right up to the point where the narrow road began. Since it was winter, I figured it would be safer if I just parked the bike up and delivered the subscription on foot. There was a footpath after all. There was a post box at the end of the customer's drive. It was a short distance from the house. I started down the sloped road towards the post box, and then I froze in my tracks. I heard the sound of a dog barking. No. Not just one dog, 
It sounded like there were at least two. I thought not much of it, and approached the post box with the subscription in hand. It was still pitch black out at this point, despite it being the early morning. As I approached, I noticed a light turn on at the front door. There was an old lady stood outside under the porch. Seeing her gave me a fright. I thought to myself, oh wow, someone's super eager for the morning paper. I figured since she was out, I could literally just put the subscription in her hand. So I approached her. I stopped when she started yelling at me. Stop right there. What do you think you're doing? I'm delivering the newspaper and your subscription. The boss made us wear a uniform, and we had to have this ID card around our neck, as some customers, especially ones like this who live in remote areas, can be skeptic of people they don't know. Stranger danger. I raised my ID badge, as I assumed she could see me pretty well. You expect me to believe that? You think that's proof? She screamed at me. I could see the dogs, especially the whites of their teeth. They were bared at me while the animals snarled. The old woman then pulled out a pair of long gardening shears or scissors from behind her back and pointed them at me. I instinctively backed away. I just tried to remain as calm as possible. I wondered if she was suffering with some kind of disease, maybe something like dementia. If she came at me with those long scissors, I planned on pushing them away or trying to kick her in the abdomen. I practiced full contact karate. However, she was an old lady. I don't know if I could have done that to her. I hoped that it wouldn't come to that. I just said, well then, I will just leave this here and be on my way. With that, I turned to leave. I didn't get paid enough to deal with this rubbish. I upped my pace as the old lady was still shouting at me. She sounded as if she was getting riled up. The dogs were really barking at me now. I turned to look over my shoulder, and I saw her let go of their leashes. She was walking towards me, slashing the scissors through the air. She wasn't making any sense. I couldn't make out a single word she was shouting. It was time to run. I raced up the hill as I heard the dogs chasing me. I couldn't believe she literally released the hounds on me. I ran up the hill as fast as I could. I needed to get back to my motorbike. I got back to the bike, kicked out the stand and hopped on. I started the engine and had a look behind me. I saw the tips of the dog's heads coming up the slope and pulled away without looking back. It was really scary. To be honest, I think myself incredibly lucky to get out of there without any injuries. Those dogs wanted to bite me, I could tell. The old woman looked as if she would have joined in too. I imagined her plunging those large gardening scissors into my gut. I shudder at that thought now. After I delivered all of my newspapers and subscriptions, I spoke with my boss and told him about my close call. He decided that he would make contact with the customer to see what was going on. I could already imagine that he was going to take the side of the customer. It was just the kind of guy he was. However, he found that the customer's phone number was no longer in use. He decided to go out there himself and speak to the customer in person. I told him to watch out for the dogs. He said he would let me know how it went when I came into work next. I spoke to him the next day, and he told me that he went out there to meet the customer, but he found nothing but an abandoned house. He then made contact with the subscription company to find out why someone would want to send a subscription to an empty house. It was at this point we learned that the subscription company had fudged the numbers to make our company take their business. They wanted it to look like they had more customers than they did. They had a quota to fill so they gave out a couple of addresses of abandoned homes. Stupid. Who the hell is the woman with the dogs then? I have no idea. When I think back to how hate-filled her face was, it gives me the shivers. Hence my resignation from my newspaper job. I'm working until the end of the month, so I hope I don't get sent anywhere near the scissor woman's house. I only have a few more days of work left.
When I went back to my hometown last year, something really weird happened. It started when the neighbor across the street warned me that there was a suspicious person in the area. Apparently someone was going around ringing people's doorbells at around 1am in the neighborhood. My neighbor said that they ignored the doorbell at first since they were in bed as it was so late. Everyone in their house was in bed asleep. The doorbell kept ringing, so my neighbor's husband got out of bed to see what was going on. He took his phone with him so his wife could listen. He asked through the door in a quiet voice, Who is it? Is there some sort of emergency? Then a man's voice responded, Ah, I made a promise to Sarah. Can you let me in? There was no Sarah in the house or in my neighbor's family, and because it was a newly built house, there was no former resident called Sarah either. So he explained this to the stranger at the door and told him to get lost. But it's a promise. I... I remember it well, the stranger said. Well, I have a promise for you to remember. If you don't go away, I'm calling the cops, okay? The neighbor's husband called the cops anyway because the guy outside didn't show any signs of leaving. The police arrived quickly, but the man at the door was nowhere to be seen. So the neighbor warned us to be careful, just in case he came back. We spoke about it at dinner that night, and I remember my parents were making sure everything was locked when the sun went down. Later that night, my dad and I were in the living room watching TV. It was just after midnight. The doorbell rang. I really didn't expect it, and I could tell neither did my dad. There we were, two full-grown men, afraid of the doorbell. Before assuming that it was the weirdo who called at my neighbor's house, I actually went and checked. We didn't have any way to check outside, you know, like those ring doorbells, so I crept over to the curtain. I pulled the curtain back just enough to create a gap to look outside. Through the gap in the curtains, I saw a man wearing a hat and a big dark brown overcoat. He was wearing boots as well. His face was hidden by the turned up collar of his overcoat. I couldn't really see his face. I watched as he pushed the doorbell again. My dad whispered to me to not get caught looking at the guy, so I immediately shut the curtain. This guy was definitely suspicious, there was no doubt. I mean you wouldn't want him at your door, let me put it that way. We decided to call the police since the neighbors were already worried about the guy. But until the police arrived, we thought we would keep him busy since last time he bolted. For about three minutes straight, he rang our doorbell. He was so persistent. My dad had had enough of this, so he went out to the hallway and approached the door. He stood before the frosted glass and asked, Who are you? I'm the guy who promised to meet Sarah. What's your name? Um, well... Is this an emergency? I promised Sarah. I really want to come in. The guy talked in circles. Of course there was no Sarah in our house either. If you told him that though, he would just keep talking about his promise. It got you nowhere. He kept saying that he remembered his promise. While this was going on, I called the police discreetly. I wanted to see this guy get taken away but he left before the police car arrived. We then heard the knocking at the door. Police, the officer said. We have a door in front of the actual front door to our house, you know, like a porch. I was amazed to hear the knocking from the officer on our actual front door, not on the porch. When the weird guy was at the door, I was certain that the porch door was shut, and I didn't hear it open or close when he left. This door can only be locked from the inside. How the hell was that possible? I wondered. It creeped me out, but my dad didn't seem to care all that much. He calmly explained the situation to the officer. He gave a really accurate description of the guy too, and informed the cop that this happened in the neighborhood last night. The officer said that he hadn't seen anyone suspicious in the area. This guy knew how to get away and fast. However, there were footprints in the snow. The cop said he would follow them and see if he could find anything. He promised that there would be an increase in patrols and asked us to report back to him instantly 
If the guy came back, he cautioned us, said to try and avoid going out alone late at night, and to double and triple check the doors are locked. This cop wasn't a new guy. He was older than my dad, and something about the situation had him spooked. I was getting very nervous. There was something very sinister about this guy looking for Sarah. My mother watched the whole thing. She was sat on the stairs. I turned to her and asked if she definitely locked the door outside the front door, that porch door I mentioned, and she was adamant that she did. My dad could sense our nerves. He tried to laugh it off. Don't worry, guys. Sorry we couldn't get him. After we all confirmed and were happy that all the doors were locked, we went to bed. I couldn't sleep much, but I was relieved to see a police car patrolling the area at around 3 a.m. from my window. The next day, we heard that someone else in the neighborhood's doorbell rang. My dad was really angry at the police. He said they must not be doing their jobs right if they hadn't caught the guy yet. Four more days passed where others in the area reported the late night doorbell rings. Everyone said the same thing. A stranger came to their door asking for Sarah and asking to come in. He wasn't caught. The thing I find weirdest about it is this. Not one person was able to describe what his face looked like. The stranger was the stuff of nightmares. I spent New Year's with my family and left to go back to my home, worried for them. About a week later, I called my mom to check on her and I got an update on the situation. The house across the street from us found a note in their mailbox that read, Sarah's not here, but I found her. Thank you very much. The letters were painted by a brush, like calligraphy. I'm wondering if we will get an apology letter too, or what it means if we don't get one. I'm sorry, it sounds like a mundane story, but imagine if it happened to you. A stranger whose face no one saw in the neighborhood, going around in the dead of night, talking nonsense, and trying to talk their way into your home. I don't like it. I don't like it that he found Sarah either. I got a job in the beginning of last year. It lasted for six months, and this experience was near the end. To start off with, I would walk home in the dark, right out the back door, because there was a stretch of asphalt, a small hill, and then a sidewalk path leading into my neighborhood nearby. Even though it was a five-minute walk and through a neighborhood, my mother got me some mace in case of emergency for when I was walking home. Out the back door, there was a small nook before a small road on the edge. You had to walk forward and to the right to get to the dumpster, and there was a tiny parking lot in the nook to the left. It was a closing shift for me and another worker, I had a good relationship with him, and we considered ourselves friends. As it got time to take out the trash and clean the place, my co-worker started on the dishes while I took out the trash. We had quite a few bags, so I had to take multiple trips. I go out the back door and see a car. I'm really bad at car names, and it was sort of farther away, so I don't know the car name, but I did see that it was lighter in color. The car's driving very close to the little hill at the end of the asphalt, and as I watch, the car stops and the headlights go off. I think to myself, well that's not great, better keep an eye out. I go back inside for the next load of trash, and when I come out, the car has gone from the edge of the road to the farthest parking stall to the left, much, much closer, but the lights are still off. This is the point when I knew this situation was not good. So as soon as I finish throwing the bags into the dumpster and have gotten close to the door, I announce loudly that I'm getting my mace. Spoiler alert, this was probably what saved me. I grab my mace from my purse inside and then go up to my coworker and ask him if he will take out the trash with me because there's a creepy car in the parking lot. So we open the back door, my mace in hand, the car is nowhere to be seen. I apologize and tell him what happened, 
and he believes me and still helps me out with the trash. When we're done cleaning and ready to go home, he offers to drive me home and I decline. I ask if he'll walk me to the sidewalk, stating that I have the mace for a reason and will use it if I have to. I get home just fine. After that, I never took out the trash without bringing my mace with me. I even remember warning another female co-worker that if she was taking out the trash, she could borrow my mace. I live in a pretty small town, and I have a pretty quiet life, in all honesty. I have an office job, and I work some pretty long hours, so I don't really go out all that much at night. On the night that this experience took place, I got a call from a friend of mine. To be honest, I almost didn't pick it up, but I'm really glad that I did. She had called to say that she needed a ride. I didn't mind, I didn't have any plans. She needed to be picked up from a big supermarket. I guess that she had bought a ton of things and she didn't want to take all of that on the crowded train home with her. I was happy to help, but it seemed a little late to be shopping. It was around 11pm when she called. I needed a couple of things too, so I headed into the store to meet her. The supermarket was almost empty at that time of night, but it is usually really busy during the day. We got our things, paid, and headed back to the parking lot. I think that it was about midnight at that point. A group of men came out of a nearby game center. It's like an arcade. I think these guys came out because the place was about to close. They headed to their cars while talking to each other and looking over at us. My friend said to me that she wasn't feeling well, and we decided to get going. We pulled out of the parking lot and a couple of the other cars followed on behind us. That was normal though, it was closing time, and the lights in the retail park were all going out. I noticed that my friend was quiet, I guess that was just because she said she didn't feel well. I looked over at her, and she looked pale. She looked at me and said, I think I know the guy in the car behind us. I didn't think much of it when she said that. I thought that it was just some coincidence. I went to look in the mirrors to see if I knew him too, and then my friend suddenly said, don't look back. I realized why she was so uncomfortable now, and I tried to pull over to let the guy pass, but then my friend snapped at me. She said, don't stop the car, whatever you do. I did as she asked, and continued, that's my ex-boyfriend. If you stop, I'm scared he'll come and try to open the door. Okay, this is serious, I thought. I made up my mind not to drive down highways. I wanted to avoid traffic lights, which would mean we would have to stop. When my car stops, the doors automatically unlock while the car is in drive. So I decided to take the back roads. And man, that was a bad idea. Thinking back on it now, I should have probably gone to a late night diner or convenience store. You know, somewhere bright with lots of people around but I think that my friend would have freaked out if I even tried that. So I kept driving down these countryside lanes, the back roads, until my friend calmed down a little. The car behind was following every turn we made. The further we went from the city, the fewer cars were seen on the road with us. It got to a point where it was literally just us. The car behind was speeding up too, forcing me to go faster and faster. I asked my friend, why is this guy chasing us? And she said, I think I made him really angry. I don't want to stay at my place alone tonight. She then began to cry, and I didn't really get my answer. The situation we were in was getting more and more unnerving. I didn't know how it was going to end, and I didn't want to consider the possibilities. I kept driving. There wasn't much else I could do. But then something occurred to me. I had quite a small and light car, and the car behind was much bigger. What if I went down a narrow road? Maybe that would stop the guy from chasing us. He would be scared to damage his car. I decided to take that risk and turn down the next narrow road I found. I kept an eye on my navigation system to try and find a way back out of there. I didn't want to be stuck down some dead end road. 
I needed to keep driving or at least get to someplace safe because I didn't want to send my friend home in the state she was in. I thought about trying the police, but I knew that the police wouldn't do anything about the guy. It seems like they only help after the fact, never before. My friend was sobbing next to me, but she stopped to apologize for getting me into this mess. I mean, I should have sensed something was up. She hadn't ever called me for a ride from a supermarket before. She said she called me because she didn't have anyone else she could turn to. I told her that it was okay. I just wanted to know where I should be driving her. And she replied, Don't take me back to my house. If we did just lose him, that's where he'll be waiting for me. Can you take me to the train station? I said that I could. But she could also stay at mine for the night. She vehemently refused. She said she had caused enough trouble. I realized something at that point. The stuff she had bought at the supermarket looked like she had been planning to run away. She even had some camping equipment. I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't fully understand the situation, but I knew one thing. The man who was chasing us was very dangerous if running away from her life in our town seemed to be her preferred option. She said that she would stay in a hotel that night. She would get off the train far away and lay low. She was going to hotel hop too. Make sure her location changed every now and then. I felt for her, I really did. She said that she felt like he was always watching her and he knew how to find her. That's just so scary to me. I didn't want to ask about her ex, but I was curious as to why she was so scared of him finding her. I said something like, he sounds like a real horrible guy. And she replied, It's not just him who'll be looking for me. It's his group of friends too. That was frightening. Something really bad was going on. I managed to follow the narrow back roads back to the city. And I got her to the station, like she asked. I was confident that he wasn't following us anymore. I felt for sure that he had given up. She got out at the station, and we found out that the next available train would come in at 6 a.m., I couldn't leave her there for that long in the state she was in. I asked her to come with me to a McDonald's. I thought that we could talk things over a little, and I was right. She told me a little more about the situation and that ex of hers. She told me that he didn't take being broken up with very well. He attacked her. He made threats against her friends and family and tried to use fear to coerce her into getting back with him. He was also convinced that she had been with his friends. He said all this after she found out he had been on a bunch of dating and hookup apps. One of her single friends showed her his profile and she confronted him. She said that his friends are all a bunch of stalkers like him too. I was shocked and finding it a little hard to follow her story. Personally, I think they could have been as bad as one another with the cheating by the sounds of things. She turned to me and said, I want you to forget about me, okay? I'm not going to have anything more to do with you. I mean, it's very sad to lose a friend, of course, but equally, I didn't want to get involved with these weird guys and be chased by random men at night. I was feeling conflicted. She began to cry again, and she kept saying, It's really my fault this time. After dropping her off at the train station and helping her onto the platform with her bags, she turned to me and gave me 10,000 yen and said, Thank you. I'll always be grateful for tonight. And that was the last time I ever saw her. I had tears in my eyes as I drove home from the station that night, but they felt like they instantly dried up when I noticed a certain car in the lane next to mine. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had followed me earlier was still out here looking for us. I got goosebumps, but I tried not to make it obvious that I had noticed him. By some miracle, he didn't appear to notice me or my car. And after four or five pretty frightening minutes, he turned off in a different direction to me. As soon as I got home, I completely crashed out. It was the first time in a long time that I had been awake that late. Despite everything that happened that night, I'm glad that I answered her call. I mean, what might have happened to her? If I didn't, is something I don't want to ask myself. I never heard from her again. Fast forward to three months later, and I got a call from my friend's number. I was really interested to see how she was doing, so I answered it straight away. I quickly found out that it wasn't my friend on the other end of the phone. 
It sounded like someone wasn't even using a phone. By that, I mean it was kind of computer-like. The voice at the other end of the line asked the following question. Hi, have you heard from my... The man calling from her number seemed to be polite and friendly. But I knew he was likely one of the guys who was chasing her and me that night. I was a little scared to say anything at first, but then I managed to say, Actually, I haven't heard from her in a very long time, so sorry I can't help you. Ah, uh, is that so? Well, then I'm sorry to have bothered you then. And the call ended. I was so scared, even though it wasn't happening to me. I had a way to contact her through a separate messaging app, but I didn't dare use it, just in case. One of those guys, or her ex, had a way of tracking her messages. I hoped she managed to start a new life. And although that call was scary, it told me that they hadn't managed to track her down. If you are out there, stay safe, my friend. This is a long one, so buckle up, fold those tray tables, and put your seats in the upright position. I was a flight attendant 20 years ago. The flight that made me quit was from South Bend, Indiana, to Minneapolis. It started out with a funny story of having an adult star on our little regional flight. 50 seat CRJ, I was the only flight attendant. I got a chuckle of how amped the gate agent was about it. He was obviously a fan. Anyways, everything else was normal other than it not being a very full flight. We take off and I'm in the jump seat, chilling and waiting for the first ding to tell me we're out of sterile cockpit over 10,000 feet high when the vibration system suddenly kicks on. It was then that my oh shit reflexes kicked in because all I can smell is burning, though there isn't any smoky haze. For a hot minute, I thought I was imagining it, but when I looked up, one of the passengers in front of me makes eye contact and gives me a look that confirms I'm not the only one smelling it. No one else notices. Again, it was odd that the first three rows were vacant since the flight was only half full. So for the first time ever, I reached up and grabbed the phone to the cockpit and hit the emergency button, which alerts the cockpit but not any of the passengers unless they know what the flashing light means above my head. The captain answers, and it sounds like he's Darth Vader, since the two of them have their oxygen masks on. I said quietly into the phone, What the fuck is happening? They tell me they don't know, and they need me to get up and check behind the galley cart, the lavatory, and then pull up to the hatch to the avionics bay, since they can't figure out where it's coming from, and there aren't any alarms going off. Apparently, air traffic control couldn't see from the ground if we were on fire either. So I try to as calmly as I can move through the cabin without making any sort of scene, even though I am pretty much thinking we're all going to die at this point, and my throat is burning from breathing in the fumes. Again, no one noticed, and I'm grateful seeing as the three of us crew members were on the same, we're going to die wavelength. Literally nobody even batted an eyelash at me crawling on the floor and pulling up the hatch to the avionics bay. I still have no idea how no one thought that was out of the ordinary. So there was nothing that I could see on my side. No visible fire or smoke. I call back to the cockpit and they say that thankfully they're going to let us land and that while we wait for clearance, they're going to vent the cabin to clear some of the fumes. At this point, I buckle myself back into the jump seat and try not to look freaked out as I face the 25 souls in the seats in front of me. As the captain announces to the aircraft that there are fumes and we need to vent them as we need to get back to the airport due to mechanical issues. Yeah, blank stares are aimed in my direction and I just smile and nod as if this is standard procedure. None of this is standard. So the venting is supposed to feel like a little puff of air next to your ears, but it felt like one of those air cannons punching you in the side of your face, which was just delightful. But soon after, we were on the ground safely, and I get to work, getting everyone off this missile to hell, 
so I can have my own freakout moment in private. The two pilots and myself wind up chain-smoking out in front of the airport and not speaking to each other for about a half an hour. What caused all of this was that the engine had been washed out that morning at the maintenance bay, but it was not rinsed or ran properly to let the chemicals burn off or rinse out. That was what was causing the fumes. An hour later, we were back on the same aircraft and flew back to Minneapolis without issue. I quit the week after. The second scary encounter being a flight attendant was hearing the warning messages to the captain during takeoff once. Imagine being in the jump seat and hearing right behind you, winds here, winds here, pull up, pull up, while trying to act like everything is cool. I hated that airline so damn much. My best friend at school and I used to go over to one another's home often. His family was always really welcoming and nice to me. I was encouraged to turn up whenever I felt like it. On occasion, I would turn up and my friend wouldn't be there, but his mom would be like, Oh hey, come on in, it's great to see you. Why don't you hang out here for a bit? I just have to do a little bit of shopping. So could you keep an eye on the place? There's snacks in the fridge. My friend's mom and my mom were very close, so we had a great relationship between our families. I would often stay home for her if no one was home. This experience takes place when I was asked by my mom to go over to my friend's house with some vegetables our grandmother grew in her garden. It was about lunchtime when I headed over. I pressed the doorbell to their home, but no one came to the door. I guessed that no one was in. That was fine, because I was entrusted with the location of their spare key. They hid it in case of emergencies. On times like this, when they were out, and I was sent to return something, I knew to leave it on their living room table, and lock up and return the key where I found it. It was pretty routine. So I took the key out and unlocked the door and headed inside. As soon as I got inside, I sensed the presence of someone in the house with me. I instantly knew that there was someone upstairs. I don't know, I guess I heard a noise or something. I thought, this is out of the ordinary. Someone should be down here, and it was Sunday after all. I guessed that my friend or his mom was upstairs, perhaps ill, and then I somehow convinced myself that one of them had collapsed or something. So I set the bag of vegetables down in the entryway, and then headed in and upstairs. I thought that there could be a thief or an intruder up there, so I did my best attempt of being one with the shadows. In my mind, I moved as silently as a ninja. I was a kid, so lay off. Let me just explain the upstairs floor plan. If you're upstairs, from the back, there's a storage room, my friend's room and the toilet, and then my friend's mom's room. If you were to crane your head from the stairs, you'd pretty much see and hear anything that's going on up there. When I stealthily got to the top of the stairs, I didn't look because I heard some strange sound. It's like a pa, pa, pa sound. Maybe it was an air leak, like the sound of a tire being deflated. It was really weird. I heard the sound then travel across the hall towards my friend's room. I thought, oh man. There's something weird going on here. I don't think that it's my friend or his mom making that noise. I just climbed the rest of the stairs and headed towards my friend's room. I was careless or brave, but it happened. I craned my head around the door frame and I saw a man in his room. He was spitting on the floor. That was the source of the sound. It was incredibly gross. I was completely lost for words. It was like I was dreaming. He spun around and looked my way. He didn't seem at all surprised by my presence. He even gave me a cheerful greeting. Oh, hello. I felt awkward enough to respond. Oh, hi. That's all I could muster up. I was still very confused. A few seconds or so crawled by, and then I asked, What are you doing? Oh, just keeping my ex in her place, showing her who's boss. 
This is how you do it. I looked around my friend's room, and his toys, his dresser, his chest of drawers, and his clothes and his wardrobe were covered in this man's spit. I was stunned. There was someone who was completely out of their mind stood there in my friend's bedroom. A thought jumped into my mind. Get the police. I ran downstairs and grabbed my grandmother's vegetables and ran to the police station. Three officers accompanied me back to my friend's house. They headed upstairs, but they said that they couldn't find anyone in the house. My friend and his mom, who'd been out, arrived back to their home to be greeted by the flashing lights of a police car and officers holding notebooks. By the time they'd heard my story and heard from the officers, they were both in tears. It turns out that the man I had seen in my friend's bedroom spitting on everything was my friend's dad. Apparently he'd been searching for my friend's home after he got divorced from his wife. I have never met someone with that much malice. I never thought that an adult would do that to their own flesh and blood. Well, my friend's mom said to her son, we will throw out everything he spat on. My friend reacted at first with anger. He actually had to be restrained by an understanding officer. I helped calm him down, and I'm not ashamed to say that I had tears in my eyes too. My family gave some money to my friend's mom. His dad even spat on his underwear. Can you believe that? We wanted to help, but not pity. The money we gave them was given out of love, not obligation, righteousness, or sympathy. There are decent people out in the world, and I personally would never let that bastard's actions cloud my impression of those who do good out there. This is why the story is so hard to share. There's no lesson, there's nothing to be garnered, except from disappointment in the man who committed those foul deeds in his ex-wife's empty house. My dad and my brother took turns in picking my friend and his mom up from work and school and dropping them off. I was too young for a license. The police let their intentions be known too. My friend's dad never came back. My friend has an older sister, and we all think she's being stalked. It's ongoing, but I want to share what's happening currently. My friend's sister has been staying with my friend for a while now to get away from it all and repel her stalker. She said it's like living in a nightmare. I wanted to do something nice for her, so I offered to take them both out for dinner to take their minds off of things. We sat down to dinner, and things were going well until I saw my friend's sister's face drop. She began to tremble. I felt bad for asking them to come out. Maybe it was too soon. Then she muttered. He sat behind me. I looked behind her, and I saw an old man with an unnaturally creepy smile. He was peering towards our table. He made me feel nauseous. He was just gross. He was the stalker. My friend had seen this guy following her sister before, so we were beyond it being a coincidence or a case of paranoia. My friend had had enough. She stood up and went over to his table and said loudly, If you don't stop following my sister, then I'm going to the police. A few tables of people looked over, but the old man just sat there smiling that insane smile. After a few moments, he got up and stepped away from his table and left. His expression didn't change. He just kept smiling. We thought that that bit of public embarrassment might be enough to put the creep off and make him leave my friend's sister alone. We were convinced it would work, and it turned out to be a correct prediction. Over the coming days, we would all joke about how easy it was. Everything came to a standstill for her sister, and a sense of normality was resumed in her life. However... Just as soon as it ended, it seemed to start again. This time, the old man's target of torment was different. This time he was stalking my friend and not her sister, and he was a little more cunning in the method of stalking this time round. The old man began to haunt her life, 
He would just appear any place she went, but always at a distance or appearing inconspicuous. I will give you some examples. If she was out taking a walk or simply heading home, the old man would appear on his bike riding towards her or from behind her. He would smile that creepy smile of his as he passed her by. He would be there during rush hour in the subway where crowds are gathered. It made her feel as if she had no escape from him. In places where it was difficult to move or get away quickly, she'd see that weirdo and his smile. Enough was enough. My friend went to the police. Unfortunately, they weren't able to help. They said that because he actually hasn't done anything except smile at her and her sister, they couldn't do anything. She left the station frustrated and with a feeling of vulnerability. The old man and his behavior got worse. He was everywhere. She thought that the police might have been able to intervene when she saw him at college on campus, but again, they weren't able to help or offer any kind of protection. To the untrained eye, he was just an old man who was walking around smiling. What's the harm in that? She tried to mobilize all of her friends to help to discourage his behavior, but to our surprise, some of her friends didn't believe her. They said she was grasping at straws. She must have felt quite alone at the time. I believed her though. I had first-hand experience. I saw that creep with my own eyes. Plus, anyone who knew my friend well enough would say she's far from a liar or an exaggerator. It was helpless. Every day she grew more nervous and worn down, and every day the old man just smiled at her. He never did anything, he just watched her and smiled. She eventually dropped out of college and has grown less and less responsive to my calls and messages. I haven't really heard from her lately, and it's really worrying me. I feel as if we are right on the edge of something happening. Maybe I should speak up and yell at him like she did for her sister. But if I did that, wouldn't he just start stalking me? I don't know. Recently, I got in contact with her sister, and I asked how she's doing. She thought that she was just wrapped up with studies. She didn't know what had been going on. I don't know what will come of this, but I'm hoping she's just laying low for a while. I hope that creep hasn't escalated his stalking. This was a horrible thing to experience. It happened when I was running late. I finished work later than I wanted to that night, so I was rushing home through the neon-lit downtown area of my city. I saw something as I was rushing that made me stop in my tracks. There was a little girl in one of the alleyways. She must have only been about eight or nine years old. This part of the city at this time of night was no place for a girl of her age, I thought to myself as I looked her way. I noticed that she was stood in an alleyway next to a well-established gentleman's club. Stripping and much more went on in there, so I'm told. Anyway, she shouldn't have been there. I was a little worried for her. She was wearing a red school bag and it looked to be filled to the brim. It looked quite the burden for the little girl to be carrying. I wondered if she'd gotten herself lost. She began to head further into the alley and I went after her. I didn't need to second guess myself. I had to find out if she was all right. She was walking in the darkness of the alley all alone. Her head was down. Is everything all right? Is your mother nearby? I asked tentatively. She said nothing, just shook her head to indicate no. How about your dad? Is he around? Her face looked as if it turned to stone in that moment. He's so far away. What the hell, I thought to myself. The little girl turned around and started heading off further into the alley. I reached out to stop her and I ended up grabbing her by her bag. I must have caught a clasp or a clip on her bag because before I knew it, the contents of her bag spill out and cascade onto the floor. In her bag, amongst her textbooks, was a large transparent bag of white powder. No way. 
I heard myself mutter softly. I called the cops. I had to. Something wasn't right here, and I was really worried about the girl and why she had what looked like to be drugs in her bag. I heard from the police afterwards, and it turns out that the young girl was being forced to work as a drug courier by her stepdad. He was apparently part of the Yakuza. Her biological father was in prison, and her mother had deserted her and left her with the gangster years ago. Her stepfather was arrested, and the girl was taken into care. The officer mentioned that she will likely go to an orphanage. I hope she's doing well and is happy. To think that three adults let her down so terribly really puts a knot in my stomach. I really feel for that girl. No childhood should involve being a drugs mule. This world can be so cruel sometimes. I work overnights at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening, but tonight was too much. The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line, and my cook and I went out back to smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through town that are usually harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. Later I came out again to smoke and throw away some trash in the dumpster that's next to the field. It was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard that scream again. As I'm walking away from the dumpster, I hear, Hey, come here. Hey, come here. It was much closer than when we heard this person screaming for the first time. I went inside and got my co-worker, who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it out into the field, which again, not smart, and we know that, but we couldn't see where he was. But the guy kept saying, Hey girl, come here. I called the cops by this point, because it was just too weird. As soon as I get off the phone with them, this guy comes walking out of the field. He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat, and my co-worker and a customer ran back inside because this guy was hauling ass across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door, and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go. The man was acting erratically, yelling at my cook and said, I'll end your life the next time I see you, fucker. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon, but I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops get him down the road, and an officer came by and basically said the guy's homeless and not mentally stable. No shit. We told them everything that happened, and the cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything they could do, and he wouldn't give them his name, so they let him go. Basically, it ended with, Oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back again hauling ass across the neighborhood parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming, yelling, Hey, come here, again and again. We got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know he's still back there because I caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in in the morning and I'm going to try to convince her to let me take a picture of him off of the security tapes so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field he's camping out in also backs up to a middle school, but the cops said, again, there was nothing they could do. Hopefully he moves on and leaves us alone, or the cops can get him on something where no one gets hurt. This happened a few years ago and still rattles me when I think about it. For context, I'm a female, and at the time I was around 25 years old. I worked in an office of around 150 people. One day I receive an email from a co-worker, but I didn't recognize his name. 
the email basically said something along the lines of, I'm sorry if I did something to offend you. Given the situation, if you prefer never to see me again, I understand and will avoid you in the kitchen. I was extremely perplexed as I had no idea who this guy was, but I must have done something to offend this person, right? I responded back along the lines of, I'm so sorry if I offended you. Sometimes I zone out and it can be perceived as if I'm rude, so I apologize. After this response, he started getting irritated, basically denying my apology and acting all passive-aggressive about it. I wish I kept a screenshot of these emails, but basically he was confusing the hell out of me with this misunderstanding. So I sent him a message suggesting we resolve this in person. Big mistake. He agrees to meet me in the kitchen in the office. I go there and immediately see a tall, 30-ish year old guy who I've seen around but never met before. I explain to him that I apologize, but I truthfully have no idea who he is, have never even met him before, and don't want any issues. What happens after made me very concerned. His face flushed bright red and he looked visibly angry. He was stuttering and denying that I didn't know who he was, and then says, You've been staring at me for months. When you made eye contact with me, you gasped and ran away. Okay, what the fuck? I strongly denied this and told him it was a mistake, and he kept insisting that I've been staring at him for months and he could always see me doing it. Eventually, I realized he couldn't see reason and decided to end the conversation. Upon reflection, I realized that it's possible he thought I was staring at him because when you walk into the hallway next to the kitchen, there is a room with glass at the end where a bunch of desks are. His desk would be right in the line of sight if I was walking down the hallway and he had a funny sticker on his desk I'd sometimes look at. But this seems like a huge stretch. After this incident, a co-worker pulls me over and asks me why I was talking to him. I explained the situation. She looked scared and told me that last year, he appeared in the office in bathrobe, raving like a madman at people. And he wasn't fired. Was I dealing with someone in the midst of psychosis? Was he dangerous? No clue. But I reported this ASAP to my manager, who took it seriously enough to tell his manager. I don't think he works there anymore. Thankfully, I left this company two weeks later, but I was extra cautious to not go anywhere near that guy. I encountered this on the 2nd of January when I was asleep in my room. I'm an 18-year-old female living in Singapore with my parents. In my family, it's only my mom, my stepdad, and myself living in a small apartment. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child. My parents took the smaller room and I had the master bedroom, which has a big window that's facing the back of our house. From my bedroom, there's a big space outside of our window that's between every apartment unit over here, so there's no way someone would unintentionally stand near my window. You have to walk in and go for a few turns before coming here. I eventually fell asleep at around 11 p.m. and I forgot to close my blackout curtains for my window. Even though it's a frosted window, anyone can see through it if they stood close enough to it for a closer look. Exactly at 1.23 a.m., I heard three loud knocks on my bedroom window, which eventually woke me up as I'm a very light sleeper. Where I'm sleeping, my window is on the right corner, and I can see whatever shadow that projects through it, day or night. On that night, the only light I had on was my table lamp that was facing me at its highest brightness. At first, I was sleeping while facing my room door, so I had an automatic response to turn my head and look at what's knocking on my window. To my surprise, I saw a silhouette of a man's head that was clearly visible on my window. I had goosebumps. I froze because I was unsure of what to do as the curtains were wide open, so obviously that man's intention was to look at me through my window. Despite my parents' room being right next to mine, 
I went into shock and had to call my mom to help check if I was tripping and to also close the curtains for me. I told her what I saw afterwards. In the end, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the meantime to calm myself down. I felt really uneasy that night. I couldn't go back to sleep. Since I stayed awake that same night, I heard three more knocks coming from my bedroom at 3 a.m., which, of course, I had to assume it came from the window. Before this happened, my curtains were already closed and blocking my window's view, so I thought that it would be fine for me to go ahead and get a little look on who or what knocked on my window. The only difference this time is that the knock was louder but slower, like the ones you would experience if you're in an old haunted house. Come to think of it now, I wish I stayed in my living room. I had my face and hand holding onto the window since I had to get a closer and clearer look, since I didn't see a silhouette when I was standing from a distance from the window, and me still being paranoid from what happened hours before. I saw a man who was around 180 plus meters standing outside of my window, about 4 meters apart, standing and staring right at me who's currently frozen in place at the window when I saw him. He was wearing long gray pants and a black t-shirt. He was really, really pale. It looked as if he had no expression when he saw me. By the time it happened, I wasn't really sure if it was the same man that stood outside at around 1.30 a.m. As tired as I was that night, I knew I wasn't hearing things or seeing hallucinations. I was perfectly wide awake when I saw that man. Moral of the story, always check your windows before going to bed, and it's best to get a blackout curtain to protect yourself. I am a psychiatrist. And during my training years, I worked for six months at a ward treating patients with depressive and anxiety disorders. It was an old building which had been housing psychiatric patients since the mid-1920s. On our floor, we had 13 beds and a nursing station, a living room, and a few conference rooms. One day, a few weeks in, I am interviewing a patient who, when asked about sleeping patterns, tells me she heard a baby crying at night, waking her up. There are no babies in that hospital, as the place is situated far away from housing areas and there were restricted visiting hours. Afterwards, the nurse pulls me aside and tells me that the baby crying thing is not a psychotic symptom. She is very serious about this, but won't elaborate. I kind of shrug it off, as either way it does not change the diagnostic or treatment, and I forget about the experience. Around three months into my stay, I sit in the nurse's station and three nurses behind me are talking. One of them says, she's very active today. And another responds with, really? Oh, I hadn't noticed. I turn around and ask them who they are talking about. They look at each other and then one of them hesitantly says, well, there is a baby here. She cries sometimes. I of course say, no but they just kind of shrug and smile. Not 30 seconds later, I hear it. It sounded far away, but not too far. A cry, clearly a baby's cry, sounding like it is separated from us by maybe two or three walls. I'm perplexed and look at the nurses. They look at me like, told you so. I of course ask about this, but they can't say anything else. But this faint baby cry is there and has been there always. Since then, I heard it maybe two to three times a week. I told a new doctor about it who laughed. However, a few weeks into her stay, she came to me white as a sheet and told me she heard it on her coffee break. All the nurses just kind of knew about it, and being in psychiatry, hearing that kind of stuff is not really something you brag about. I was transferred and haven't heard it since. I think about it sometimes, but I don't really know what to make of it.
For some context, I'm female, and this happened a couple of years back when I was around 26. This happened in a big city. I was out with my dog, a little chihuahua, heading to a vet appointment, but I was pretty anxious and focused on getting to the vet ASAP. I was wearing a mask because it was in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic, and I was wearing a t-shirt with my university on it. I suddenly lock eyes with a guy on the sidewalk, headed in the opposite direction, and he comes up to me while I was walking and says, You went to NYU? I said yes, and he started to walk with me along the sidewalk, the opposite way he was headed. He was right by my side, explaining what a great school it is, and how he's in grad school there. Somehow I felt like this was very unlikely. He looked 30 plus and didn't seem to know anything about the college and didn't give any details. He starts asking me more questions and at this point I'm speed walking down the block and he just keeps walking right next to me. My dog at this point is getting really antsy and I'm incredibly uncomfortable as I have no clue who this guy is or why he's trying to walk with me on a busy sidewalk. Suddenly my dog starts to bark and growl at him aggressively and he doesn't seem to care and just keeps walking with me. At this point, it's been like five to ten street blocks with me trying to keep my dog from growling and barking and him asking me questions. I tried to explain I'm going to a vet appointment, but I was nervous. Eventually, he says, can I see you without your mask? I legit flat out say no, to which his eyebrows go up like he's shocked. He keeps pushing, and I keep flatly telling him no. Then he tells me he wants me to go get coffee with him and inviting me to go with him. I decline and tell him I have a boyfriend and assured him I was getting engaged soon. My dog is still flipping an absolute shit, barking aggressively at him. But finally, after like 10 streets, after he realized I'm taken, this guy departs and leaves me alone. Now, I know the most likely explanation is, guy thought I was pretty, wanted to ask me out on a date, and he was awkward. But holy shit, please do not follow a young woman down 10 streets who you don't know. It was unnerving, and I still remember this years later. I guess he made an impression. When I was around 12, I lived with my mother in a granny flat. The flat was connected to the old person's house and was built by his son. The neighbor was called Harry. There were three ways to enter the yard, one being from Harry's backyard, one being by the driveway, and the other being the main entrance. The gate at the driveway was broken and we kept Harry's gate blocked. Harry was an odd guy, around 70 years old, and always gave me and my mom the creeps. But I remember one day, when me and my mom were outside, he started talking to us over the gate and got on what we later learnt was a step stool, and my mom told me to go inside. Another time was when I was taking out the rubbish, and when I turned around, he was behind me, just staring. I tried to leave, but he dragged me into a conversation, and after a while, my mom showed up and asked what took so long. And when she saw Harry, she told me to go into the house, and when she came back, she told me that if he ever does that again, to run away. The third thing I remember is when I was home alone, and I heard the gate open, so I took a look outside. I saw Harry walking around the yard. I ran into my mom's room and stayed quiet. After a while, I heard knocking, and the gate opened and shut, indicating that he left. The final issue was when me and my mom were mowing the lawn, when I felt I was being watched. I looked up, and there was Harry standing near his back door, just staring. After a minute, my mom realized I was staring at something and looked up. She immediately got mad, telling me to get inside and lock the door. My mom started yelling at him, saying, What are you doing? Go away. Leave us alone. If you keep this up, I'm calling the cops. I don't really remember what happened next, but after a few months, we moved, and it was the biggest relief ever. My mom told Harry's son what had happened after my mom yelled at him, 
and I'm guessing the son told his dad to leave us alone, but it was definitely creepy. To give context, I used to be a 911 dispatcher for a small city. We dispatched all law, fire, EMS for the entire county, and within this county were multiple law agencies. I had been there for about three months or so when I met him, Jake. Jake had recently transferred from a big department in California and landed himself randomly at our department. It didn't make much sense as to why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was just time for him to move to a smaller and less dangerous department. Him and I quickly became close and would chat almost every day after I got off shift. Within a few months, it became apparent that we liked each other and our flirting progressed into something more serious. Fast forward a few months later, and it turns out he was doing some inappropriate things to photos and videos of me whilst he was actively on duty. This, and a few other things he'd kept hidden on duty, led to him losing his license and leaving. During the process of his termination, his sergeant had suggested I get a protective order against him, as he'd made threatening statements previously towards me. Things such as, you better be telling the truth, I'll find out Tuesday if you're lying to me. I had began to fill out the paperwork, and was told I had a temporary protective order on him in the meantime, but I don't think I ever did. About two weeks after his termination, he calls me to catch up. The entire call is like an old friend to an old friend. What am I doing for work? Do I have a boyfriend now? But progressively turns more personal. When does my shift end? What do I drive? Being 18 and naive, I treated him like I always had, answering his questions. I had contacted his old department afterwards, as his sergeant had told me to let him know if I was ever contacted again, but they turned me away pretty quickly and didn't want anything to do with it. With that, I blocked Jake. Roughly a month later, I get a call from a new number, and it's Jake. Once again, he wants to meet up and catch up, but this time, he so casually goes on to tell me about this new house he's wanting to buy in my neighborhood, knowing it's my neighborhood. I had never told him where I lived in town, let alone what specific neighborhood. During this call, he progressively got more aggressive as well, making statements such as, If I knew I was going to get canned, I should have just had my way with you. He half-heartedly joked about getting a hotel room just for me, and that was that. A few days later, he FaceTimed me, and once again came off as simply wanting to catch up as he was sick. Midway through our seemingly normal conversation, he makes it apparent he's been touching himself this entire time. Keep in mind, nothing suggestive was mentioned, and our conversation at that point was about his new dog. He's blocked once again, but has tried to follow my social media, and now I've started to see him in my area. Last I knew, he lived nearly 30 to 45 minutes in the opposite direction from me. Am I reading too much into this, or should I genuinely consider this stalking? As any typical 24-year-old, I'm very independent. I have multiple chronic illnesses which disable me so my independence looks a little different to what yours might. For example, I use a wheelchair when I'm out and about, or in the house if I've got an active injury and can't walk, like a bad hip dislocation. I recently got a new wheelchair, and there's one particular feature I made sure I had, or more accurately, didn't have, because of a situation that has happened to me a lot, and one event that left me fighting for my life. My new chair doesn't have push handles, I've always hated when people lean on my chair, or in public, a stranger just grabs my chair by the push handles and starts trying to help me. If I needed a push, I'd have someone with me. As it is, I have a power assist application called a smart drive. My smart drive has given me my independence back, as I did used to be reliant on others to push me. 
but now my nifty little fifth wheel does the propelling for me, and I can roll alongside my friends, get up hills, and it generally just means I can leave the house alone. But some people see a wheelchair and assume the helpful stranger position and go in for the push. Not only is this incredibly annoying, but rude. How would you feel if you were just minding your own business, crossing a road, and someone started pushing on your legs, or just swung you on top of their shoulders and carried you off? Anyway, I digress. This incident happened back in 2019, so pre-pandemic times, and I was out and about doing some shopping. My old wheelchair had push handles because I hadn't started off with a smart drive, just my manual chair. But at this point, I did have my smart drive, hence me being out by myself. I also have been wearing a mask for longer than the rest of the country due to severe allergic asthma. My main triggers are industrial or environmental particles, sprays, perfumes, and cigarette smoke. So picture this. I'm outside wheeling along on my own, wearing my fog mask, window shopping basically. And then I wasn't. I was whizzing forward. My first thought being that I trapped my waistband accidentally and started the smart drive up, but I very quickly realized someone was pushing me. I tried to hold my push rims to break and turned around to tell them, I'm fine thank you, I don't need a push, and I actually have an electric box that pushes it for me. But this person just didn't care. They started laughing a strange forced laughter, and I became more firm. Seriously, let go, I'm fine. This person didn't bat an eyelid. They didn't give a fuck. They just kept pushing me and said loudly in a patronizing manner, Yes, we're going home now. At this point, we're going pretty fast and heading in a direction I really did not want to go towards on account of it being a very industrial area where I know the traffic is bad, buildings are being demolished for the HS2 railway, and lots of people smoking at bus stops. I still have my mask on, but I start trying to reach out to strangers, shouting for someone to help me. No one did. Everyone shrunk away, staring wide-eyed at the crazy disabled girl in the chair and her poor carer having to rush her home with a variety of excuses. Oh, I told you we don't grab people. Yes, I know we're getting tired and you're overdue for meds. Let's not ruin anyone else's day. Sorry, sorry everyone. She's in a lot of pain and gets hysterical like this as he rushes me past a long line of bus stops several smokers worth of fog beginning to penetrate my mask. Seriously, get the fuck off of my chair. I need my inhaler. Let me go. We kept going and turned down a quieter street where there were literally bulldozers and wrecking balls and the air was thick with dust. I'm getting scared. I'm wheezing. I'm really panicking now as I know we're headed out of town and I have no idea where we are going. Finally, he fucks up, stopping my chair, coming around in front of me, and ripping my mask off, and begins to say, Listen, you little shit. But before he could get any further, I surprised him with a very forceful kick in the crotch. He counted on me being paralyzed, I guess, and didn't count on two things. One, my legs working enough to defend myself, and two, the power of panic and fight or flight when a person's throat is closing up. As he recoiled from the hard kick, I did what I've seen people do in films and brought my hands together and down onto his back as hard as I could, which I think winded him as he let out a wheeze almost as loud as my own. He dropped my mask on the floor in his panic, and whilst he was backing away, I reached around to my rucksack to grab my inhaler. I immediately took two puffs whilst he was cursing and screaming at me, but my ears had blocked up and my vision was going funny. A couple of the builders had seen the commotion and come over the road to see what was happening, and I pointed at the man, wheezed out, Help! I don't know him! Before I blacked out. When I came back, I was being lifted onto an ambulance gurney with paramedics and a builder around me. The man who had commandeered my chair was gone, and I had a nebulizer and oxygen blasting through a mask over my mouth and nose. I have never been so glad to take a breath. 
My vision was still swimming, and I felt like I'd been jabbed hard in my throat and couldn't really squeeze any words out. They loaded my chair onto the ambulance, and then we went off to the hospital. When the builders came over and I blacked out, one of them saw my inhaler, saw that my lips were blue, heard my wheezing, and immediately called 999, and the guy who'd almost killed me took off. Another builder tried to chase after him, but he didn't catch up, and the guy got away. The one who'd called the ambulance came with me to the hospital, and I've since become good friends with him. My family will forever credit him for saving my life that day. The police came to see me whilst I was still in hospital and had me report what they called an attempted kidnapping. Kidnapping. At the time, I hadn't even thought about what the outcome might have been, but once the police had talked with me, I realized how lucky I truly was. That man could have done anything to me, and if he'd picked someone who couldn't use their legs, it could have ended very differently. They spoke to the builder who chased after the kidnapper, but they were never able to catch him or even ID him. In terms of the wonderful Leroy, the police and my asthma nurse commended him on his quick thinking, and I bubbled with his family during the pandemic. Leroy, thank you for saving my life that day. And kidnapper, let's not meet again. At 19, I was hired for the role of a correctional officer. I was one of the youngest there at the time, working at the most dangerous prison in Australia. I'd worked there for 40 years, seven days a fortnight, 12-hour shifts. While it sounded like a pretty laid-back role, easy money really, the toll it takes on the mind is unimaginable, to the point where no money could encourage me to redo my time working there. There were good times where the men I worked with would better themselves and make something out of their lives afterwards, but I saw all manner of things, from courtyard fights to someone playing with themselves in public, to murder and people ending themselves but none of that is what stuck with me through my time there. You would think so, but no. The one thing that stuck with me in my time there was a short-lived and supernatural experience. There was not a single drop of blood spilled during this experience, yet it was one of the most horrific and graphic things I have ever witnessed. It was a night shift. The shift started at 7 p.m. and finished at 7 a.m. We rarely did night shifts, and this was my first one since finishing training. What usually was a staff of about 200 people had dwindled down to about 30 by 10 p.m. We weren't left alone per se, but we generally did rounds on our own every hour or so. I was prepared and ready to take on the night, and being the youngest on the team and presumably the most naive, there were rounds of light-hearted teasing directed towards me. You'll have aged to 60 by the end of the night. Be aware of the night crazies, young Padawan. The start of the shift was quiet, peaceful almost. No issues, no weird bumps in the night. The inmates were quiet, dead asleep in their cells. It was probably around four in the morning. Tiredness was really starting to sink in when I saw a figure shift out of the corner of my eye, just outside of the unit. At that point, I just brushed it off as being sleep-deprived and left to myself while the other staff members did their rounds. However, when I saw the figure move back to where it first initially moved from, my alarm bells started going off quietly at this point. I turned in my chair to face the windows that looked out into the courtyard and focused my eyes on where I saw the figure move to, attempting to peer through the darkness. I saw it just a shadow, but there was something there. Now, usually if we saw something strange, we should radio it in, in case it was a loose inmate. But this wasn't a human figure, so I put it down to maybe being an animal, which as large as it was, was incredibly unlikely. This was a maximum security prison, nothing larger than a rat should be getting in. 
It took my tired brain longer than it should have to process this information. The alarm bells that just moments before were a simple quiet whisper of something may be wrong were now blaring. My now fatigued mind and body were awake, every nerve burning, ready to take action. I leaned over to the control panel and flipped on the outside lights. Nothing. Nothing was there. Just me and my embarrassing labored breathing filling the unit. My radio cracked. My supervisor had seen the lights flipped on from the unit that she was currently doing rounds in. I had told her I thought I'd seen something moving outside, but it was most likely just my eyes playing tricks on me. She laughed back and said something that caused my skin to break out into a chilled sweat. We said to be careful of the night crazies. This is a lonely time and the crazies are lively tonight. Really, it's a sentence that doesn't entirely make sense. Unless crazies was a descriptive word of someone or the name of something. I brushed it off as her and the team trying to spook the literal new kid on the block. But still, something lingered inside of me that told me that something was not right. I had half an hour of tainted peace before the next encounter with this shadow. Except this time, it wasn't outside. It had started as simple quiet tapping. Maybe it was the wind, but it's coming from the inside. Well, then maybe it's one of the inmates awake and bored. During the day, the inmates would cause a muck if they were confined to their cells from tapping, to banging, to blood-curdling screams. The thing was, after a few minutes of thought, it was coming from one of the unoccupied cells. I was still alone at this point, but my unit partner should have been arriving back soon after finishing their rounds. I had stared at the cell door for a few minutes, trying to determine what to do, when the tapping sound suddenly stopped. My previously furrowed brow softened into a picture of surprise, but mostly relief. Almost immediately after relaxing, the scraping started. A long, painful sound, like someone drawing their nails across a blackboard. I cringed at the sound initially, but then panic took over. It wasn't a loud and deafening sound, but it was there. It was happening, when it shouldn't have been. I racked my brain on what to do. Radio in. Strange noise coming from unoccupied cell, going to investigate. My unit partner gave their affirmations and reported that they would only be a few more minutes. That it's probably nothing and that I don't need to wait for them to check in on the cell. I wished they'd asked me to wait. I stood there and then walked over to the cell in a daze. Not even a single hesitation. This outward confidence was at war with my insides, my heart pounding, my brain screaming for me to stop, and my lungs burning for air. My stomach was tied up in knots, and even with these warnings that something was terribly, terribly wrong behind that door, I didn't stop myself reaching for the latch. I opened the door. I hadn't turned on the cell light. They all turn on at the same time, and I didn't want to wake the inmates. The only light poured in from the central unit, my shape blocking most of it, letting a few dim streams through. I stepped in. I don't know why. We aren't allowed to step into a cell before inspecting it, but I did it anyway. I stepped inside and into the corner to let more light in, and I saw it. It was facing away from me, a crouched humanoid figure. Its skin was a sickly green-gray color its knees bent forward, the kneecaps facing towards me. Its limbs were long and skinny, its joints large bulbs protruding from underneath its skin. It didn't even acknowledge me. It just raised its long arms up above its head, placed the tips of its grotesque digits against the concrete wall of the cell, and ever so slowly dragged its fingers down. I'd been silent up until this point, the fingers were halfway down its path when I let out a small gasp. It paused just for a second. Then it started to stand, its perverted knees cracking as it did. I was frozen. Its head was sat on a dangerously long neck that was almost the length of its demented body. 
It had to stoop so that its head wouldn't hit the roof. Then it started to turn, but just before I saw its face, the room went black. The door had shut and I crumbled to the floor, screaming for what felt like hours. But in reality, it was only 30 seconds according to my partner who had ran to open the cell door. I was sent home early that day. I expected to hear something about it when I went back into work, but there was nothing. Not even light-hearted teasing. It was like nothing had ever happened. A few months after the event, when I'd finally settled back into a normal routine, I did some research on the prison. Many old Australian prisons had wretched pasts filled with torture. This particular prison was notorious for it back in the day. Abuse, torture, hangings and riots. I wish I had not researched the history of the prison I worked at, because up until that point, I convinced myself that I was simply sleep deprived. Although that doesn't explain the cell door closing shut and locking. For the most part, the research brought up nothing too daunting, just the typical graphic and gruesome history of Australian prisons. However, I unearthed a diary entry that was written by a man from those dark times, and one of his last entries really put the nail in the coffin for me. It stayed burned in my mind for these last 40 years. This is what his entry said. The walls we tap to make song are the same walls we scratch. Our nights are loops, and our hunger destroys our truths. They break our legs, and for daylight we beg. Instead, they stretch out our necks with their noose. Hey, this is my first ever post on here. I just wanted to share a couple of creepy and strange encounters in my hometown in Ontario, Canada. This first encounter that specifically haunts me to this day happened three years ago in the summer of 2019. I was 16 at the time. I'm a pretty big, built guy, but I'm not the most confident when it comes to encountering some of the nutters you can encounter in Ontario. I was walking home from my local grocery store after going on a late night snack run as I had plans of just gaming late with a couple of buddies that evening. This isn't a super long story, but basically I was about halfway home when I had noticed this homeless guy on a bike that seemed to be following me. I had recognized him before, as funnily enough, about nine months earlier, I had purchased him a coffee and a bagel during the winter months from my local Tim Hortons, so I figured maybe he recognized me. I glanced back a couple of times, and it noticed he was still on me. I crossed an empty parking lot, and I felt like he'd gotten closer, and he had. He was speeding up and was coming in hot, until I pretended to reach into my pocket for a knife. And then as soon as I made that motion, he made an impressively quick sharp turn and sped off in the other direction. Again, it's not the creepiest thing, but it's still one of the more strange things that I've had happen. I couldn't tell you what his motive was. I had no idea if he wanted to jump me or rob me. Not a clue. This second encounter is a bit more unsettling. I was walking home from what my job was at that time. I worked at a Wendy's around the corner from my house, and I just finished my first closing shift. I had noticed, about halfway down my street, there was a guy just standing almost in the middle of the road. As I got closer, I realized it was someone who actually lived at a house that was about six houses down from mine, and he'd gotten onto his knees and started muttering random words and quotes from actors and movies. I'm pretty sure he was just on something, but he was shouting and smiling like a manic person at one point. He ended up chasing some guy walking his dog right as I had looked back when I got to my front door. Hands down, some of the wackiest shit I've experienced. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm, 
and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, we lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chocked full of abandoned houses and crime. With a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about, there were zero streetlights or illumination. Envision a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store slash from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part, but after living in that environment for years, you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner, by then, would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, and that kind of thing. I told him I didn't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably six foot seven, crazy tall and really thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then, but this was way more aggressive than anything I'd faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him I was heading to my partner's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. I said that he was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him and took off speed walking down the street as fast as I could. He called after me several times and then I heard his quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then I could feel my heartbeat in my eyes. My mouth had gone dry and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away, so I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. My legs were no match for his crazy long stride, and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk faster but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear, and I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black, and there's no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless, save for trying to run from him, but with his height advantage, I knew he'd catch me fast. Then I could see my partner's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had this terrible feeling and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, and then my nerve broke and I started sprinting towards him, and the tall guy behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my partner stood and squeaked out, help, or something like that. I dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall guy to pull out a gun and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible and I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward, up at the store or walking up and down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, 
I never took another nighttime walk. I still sometimes have nightmares about it. This is the late 80s, early 90s. I was around 6 to 7 years old. I'm at home with my sister, who's 14 to 15 at the time. We grew up in a small Texas town. Everyone knows everybody. We're home alone this particular night, and my folks let my sister babysit me frequently. We always got along due to our age gap. It's about 8 p.m. in the winter, so it's dark, and we're in the common room since that's where the TV was. Watching 60 minutes, or 48 hours, or hard copy or some shit. It was one of those news pieces on CBS that chronicle large crimes and death. Things like trafficking, murders, kidnappings and the like. Basically, a gritty lifetime special. This one was a typical story. Guy next door that was quiet went on a rampage in his next door neighbor's house. Mutilating them and kidnapping their young daughter. Well, the thing about our house common room is the door leading to the backyard was a large glass door on a wall of floor-to-ceiling windows. Nothing but blackness beyond it, unless you have the back light on, which we did not. The front door is on the other side of the room with a small entryway. This is a solid door, so you cannot see what's beyond it, with the glass storm door on the outside of it. About 45 minutes into the show, they're talking about the ongoing manhunt for this crazy guy, and all of a sudden there's banging. It's coming from the front door. We jump the fuck up and scream like banshees. Dead silence now. The only lights on in the house are the kitchen down the hall from the common room we were in, and the light from the TV. We start thinking something on the porch had simply blown against the door. This was West Texas, crazy strong winds out that way. Well, a minute or two of silence and us holding each other post-adrenaline overdose passes. Just when we are about to declare everything is safe, we hear the storm door on the outside of our front door close. Fuck. Someone had to have opened the door to be able to bang on the front door like that. Shit. We're both frozen in the middle of the room, on the floor, where we've been watching TV. My sister crawls over to the TV and turns it off. It was an old TV, so you had to turn the metal dial to switch it off which it does with a mildly loud thunk. Now it's just us in a room dimly lit by the kitchen light down the hall. I do not remember how much time passed with me frozen and my sister still crouched by the now off TV, but we kept making eye contact, then looking at the front door. I remember this part vividly. I'm on my knees, sitting on my feet, and I turn around to look at the back wall of windows and glass door. We hear, and I see, the back doorknob turn. It was locked on the knob, but not deadbolted. It rattles slightly, as if someone is gently trying to handle. Neither of us make a sound. We just held our breath. And then banging, loud as hell as if someone's trying to force the door open, just jerking it back and forth. The whole wall of windows is vibrating violently, and I can see with each jerk of the door how my slight reflection gets fuzzy, then clear, and then back to fuzzy. My sister flips her shit and screams bloody murder. I'm still frozen on the floor. She gets up and basically drags me into her bedroom, slams the door, and throws her mattress and anything she can in front of her door. Thankfully, she'd remembered the phone. One of those ungodly heavy beige plastic long metal antenna portable phones. We still had to direct dial the sheriff there, and in her panic she didn't remember the number. She just hit redial on the phone. It was one of her friends and she tells them in broken gasps that someone is trying to get into our house and they need to get there right now. I'm curled up on the floor and cannot stop shaking. We don't hear anything else until we see the lights of my sister's friend and her parents driving up to the house. We never did find out who was at the door or why. There was no signs that anything happened, except a couple of scuff marks at the bottom of the back door that we couldn't remember if they were there beforehand or not. 
Nothing like that has happened to me or her since, but we for damn sure never forgot to lock a door after that. I grew up in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands, UK. I was 12 years old, and let's just say I didn't have the easiest of upbringings. I was smoking, drinking, and staying out late around this time of my life. So I was bunking off of school, my mom was at work, and it was late morning time around 11am. I wanted to buy some cigarettes, but as I was well under the legal age, I had to hang around outside the shop and ask strangers if they would take my money and purchase them for me. About a mile and a half from my house, there was a little shop called the Spar. It was on a fairly busy road. A row of hedges lined one side, with a gap that led into the field beyond, and houses on the opposite side. So I was standing maybe 15 paces from the shop, waiting for people to walk past so I could ask them to purchase my cigarettes. I usually second-guessed if they would be willing by how they looked. I asked a lady, maybe mid-forties, shoulder-length blonde hair, black business trousers, pink elbow-length jumper, looked like she smoked, and she said no. I asked a guy, maybe mid-fifties, shaved brown hair. He was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. He ignored me. So I was getting desperate by this point and decided upon asking anybody that came by. Then I see a rather disheveled looking man coming up the road towards me, past the row of hedges. He was wearing dirty dark brown suit trousers and a button up dark brown dirty velvet jacket. He had a black bowler kind of hat on and he kind of limped a bit as he walked. As he got closer to me and I was trying to suss out if he looked like the type that would possibly purchase a 12 year old cigarettes. I noticed he was probably homeless, and possibly in his late fifties to early sixties. But I thought, hey, he probably smokes, I'll ask him. As he approached me, I gave him the usual line. Excuse me mate, would you please go into that shop and get some cigarettes for me? He stopped and thought for a second, then said, how old are you? I lied, I'm fifteen, almost sixteen, and he said, all right, which ones do you want? And held out a really dirty hand. I gave him my money and asked him to get some ten sovereign. I had the exact change. He goes into the shop and I'm waiting outside excited. I'm finally getting my cigarettes and can go home and chill out before I have to leave the house again to make it look like I've just got home from school. He comes out and gives me twenty sovereign. I miffed to say the least and say, but I only gave you enough money for ten, and I start panicking because I don't have any extra money on me to give him. At this point, he hooks my arm in his, holding my arm firmly to his side, and starts to walk back towards the hedge-lined road. All the while, he's telling me how I can make up for not having the extra money for the cigarettes. I'm kind of stunned at this point, and my mind is blank. I guess I was in some kind of shock. He leads me through a gap in the hedges and into the field, all the while talking non-stop, still briskly walking with my arm locked in his. He's telling me how I can come to his house and help him fix the roof tiles. I'm still in silent shock. The field is huge and I can see it leads into more fields and more fields. I can hear the cars behind me getting more distant. I can't see any houses for miles, there's just fields. He's still talking, but I'm not taking in what he's saying. My mind starts to race. I finally realize something about this isn't quite right, and I have to get away. As he's walking, still holding my arm, I suddenly and violently pull back, with my arm straight. My arm slides out of his very quickly and he goes flying forwards and lands in a heap on the floor, and I take one big step backwards. I'm terrified at this point, but still in shock. I can't speak. He's laying on the ground, groaning and holding his leg. It's like he's in a lot of pain. 
Why do you do that for? You really hurt me. Help me up. Help me up. He's holding his leg and puts his hand out for me to help him up. I'm frozen. My mind is racing so fast. I'm looking at this disheveled man right now in the eye, laying on the ground, groaning like he's in pain. But something about this situation didn't sit right with me. My gut was telling me to run. Don't help him. I bought you those cigarettes, didn't I? I helped you out. Why did you do this? You've hurt me. Help me up. I take another step backwards, all the while looking into his green eyes. All of a sudden he stops groaning and asking for me to help him up. He points his finger at me, looking me right in the eye and says, You're a smart girl. It was like an electric shock ran through my body and I turn and run. I don't look back, I just run as fast as I can. When I'd gotten off the hedge-lined road and turned into the next road, I slow down as I'm out of breath. I start bawling my eyes out and I'm shaking uncontrollably. I keep checking behind me, catch my breath, and don't stop running until I get home. At the very least, I was terrified I'd bump into that man again, and I never tried to buy cigarettes from that shop ever again. Each year around this time, I open up my Time Hop app and I'm reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball sized black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that, because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner at the time's apartment at around 3am. She was out with co-workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute would be another half hour or so, and my phone was dying. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner being thoroughly annoyed with me was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance gate to her apartment community and sulked. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation all alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point my phone was dead. I didn't have enough cab money, and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parker walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, Are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought, for a split second, he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-aged girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3 a.m., completely alone. But, at 3 a.m., you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an exacto knife and then asked, You sure you're okay? He picked me up with one hand while repeatedly striking at the back of my hood with the knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight, flight, or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to stop, but after the longest 30 seconds or so of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat. That came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head. 
My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes later. It was really a blur. I definitely went into a state of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone, stayed awake for the police to come and take a report, but we didn't hear much else afterward. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come of it. What scares me the most is that number one, I still don't know what the man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the transit station to the apartment complex, which was a fairly long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. Ski Mask Man, let's not meet again. When I was a teenager, I used to go out camping by myself. I had a spot where I liked that was across a few fences from my grandparents' house in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful to not spook them, but otherwise cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house, and probably about two from my destination. The one time I remember, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something I was not aware of, so I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up the next morning. As I went back into that pasture, however, it was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit, and the barrel broke open. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure they were not going to surprise me, and I could not find them. They were just gone. There was some brush and trees, though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I keep walking through the place to get home, and the smell is so bad that I set my stuff down at the fence line and decide to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun style thing and eviscerated all of them. It also drug them all into a little shallow ravine and piled the bodies up. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there back to my gear. My stuff was gone, as in I set it right here on this rock, and it's not with an eye shot. A quick glance showed me there was not anything ripped out or fallen out, so something, or someone, had picked it up while I was 200 yards away for less than 5 minutes. I think Usain Bolt would not have been able to catch me on the way home. I've never heard anything else about those cows, and I did not go back. To the old camping spot again. So this happened about three years ago. The story begins with me having to replace a large section of drywall in my house as I had a bad leak on the third floor bathroom of my house. I have a very trusted contractor that I've used and my family has used many times before. I've never had a bad experience. Either way, it's Saturday morning and I let his crew into my home. I pay no real attention other than saying a quick hello and opening the door for them to bring in their materials from their truck. I'm upstairs studying and minding my own business when my roommate texts me that one of the workers is possibly drunk. Now, a bit of backstory. There have been several times before where she has falsely thought that there are sketchy people on our block. We live in a city. However, they have always turned out to be construction workers or service people, so I wasn't exactly surprised. I text her back that it's okay because I've used this crew many times before, and because it was in the morning, he probably wasn't drunk. She insists he is to me, so being the male of the house, I decide to check it out. I walk downstairs and notice there is one guy who isn't working. 
He's just walking around aimlessly amongst the crew without a real purpose. He is a large, well-groomed white man, dressed in clean baggy casual clothing. I go up to him, and he mumbles some absolute gibberish words to me that I cannot understand, and I can tell that he definitely isn't drunk, but that he might have some intellectual disabilities. In my mind, it was a better than good chance that he was a relative of one of the workers, given that they seemed comfortable with him walking around the work area. Fast forward about two hours. I have to run to a quick doctor's appointment, and while I'm leaving, I notice that the guy is sleeping on the couch in the living room. On my drive to the doctor, I decide to call my contractor, who is at another site, to let him know that one of his guys or relatives of his workers was sleeping on the job. He's extremely embarrassed when I tell him, and tells me he'll call his crew to take care of the issue. Fifteen minutes later, I get a call back while I'm in the car. In a very timid voice, he tells me that the person isn't with them, and that they have no idea who he is. My heart stops, and like a movie, I literally swung my car around and started speeding home at top speed. I immediately call my roommate to tell her to lock herself in her room, and that he's asleep, so not to do anything crazy. I then call 911 and explain the situation. I arrive to the house and wait for the cops to get there, and was very happy that they brought two of the biggest guys they had. They enter my home and immediately question and remove him from the house. It becomes very obvious that he absolutely had no clue where he was, and after the cop told him he was lucky he wasn't shot, you could tell how scared he was. He apologized profusely to me and said that he was off his meds and was looking for a halfway home. He tells the cop he needs to get his bag, which he left upstairs. The cop obviously doesn't let him get it, but strangely makes me search for it and retrieve it. I have immediate flashbacks of Brad Pitt in Seven, so I wasn't too happy with the officer. Luckily, it was just filled with books. After this is all done, I go to do laundry and notice that this guy spilled detergent all over the walls and floor of the laundry room. I guess he tried to do laundry and forgot that the detergent goes in the machine, not on the walls. Also, cleaning up a gallon of detergent is nearly impossible. This takes place in the rural farmland of the southeastern United States. For those from around the area, you know there isn't much around except for old farmhouses, fields, and the occasional subdivision. When I was around 17 or 18, I was dating a girl who went to the same high school as me. Being teenagers, we needed a place to be alone, and what better than the front seat of my F-150? Often it was hard to find a place to park that was away from the road and was far enough away from everyone. One evening, as the sun was getting ready to set, I remembered an abandoned house with a long driveway and a tobacco barn off some old back road with no other houses. I'd been there before and explored the property. The house's roof had been abandoned long ago and currently had been used to store lumber. The house had no doors or windows left and the rest of the property was clearly in disrepair and didn't appear to be used at all. I figured this long-forgotten property would make a good spot, so I drove my truck up into the driveway, far away from prying eyes. I put my truck in park, lifted up my center console, and put on the radio. As my girlfriend and I were talking, she suddenly stops with her eyes glued to the rearview mirror and says, Um... I think someone is here. I initially blew her off as I was fairly confident no one was around for miles, but I glanced in my rear view to see that a very beat up looking Ford truck had pulled directly behind mine and the door flew open. Out jumped a tall, dirty looking man holding what appeared to be a 30 6 with a weathered wooden stock. As I put my window down, the man advances, yelling all types of obscenities from the side of my truck. As he walks up, I hear the distinct sound of the safety clicking off of an older rifle. I froze as the world stopped around me. I'd never been held at gunpoint before. 
As soon as the shock wore off, I threw my hands up, and I see the man had his sights aimed on me through the rear window of my truck. I looked over to my girlfriend, who was frozen in shock and somewhat cowered into the passenger door. I remember feeling helpless and reaching for my pistol I usually had between the seats, which I quickly realized I had left at home. This was probably a blessing in disguise, as the strange man was clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have just sent him more over the edge. As my hands are up and my girlfriend is shaking in fear, I eventually mutter out, What's going on, sir? The man through rotten and missing teeth, shouts, You sons of bitches come out here tearing up my field and ruining my crops. He clearly had mistaken me for some of the ATV riders around the area who would often wander onto private property and tear up the land. Upon inspecting the man more, he didn't look like any of the farmers I'd known around the area. Having lived here 15 years at this point, I was fairly familiar with the local farmers, this supposed farmer looked maybe in his early thirties and looked to me more like the junkies I would see downtown. I replied to the man that I'd never been here before, nor that I was responsible for destroying his crops, trying desperately to defuse the situation. He wanted to hear none of it and continued to mutter while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize profusely and say, Sir, if I'd seen a no trespassing sign, I wouldn't have dared step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to open my window to yell, Didn't see no fucking sign. He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle tighter and mumble to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave when I notice he has completely blocked me in. There is nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, he perked up and dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose fight, but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get to him before he could shoot. Time seemed to slow, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted hours. He started to yell obscenities again, but he started to walk back to his truck. As he passes my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchanged glances. I had never seen a fear like that in someone's eyes, let alone someone I loved. I knew I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and put it in reverse as he does the same. The beat up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rearview mirror. As soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck into drive and stomped the gas pedal down as far as it could go. My tires squealed and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads and was confident I could outrun him if need be, as his truck looked like it was on its last leg. As the speedometer flew past 60, I could see the man following us, but enough distance from my truck that it would be hard to put a hole in my tailgate. My girlfriend is calming down at this point and is trying to rationalize what just happened to us. I drove and drove for several miles, constantly looking behind to see if he was following me. I briefly remember doing over a hundred miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab changed to utter disbelief as we talked how the crazy supposed farmer looked and awkwardly laughing off our near deaths. I never saw the man again after that and never returned to the abandoned house, except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of the rundown property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man knew we were there, as we weren't visible from the road, nor were we followed. I personally think he was just some tweaker, as I knew most of the farmers in the area. And being in small town, you know everybody. I had never seen this man in my life, nor have I seen him since. I certainly was in the wrong being on private property and had heard horror stories of people running from crazed farmers as bullets flew over their heads. However, a couple of kids parked up in what was clearly a forgotten property. 
several hundred yards from the nearest field shouldn't have warranted a firearm pointed at me and my girlfriend, who were sitting in a clean truck that obviously hadn't been tearing up any fields. Coming from a farming family and being close with the farmers in the area, the last thing you would catch me doing is tearing up someone's livelihood. Regardless, I put my girlfriend's and my life at stake just to park up somewhere and fool around. I never made that mistake again. My family is from a small town in East Tennessee. My father's side of the family seemed fairly normal. They were mostly tobacco farmers and were poor hillbillies. My mom's family, on the other hand, seemed like a disaster from everything I've heard. My grandfather would take my mom and aunt to bars and leave them in the car while he drank and whined women. He would beat my grandmother and berate her in front of the kids. My mother's side is part some kind of white European and Native American. My aunt, grandma, and grandpa all have dark black hair. My mother has auburn hair and freckles. My grandpa would call her a bastard and tell my mom that my aunt was the prettier daughter. My mom had even told me that her dad brought a drunkard home from a bar and that he did stuff to my underage aunt and forced my mother to watch. So, my mom had a good reason to want to escape home. During her freshman year of high school, she met my dad. He had gone to a revival at a church with his sister and started talking to my mom there. The preacher was a man called Gene. My mom and dad talked for a few weeks, but were never allowed to date. One night, my grandfather came home on a bender and beat my mother. My father ran away with my mom, and they eventually got married. The whole time, they kept following Gene from church to church as he preached. He was very charismatic and would preach for hours on end. He would become enraged and pant a guttural growl. He would be drenched in sweat by the end. My sister was born a year after my parents were married. I was born nine years later. My parents quickly indoctrinated my sister and me into the church after birth. The women weren't allowed to cut their hair. They had to wear dresses only and no makeup. Usual Southern Baptist dogma. Here's where things get weird. First was the ritual of getting happy. During the sermons, women and sometimes men would let out blood-curdling screams. The preacher would burst into tantrums and crawl around on the floor and speak in tongues. People would jump from their seats and speak in tongues while someone else translated. It all seemed like the run-of-the-mill Baptist happens on the outside. I started to realize things as I got older, and a few times I saw things that changed the way I feel about these people. My sister told me once, before I was born, that my father was chased by demons. He woke the family up in the middle of the night and told them that they had to leave before they were killed by demons and that he had seen hell in a dream. My sister said as they left the hollow where they lived, her dog walked in the middle of the road. He stood up on two legs and tried to block the car. My dad ran him over. My father was crying that he could see things climbing in the trees. They drove to my aunt's house and picked her up. Then they went to Jean's where he calmed the demons and prayed them away. My sister said my mom would do odd things like build altars in the woods and pray at them for hours alone. I have seen my mother fly into fits of rage and lash out at me or my sister, then forget that they happened. I was always reluctant to get saved. I always felt like something was wrong. During heated sermons, I would go into the basement of the church and pray that God would get me away from it. The two major events that made me believe something evil was afoot will be burned into my mind forever. One night, when I was three or four years old, the congregation was praying over a sinner and helping them get saved. I was sitting in the back row watching. I felt the room get cold, and then I heard a growl, the most deafening noise I've heard to this day. Then all of a sudden, the people stopped praying, 
and like zombies, the churchgoers walked back to their seats. The people sat there quiet for hours, then we all got up and went home. The other event happened when I was a teenager. We had gone to revival in the middle of nowhere. The church was stifling hot. The preacher had gone into a tantrum, and the people were screaming and dancing around the room. I started praying and asked God to let me leave. The back door of the church opened on its own. I stood up and walked out, and no one seemed to care. My parents didn't even come to look for me until church was over. I had a dream once that I was in church, and the lights turned to an amber glow. Gene was preaching. He told the people to stand up and follow him. The people stood and followed him out the door. They followed him into the woods to a well. There, he marched them in a straight line into the well. I could hear hell coming from inside the hole. Lastly, there were the animals. They would come to the church and harass the people. The church was in the woods, so I didn't think much about it at the time. A bear would come and scratch at people's cars, and deer would roam around the parking lot. I moved out at 18. My mother threw a fit at me and hit me and screamed at me. I never went back to church there again. My sister still goes to church, but it's one of those mega church deals. They seem really friendly and way different from the other church. That's that for now. There's too much to talk about in one post. I know there are others out there who have escaped. Please talk to me. I know it's still happening. I am an 18-year-old female who used to live in Las Vegas before I moved recently. And if you don't already know, Las Vegas is number two on the sex trafficking list. I used to go out a lot at night to 7-Eleven and get snacks, because I was bored and wasn't tired. The one closer to my home I got banned from, so I had to go to the one a bit further away from me. I used to go by myself, and the walk there was creepy. Most of the street lights don't work, and it's just dark and really creepy. This time I ended up getting ice cream and some kind of candy. Anyways, on my way back, I'm about to get to the crosswalk to get to the side my house was on. I noticed a guy standing outside one of the other apartment complexes. He wasn't there before, but some of the apartments are facing the street I walk on. He started yelling something, but I wasn't sure if he was talking to me or not because I was on the phone with my boyfriend. I crossed the street and walked past him. Something felt off when I crossed the street and passed him and he didn't say a word. The only time he said anything was when I was across the street. Maybe he noticed I was on the phone. I kept walking and glancing behind me, nothing too obvious, and then he started yelling and walking faster. That was when I knew he was talking to me and following me. I told my boyfriend and he said just walk fast and try to get home. This guy was pimped out. I mean he was dressed like a pimp gold chains, expensive shoes and clothes, and everything else. I say this because I didn't live in a great neighborhood, and you wouldn't see people dressed like that without knowing what they did. Anyways, I noticed that he was speeding up every time I looked behind me. I started panicking because I was genuinely scared something was going to happen. But another guy passes me. We acknowledge each other and say hello casually. The guy that was following me sees this and runs across the street. In my head, I was like, this guy probably just saved my life because he said hi to me. He was just a random guy I'd never met before. I got home safe, but I'll never get ice cream at night alone again. I still feel sick to my stomach, and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. Anyway, here it goes. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, 
getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in the relative nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods. That's animals with pouches or marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went. Hell, why not? I got my rescue tub, which contains my essentials, and went on my way. The couple that called in the rue were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs liked to play together, and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trust them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no, and that I got this. My area is very safe, and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve, and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic, he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilograms, more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities, so I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in the tub. I tie it with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching, movements, hissing, growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time, so I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago, before I got sick, and when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right, and as sure as sure, Every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I'm on the balls of my feet. I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy. I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way too big and there was sudden silence, like whatever had made the noise had stopped or was stalking. I decided to just fuck it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it, and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't give a fuck. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground. That was way too big for any animal in my area let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are screaming to run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that, even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night, and the next day she came with me to try and find my rescue tub. This morning, another rescuer came to take the sick route to the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it, 
The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I'll be going out at night for a long time. This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy gated community in Orange County, California. It's called Kodo de Katsa. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it typically is domestic violence within a household. I'm now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. I always question this policy, asking, what's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key, and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. Anyways, one night, one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m. after having fallen asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door, thinking it's my sister or me needing help. He opens the door without looking through the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is his house and not the kid's. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with a very frustrated and angry kid to no avail, and it's escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this house isn't his, and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now, let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work and such. He's actually still much stronger than me, as evident whenever we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, the kid, in a fit of rage, decides to barge his way into the house, and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid, and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and are terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he's pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decide to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid is able to break in. My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next. She described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard banging on one of the back doors and they have to taste the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts, he got confused on what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but my parents said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. 
I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows, in a gated community, was quite upsetting to them. The psychological after-effects of this ordeal are pretty apparent, as they're coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive, high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but they just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting. I'm just going to include several experiences I had while delivering pizza for a popular chain a long time ago. I live in a small rural town in the southeast US and it has the usual suburban developments as well as some more outlying country in rural areas. When I was younger, just as I'd moved out on my own, I worked as a pizza delivery guy. These are some of the creepy encounters I had during this time. Story 1 the orgy. One afternoon, I got a delivery order for an area of town I rarely, if ever, visited. It was on the east side of town, which was very run down and poor. An old textile mill used to employ many in that area, but had been closed for some time and been overrun with kudzu and had begun falling apart. The houses around this area often had failing foundations and were very old rusty trailer homes. This particular order was to one of the trailer homes. I knocked and no one answered. I tried again for several minutes as I could hear music coming from the inside and I figured maybe they couldn't hear me. When they finally opened the door, it was a skinny guy with no shirt on and he asked me to step inside. When I walked in, there was a lady behind him who was wearing a robe and another sketchy couple standing at the back of the room. They had a boombox playing loud country music. These people were high and drunk, which I was used to, but this place was buzzing with crazy. All of them were at least ten years older than me, and as I sat the pizza down and waited for payment, they started making sexual comments regarding my body. Whenever one would say something, another would encourage them to continue. Eventually, the guy who opened the door walked over to me and the lady behind him said, Go ahead and pay the man. He handed me the cash and put his free hand on my arm and in a hot breath of full natural light, he whispered in my ear and asked, We're all about to have sex. Do you want to join us? I said, No thanks and made a beeline for the door. And story number two, The Creeper. I got two orders from the same area of town I talked about before. One was a 20 pie order for a church fellowship hall, and the other a single pie for a residence. I dropped the pies for the church off first, then headed over to the last customer. When I arrived, I immediately noticed the house looking off-putting, dark and dirty. I was like, Please let this be the wrong house. But it wasn't. There was a creepy, old, naked doll on the porch, and an empty birdcage hung from one of the trees in the side yard. I got out, grabbed the pizza, and slowly walked up to the house. I tried the doorbell, which was glowing, so I figured it worked. No one answered, so I tried knocking. Again, nothing. Eventually I got creeped out, so I started walking back to my car. Halfway to my car I heard, psst, and turned around to see an old man with wild and unkempt hair, 
literally peeking his head out from the back of the house. It was getting dark out, and my patience was draining, so I was not in the mood for someone playing games. I simply said, Did you order this pizza? and waited for him to answer, but he ducked back out of sight. I started to just turn to leave, but then he peeked out again. I said, Sir, is this your pizza or not? And finally he emerges. He walks up to me carrying a shovel of all things. He said, Yeah man, sorry I'm just messing. I don't mean nothing by it. To which I just responded with the total and held the pizza out. Luckily, that was the end of the transaction, and I was able to get out of there. I worked the same job for a few years, and had plenty more weird experiences, but I then moved on to find something better and safer. If you work delivering items to people at their homes, stay safe, and never go inside their house. It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. The non-profit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms and drinking was not allowed on site, nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So, I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend, where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact, that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay during the DNC convention of 08 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning, and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank across the city most of the day. By about 1am, we got back to the hotel. The room was typical with two queen beds. Bed number one was close to a big window looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door slash entryway to our room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4am. My wife was laying at the head of bed number 2, flipping through the TV. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number 1, staring out the window as we talked. As we talked, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I assumed it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by and I thought I heard movement again, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. No, she replied. I thought I heard a door. I said back to her, with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quick. Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out and I wanted to believe I wasn't seeing it. But there was a man dressed in all black with a black baseball cap pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway, where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room, and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind, like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone, and hadn't been for a while, and he knew we spotted him. Eventually, Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway, and he said, Hey man, is there something we can help you out with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little into the light and made eye contact with Tim and I. 
we all just stared at each other, and eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. He stared at us for a while longer, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in a stairwell, but they directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk and they told him he was not a guest. He was apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then, a while later, they told my wife he disappeared and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They told her there wasn't even a room 1709 in the hotel. We got three different stories. We still have no idea what that was all about, or how he managed to get a keycard to our room. We were sure the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life. Always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. We should have sued, but we were young and dumb. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl, Kay. Kay and I met in middle school and were instantly clicked. We would hang out after school very frequently. Kay had a very turbulent childhood. Deceased father, foster care, substance abuse mom, and Kay's family would house hop a lot. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt's ex-husband. My parents never really stressed out about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. Now, the man Kay was staying with was interesting, to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me scratch my head was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family, and Richard tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him, and he was venting to us about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio and all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him, but we didn't think much of it. Sometimes when Kay and I hung out, Richard would have us come to the basement and he had this room with a drum kit and he'd play them for us with the lights off. Anyways, the strangest encounter I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out for the day and she went to take a shower. While she was in the shower, I was sitting in her room and Richard wandered in and told me he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and Richard's was the only room on the second floor. Being the naive girl I was, I agreed and followed him up the stairs. When we got to his room, he realized his room was locked and seemed very annoyed and jittery because his key was downstairs. Now, instead of going downstairs, Richard takes his credit card out of his wallet and tries to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work and something clicked in my brain, and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. I'm now 23, and looking back at it, I honestly don't think there was anything cool to show me in that room, and I thank the moon and the stars that he never got it unlocked. I never told Kay, but as we got older, I casually asked if she had any weird encounters with him, and she said no. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful I never got to see what was beyond that door. My boyfriend Jay and I were staying with two of his friends, Jim and Jeremy. Jeremy had left the apartment an hour or so before Jay and I decided to go to bed. A few minutes after Jay fell asleep, I heard a knock on the door, and Jim answered it. Turns out it was Jeremy, but he wasn't alone. 
two guys that also lived in the apartment building forced Jeremy to knock at the door so that they could force their way in as he didn't have his keys with him. Once they were inside, I could hear what sounded like a scuffle from where I was in the bedroom with the door closed. I woke Jay up, and all of a sudden, we hear two unknown voices yelling, Get down! Get the fuck on the ground! Jay wanted to go see what was going on, but I begged him to stay in the bedroom with me, which he did. After what seemed like a couple of minutes of arguing and fighting sounds, everything went absolutely silent. We opened the bedroom door to see Jim laying on the ground, with what we later found out to be a barbed machete sticking out of his chest. Jeremy was calling 911. The apartment building didn't have a buzzer to let anyone into the building, so when the police got there, Jay let them in and showed them to the suite we were in. After that, they separated us all and put the three of us into the back of three different police cars where they left us while the paramedics tried to save Jim. Unfortunately, they weren't able to save him. He died at the apartment. I knew he was dead when the paramedics wheeled him out to the ambulance, but didn't leave for at least five minutes without working on him at all. The police took us to be questioned, again keeping us separated the entire time. About 12 hours later, they were ready to let us go, but told us we were not allowed to go back to the apartment, as it was an active crime scene. We were dropped off by the police at a coffee shop with no money, phones, wallets, or even shoes on our feet, as they wouldn't let us take anything from the apartment before they put us in the police cars before being questioned. We ended up going to a friend's house where we stayed until we were let back into the apartment four or five days later. Once we were finally allowed back into the apartment, the first thing I had to do was clean up the blood, which I'm sure you can imagine was pretty hard to handle. It was pretty traumatic. Hi all. I'm writing this here because it happened over a year ago now, and nothing has come of it since, but I wanted to write it down somewhere because I never really told anyone about it outside of some close friends. I live in a really small town, so I've never felt unsafe being alone or anything like that. I'm also 18 and female to male, so I feel a lot more comfortable in people not approaching me or being creepy since I pass well. Over the summer, I had started getting into the habit of going on walks as a way to get some exercise in and listen to a long podcast I just started. The issue is, I hate crossing streets and I feel like I'm being judged or watched by people in cars when I wait at crosswalks. I'm a really paranoid person. So I started going on walks at night when less people were out and about. Since it was summer, it didn't get dark until around 9pm so I'd usually walk from 10 p.m. to midnight. When I first started, I didn't have a solid walking path and would wander down random streets just for the fun of it until I looped back around and found my way home. But after about a month, I settled on a path that I'd usually loop twice to get seven or eight miles in. It took me across a few bridges and main streets, but mostly neighborhoods with minimal street lamps and a couple of parking lots I used to avoid some busier streets. It was around maybe the two-month mark I started feeling paranoid. Mind you, like I mentioned, I'm a paranoid guy. I always assume someone's watching me on the street, in the store, through a window. I think it comes from worrying people can look at me and somehow know I'm trans. But hey. So when I started feeling like I was being watched on my night walks, I assumed the paranoia I usually feel finally caught up to my walks, and I just have to get used to it. But this time, my paranoia was actually grounded when I started to notice what looked like the same guy almost every night, walking my path at the same time, but always a street or two ahead of me. Because he was ahead of me and not behind, I sometimes felt like I was the creepy one following him. But I had been walking this path for a few months now, so I knew that wasn't the case, obviously. But for a little while, I was worried this guy thought I was following him. 
After maybe a week or two of me feeling like I was a total creep for walking my path, it blew up in my face in a pretty small way, but it caused me to feel totally freaked out. This night, he was ahead of me as usual, but took a turn I don't take, so I lost him for a couple of streets. I didn't think much of it and continued on, but decided to divert from my own normal path and stop at a store to grab a drink. I don't do this too often because I had a habit of buying snacks I don't need, so I stopped going and hadn't at all in the last month. After going in and wandering for a bit so I didn't feel like I was wasting my walking time by not walking, I noticed that guy who I'd seen in the past two weeks also in the store. I knew it was him because he always wore this puffy blue coat that seemed too heavy for the temperature and one of those blue medical masks everyone bought in the bulk of 2020. I didn't think much of it other than, hey, there's that guy I've been following. That's funny. After wondering a bit more, I got my drink and left, having to take some darker streets I normally don't because of where the store was. I immediately noticed this guy's behind me and walking way too close for my liking because I distinctly remember not seeing him buy anything or even holding anything earlier. My paranoia is going crazy, so I start picking up the pace a bit and turning down my headphone volume because usually I have it on max, and when I do, I hear he's calling out to me, saying stuff like, wait up little lady, and can't you just stop for a second? I was so taken aback by being misgendered for the first time in forever that I did stop. I passed really well and rarely get mistaken for a woman, but at that time, I was letting my hair grow out a bit, so I can now see how in the dark I could look like a girl. So now I'm standing there, fucking flabbergasted, because I just got called, little lady, when I'm neither of those things, and he kind of jogs on up to me and asks, why are you ignoring me? I told him, sorry, my headphones were loud, what do you want? and he immediately backs away because I have a deep-ass voice. My testosterone shots had blessed me with a voice deeper than most of my cis male friends, so it throws this guy off, and he's looking at me weird instead of responding. He mumbled something about thinking I was someone else, and sorry about the mistake, before walking off. It wasn't until the next day did I really sit down and connect the dots of what had happened and what had almost happened. I took a week break from my night walks, and when I started again, he was nowhere to be seen, and since I never saw his face and barely spoke to him, there was really nothing to report to anyone, so I just let it go. When I was in middle school, I took the city bus to my school because my parents couldn't drive me, and no school buses rooted to my neighborhood. I didn't live in a particularly good place, but I never felt unsafe, probably because I was a kid and thought myself invincible. That morning, I got on the bus to go to school, sixth grade at the time, so I was about 12. But let me tell you, I have always looked much younger than my age. It was decently crowded, so I go to my usual spot in the back. A few stops go by, and then a man gets on and sits right next to me. It's been about ten years now, but I still remember how he looked. Tall, thin, long, straight black hair. There was maybe one or two seats open, so it wasn't weird that he was next to me at first. I just figured he sat in the first seat he saw open. Then he started to talk to me. I can't remember what he said at first, but being early in the morning and already peeved that I had to share my space with him, I just made vague, disinterested noises at him. Then he asked where I was going. That's when my spidey senses started to tingle, because obviously it's early in the morning and I'm a child, so I'm going to school. So I said, school, in a, a duh kind of way. I realize now he was probably looking for me to tell him which school. A few stops went by and the bus opened up more, so I quickly went and found another empty seat. 
Not five minutes later, he follows and sits next to me and still tries to get me to talk to him. He asks my name. I look to the front of the bus and see some 8th graders that I know from school and from riding this bus. My animal brain screams at me to find safety in the pack. I move up to the front of the bus and plant myself in the middle of them and basically press myself into them and give them the help me eyes. The guy moves again and sits directly in front of me. He asks my name again and one of the boys I'm sitting with, G, quickly calls me by a fake name and turns his body so he's kind of shielding me and carries on a conversation with me until we get to our school. The group of 8th graders basically formed a circle around me and we huddled off the bus and I turned to make sure the creep didn't follow us off the bus. Thankfully he didn't, but for the next few weeks I caught either the earlier or later bus in case he was on it again. And since the bus stop was right in front of my school, I was afraid he knew where I went and would show up, but I never saw him again. So, creep on the bus, let's not meet again. I'm so thankful those kids were there to help me. I don't know if that guy might have thought I was younger than I looked and thought I was young and stupid enough to trust him with more personal information. I grew up in a small Southern California town known for its orange groves from days gone by. All those groves have been replaced by housing developments and shopping centers now, but there were still quite a few around when I was growing up in the 90s. My friend Johnny and I used to get into all kinds of trouble back then. We were just general miscreants, but there was one time I truly believe we almost became victims of a child predator. If anyone reading this also grew up in the 90s, you know that it was a different era. We'd be out all times of the day, and our parents would have no idea where we were. There were lots of kidnappings back then. I can remember multiple times that I was offered candy, or asked by some creep to help him find his cat. I always said I'd go check with my mom, and by the time she'd get outside ready to whoop some ass, he'd be gone. So anyway, Johnny and I were up to no good one day after school. We were traipsing around this orange grove that bordered his street. We started pulling these little metal dam things off the irrigation channels and tossing them wantonly. All of a sudden, we heard a sharp whistle and we both look up to see this man about 25 feet away from us, wagging his finger and going, uh, uh, uh but his reaction was not at all proportional to the property damage we were causing. He clearly didn't own or work in the grove, because instead of screaming at us to stop, he had a grin from ear to ear. I can still see his face in my mind all these years later, and it gives me chills. Johnny and I stood there for a second watching this guy. Then we looked at each other, and Johnny looked back toward the guy and shouted, Run! I look over, and the guy is in an all-out sprint towards us. Despite the physical exertion he was putting into a sprint, the grin was still there. Johnny and I ran harder and faster than we ever had before. We made it out of the grove and back to his house before noticing the guy wasn't behind us anymore. We quickly forgot about it, because Johnny's family had just gotten a Nintendo 64, and we started playing Mario. I can't remember if it was the next day or week, but sometime after this happened, we were with his mom getting donuts, and we saw a wanted poster with a sketch of a man that looked awfully similar to the guy who chased us. He was wanted for trying to kidnap a boy outside of a school. Johnny and I looked at each other and seemingly telepathically agreed to never say a word. I don't know why we never spoke up, but we never did speak of it again. As I'm writing this, I'm considering reaching out to him to see if he remembers and if it all aligns with my memory of the incident. There were so many different things that happened in my childhood in the 90s that could have easily ended with me dead. Somehow I'm still here and I have my own family now. 
I trust no one because of incidents like that. I always have my head on a swivel. I used to live in a small neighborhood from the ages of 13 to 18. This took place when I was around 15. I spent most of my time just walking around the neighborhood listening to my MP3 player. Well, I feel old just thinking about that. There was a guy around the same age as me that lived maybe five or so houses down from me. From neighborhood gossip, I learned that he was homeschooled and had been in and out of juvie due to his anger issues. He was almost always outside, and sometimes when I passed his house, he would start following me. I was smart enough to always have my music down low enough to be able to hear and be aware of my surroundings. At first, I passed it off as him walking the same time of day I did. Looking back, I was truly dumb. As time passed, he got closer and closer to me when following, until he eventually decided to come up right behind me. He said some truly heinous things that I will not repeat here. I mean he was right in my ear when he was talking. I ran home and told my sister. She was the one who basically raised me. She told me I was lying and to stop making up stories. For a while, I stopped going out walking until I needed the air and exercise and tried again after maybe two months. Sure enough, there he was and he came right up behind me and started to say things again. I turned my music up and ignored him. This is what I continued to do every day until he got tired of me ignoring him, I guess. Because one day, he grabbed my arm. I couldn't get away. And then, he grabbed the back of my neck and told me that I should know better than to ignore him. Again, I told my sister she didn't believe me, and I stopped going out again. Two weeks later, I woke up to loud bangs on my bedroom wall. There was a garage on each side of the house, and my bedroom shared a wall with one of those garages. This garage was unfinished, there wasn't even concrete down, and it was easily accessible from outside as it was missing the door at the back of the house. My sister was out of town, and my dad was deaf and bedridden, so it was just me in the house able to do anything. My bedroom also had a door to go outside, so I ran over and locked it. I laid down and waited for the banging to stop, but it didn't. My cousin and her boyfriend lived down the street, so I called her and she sent her boyfriend down to see what it was. Her boyfriend pulled right into the backyard and right up to the door into the garage. His headlights filled the garage and out ran the guy from down the street, holding a large knife. He took off running and my cousin's boyfriend followed. It was at this time I called the police. They came and took a statement, but said there was nothing they could do, because other than going into the garage and trespassing, he didn't actually do anything. I never took a walk in that neighborhood again. I still wonder how he knew what wall to bang on. How did he know I was on the other side of it? How did he know my sister was gone? or that my dad was bedridden and couldn't do anything. I never locked the door, so had he been in my house to know, what would have happened if I would have gone outside? It still gives me the creeps. So, guy down the street, let's not meet again. I was taking the subway one day. A lady was walking around, chugging a massive bottle of hot sauce. Bloodshot eyes, tears streaming down her face. Of course, she sat next to me on the two-seat bench. At first, she was complimenting my nails, and then she just stared at me, much too close for comfort. She still had tears down her face, still chugging the hot sauce. I made a comment asking if it was good or something. She acted like I was crazy for noticing it. 
This was at least two years ago, and I still can't get her face out of my mind. I hope she's doing well. This happened six years ago on the last day of August. I'd just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside, smoking, is this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He'd been living in the downstairs apartments last year and had been really creepy to one of our floor mates, Sarah. So creepy that he had to be banned from the upper floors, so we mostly ignored him. Toby, however, never lets a chance to socialize pass him by, so he says hello and tells us that we can't get inside. This is because the doorknob is missing. Weird, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of trashy, so we didn't think anything of it. I put the doorknob back on, as Toby wanders down the end of the walkway to yell obscenities down the street. That's a bit worrying because even though Toby is kind of creepy, he's not violent or overly aggressive. We slip inside. We think he must be drunk, and we settle in to go to bed since my plane got in late, and it's around midnight. We try to sleep, but it turns out it was impossible. Toby, in a rage outside, is yelling and carrying on. He comes in and out of the house, banging doors and stomping around. Now most people moved out at the end of the year, and we're not even sure if Toby lives here anymore. We decide it's fine. He'll tire himself out. He's not hurting anyone. We just ignore it. About an hour and a half later, Toby is still at it. But now, he's outside our window. We're on the side of the building that's next to the other building. And next door, they're turning that building into more student complexes. Toby is banging on the chain link fence, swearing about his house right outside our window. At this point, both my girlfriend and I are concerned for our safety. The yelling and the banging are incredibly violent and show absolutely no signs of abating. So we go out and lock the doors and call the police. The police take a while to arrive. But Toby is disturbing the peace, so they have a talk with him, tell him to quiet down and go to bed. They come and talk with my girlfriend who called them, and they leave, telling us to call back if things keep up or get worse. This is the end of it, we think. For about 15 minutes anyway, everything is quiet. Then Toby discovers we've locked the doors. He is not happy about that. He yells obscenities laced with, This is my house, my house, getting louder and louder. He goes back to beating up the chain link fence and yelling down the street at drunks coming out from the bars, but mostly he's outside our window. Then there's a brief silence, followed by the sound of shattered glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now very scared for our personal safety. Luckily for us, however, Toby stopped throwing rocks at windows after that, possibly because the windows are about a story off the ground. The yelling and banging at the chain link fence and the front and back doors didn't stop though. Not until the police came and took him away. We saw him a few days later, after we learned that he in fact did not live in the apartment anymore. Sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone, he gave us the worst look when we got out of the car. Luckily I haven't seen him since and I'll be happy if I never run into Toby again. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, 
mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents. Three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke and at the time I felt like I could feel the energy around me almost like my body was covered in white noise if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. I hope you enjoyed that guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos, as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Gloria, Ashley Juster, Celso Rundle, Merciful Humming, Carol Zaffirano, Melissa Moore, Dixie Busby, 
Michelle Green, Misty Rakur, Michelle Brooks, Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindop, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scout Monk 405, Z Harris, Unladylike 13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mayers, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madisa Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona Xbox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all 
on the next one.